customs ok. So, in that customs, so we need to know this statutory reference. So, we have two statutory reference in customs that is Customs Act 1962, Customs Act 1962 and Customs Tariff Act, Tariff Act 1975. These are the two things. Customs Act 1962 contains the provisions related to import, export, valuation, what are the diff, uh, like, uh, you know, various modes in which we can import and export, etc. But Customs Tariff Act contains the <coughs> computation of customs duty. That is, what is the procedure for computation of customs duty? What are the various customs duty rates that we have? So, which product is dutiable, which product is exempted, etc., that is there in Customs Tariff Act. So, when there will be levy under customs? So, first we need to know about the levy. Levy is given under section 12. Section 12 of Customs Act deals with levy. So, what is that levy? So, four conditions should be satisfied, then only there will be levy under customs. Number one, there must be goods, there must be goods. Number two, that goods must be dutiable goods, that goods must be dutiable goods and that dutiable goods must be imported or exported, okay, imported or exported and that import must be into India, import into India, import into India or export from India, okay. So, then there will be levy. So, what is the meaning of goods? Goods are defined under section 2 of customs. So, what is the meaning of goods? Goods means simply remember any kind of mobile property. So, that will come under goods, but in customs goods also includes currency. So, currency is also part of goods and uh, even vessels and aircrafts will also come under goods, baggage will also come under goods and stores will also come under goods. So, what will be treated as goods? So, goods means you know. Uh, any kind of mobile property that is the general meaning of goods as per the customs. So, what are all included? So, any kind of mobile property, any kind of mobile property, any kind of mobile property and it includes, so vessels and aircrafts, vessels and aircrafts. So, that vessels and aircrafts if you are bringing to India that will also be coming under goods and then stores. What is stores? Stores means which are for the purpose of usage during the journey that is known as stores like fuel, spare parts, anything which is for the usage during the journey is known as stores, okay, including vessels and aircrafts, stores, comma, baggage. What is baggage? Baggage refers to passengers luggage. So, baggage will also be coming under stores and even negotiable instruments, negotiable instruments will also be treated as goods, negotiable instruments and even currency. Okay. So, currency, this is the meaning of goods, but here one important point which we need to remember is that currency is goods for the purpose of customs, but currency is not goods for the purpose of GST. So, when we are importing currency, so as per baggage rules, beyond a quantity, if you are like beyond uh, a currency permitted as per our, uh, FEMA, if you are bringing that currency to India, you are required to pay IGST on that no, but you are required to pay customs duty on that yes. So, therefore, on import of currency we need to pay only customs duty, but we do not have to pay IGST because money will not be treated as goods under GST for that reason. Then what is the meaning of dutiable goods? This is the meaning of goods as per custom. What is the meaning of goods is this. Then what is the meaning of dutiable goods? Dutiable goods means goods which are covered under Customs Tariff Act 1975 is known as dutiable goods. Okay goods covered under goods covered under customs tariff act 1975 will be treated as dutiable goods now whenever some goods which are covered under customs tariff act are called as dutiable goods whether in customs exempted goods will also be called as dutiable goods yes exempted goods will also be called as dutiable goods so therefore first goods are divided into two for the purpose of customs dutiable non dutiable dutiable means covered under customs tariff act non dutiable means not covered under customs tariff act so dutiable whatever is covered under customs tariff act again divided into two that is on which duty is payable on which duty is not payable okay so for this purpose so how the goods are divided i am just explaining so, goods under customs divided into two, covered under levy, dutiable, non-dutiable. Dutiable means what? On which we need to pay duty is known as dutiable. That is covered under customs tariff act. Covered under 
covered under customs tariff act covered under customs tariff act 1975 is known as dutiable non dutiable means what non dutiable means not covered under not covered under customs tariff act 1975 will be called as non dutiable goods dutiable further divided into two what is that so that is on which duty payable duty not payable okay so duty payable duty payable are exempted okay so exempted will also be coming under dutiable for the purpose of customs okay so therefore this duty payable what are all the goods on which we need to pay duty is other than those which are exempted so therefore exempted as is given in customs so balancing figure will be duty payable so therefore what you need to remember is that under customs dutiable includes exempted but in gst it is not like that taxable supplies will not include exempted supplies in gst so we have a slight difference from gst to customs in customs dutiable includes exempted but in gst taxable do not include exempted because tax exempted supplies includes non taxable supply what is the meaning of exempted under gst taxable uh, that is uh, notified as exempted nil rated and non taxable as non taxable will come under exempted due to that reason taxable do not include exempted in gst but in customs dutiable includes exempted okay then this is about the meaning of dutiable goods now we need to know what is the meaning of import and what is the meaning of export so import means what bringing goods from india from outside india to india is known as import okay so what is the meaning of imported so imported means bringing into india from outside india bringing into india bringing into india from outside india from outside india is known as import okay then what is the meaning of export export means taking goods from india to a place outside india taking goods taking goods outside india from a place in india from a place in india so that is known as export then what is the meaning of india so india because the fourth condition says that even third point also imported or exported means what it should come into india or it should leave india what is the meaning of india india means up to 12 nautical miles from baseline up to 12 nautical miles up to 12 nautical miles from baseline is known as india from baseline is known as india this is the meaning of india for the purpose of customs but for the purpose of gst india means up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline whereas for the purpose of customs india means up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline so this is with respect to this customs okay so then we need to understand this little bit in detail that is whenever there is a levy we have discussed so that india definition let's uh, learn little bit in detail that is suppose if you are taking the baseline if you are taking the baseline this is the baseline from this baseline from this baseline up to 12 nautical miles up to 12 nautical miles is known as india okay so this is 12 nautical miles 12 nautical miles is known as india and so when the goods are said to be imported when goods enter into this 12 nautical miles or the goods leave this 12 nautical miles then the goods are said to be imported or exported okay when the goods enter when the goods enter this 12 nautical miles it is known as import same way when the goods leave this 12 nautical miles this is known as export okay now whereas the customs act extends up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline from this baseline the customs act extends up to 200 nautical miles so this up to 200 nautical miles is known as you know indian customs waters so this up to 200 nautical miles from baseline is there na this is known as what indian customs waters indian customs waters and this is also known as exclusive economic zone of india exclusive economic zone of india that will be called as exclusive economic zone of india what up to 200 nautical miles what is the purpose of this indian customs waters or exclusive economic zone of india so that is 
the provisions related to offences and penalties, the powers of customs officers will extend up to 200 nautical miles. Okay. So, power of customs officers. Powers of customs officers. Customs officers. Officers extended. Okay. The powers of customs officers extended. So, therefore, even though it is called as up to 12 nautical miles from baseline, but the powers of customs officers extends up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline means any person can be arrested when he is within 200 nautical miles or if any person is, uh, you know, transporting any goods which are liable for confiscation, the goods can be confiscated, the proper officer can board a vessel and check as to what are the goods that are there in that. So, all these powers are there up to 200 nautical miles. This is about, you know, the levy and the meaning of India, okay. So, that is this part, whatever we have seen. So, first we have seen about the levy, in that uh, here they have given some important definitions. Beneficial owner means who? Beneficial owner means the one who is importing the goods. So, that person or the one, the person on whose behalf the goods are being importing. For example, on my behalf, if you are importing and exporting, I am the beneficial owner, okay. So, remember on whose behalf? on whose behalf the goods are being imported or exported is known as beneficial owner. So, board means what? CBIC, Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs. What is called as customs area? Customs area means, so the area which is under the control of customs that can be port, airport or warehouse anything. So, that will be called as area of customs station or warehouse and any area which is uh, usually under the control of the customs authorities where the goods are ordinarily kept where the goods are ordinarily kept, that will also be called as customs area. Then customs station, customs station means what? Customs station means the port, customs port, customs airport, international courier terminal. So, that is the place where imports and exports by courier will take place, foreign post office, import and export by post will take place, land customs station is like a check post. So, from India to outside India, outside India to India, when the goods are coming by roadways, so that check post is known as land customs station. How port is for waterways and uh, airport is for airways, like that land customs station is for roadways, okay. Then warehouse, so in customs, warehouse is not owned by customs department, but it is licensed by the customs department. So, remember it is licensed, okay. So, customs department do not own any warehouse, it is licensed by the customs department. So, export already we have seen, so taking out of India to a place outside India. Import means what? Bringing into India from a place outside India. And what is the meaning of India? Up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline, that is territorial waters, okay. So, territorial waters is what? 12 nautical miles. So, importers, import is said to be commenced or it is import is said to take place when goods enter into 12 nautical miles and the same way import is said to, export is said to take place when goods cross the 12 nautical miles. So, it is like an imaginary line. It is an imaginary line. So, that is about territorial waters. Then Indian customs waters already I have explained up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. That is the exclusive economic zone. Exclusive economic zone means what? Usually 200 nautical miles. That is known as Indian customs waters. What is the significance of that Indian customs waters? Already I told you that a person who committed any offence, so will be arrested in the Indian customs waters and uh, any goods can be confiscated and vessel can be stopped in the Indian customs waters if they are doing smuggling and prohibited goods can also be confiscated. So, this is the powers of the customs officers that gets extended up to Indian customs waters. So, that is this and then next one is that what is the, so some more definitions are also there in this regard. So, this, yes. So, there are three aspects here. Levy. Levy is what we have discussed. So, levy is the stage at which there will be, you know, levy in the sense like imposition of duty. Assessment means when we need to compute and pay the customs duty. So, that is known as assessment for quantifying the tax. Whereas, the final stage is collection. So, when we are required to pay. So, first when there is levy and when there will be quantification of levy and collection means when we are required to pay. So, therefore, so first I have already discussed about the levy which is given under section 12. 
So what is that I told you that there should be goods and the goods should be covered under first there should be goods and that goods should be covered under customs tariff act and it should be imported or exported into India or from India then it will be called there will be levy. Whether government is also a person under customs yes government is a person not only under GST but under customs also government is a person. So government is also required to pay customs duty. However, we have certain exemptions with respect to government. Okay. So, the provisions of subsection 1 shall apply to all goods belonging to government as they apply to normal person also. However, there are some exemptions. What is that? Imports by Indian Navy and uh, then police, Ministry of Defense, Postal Guard, etc. If they are importing any goods, that will be generally exempted. Okay. And thereafter, some specific exemptions may also be given to the government then. So, government is also a person and this Indian Navy imports or police imports or defense or coastal guard imports, they are not required to pay. Then, this following proposition shall arise. First, duties of customs shall be levied on import or export of goods. In other words, the taxable event is what? Import or export is the taxable event. And so, this levy is subject to other sections. So, what are those other sections? Section 13, section 22 and section 23. What does these three sections deal with? Actually, in 23, again, there are two sections, 23 subsection 1 and 23 subsection 2. So, 23 subsection 1 talks about remission. 23 subsection 1 talks about remission. Whereas, 23 subsection 2 talks about relinquishment, relinquishment of title, okay, relinquishment of title. So, these are the three sections, four sections actually that should be connected to section 12. What does section 13 says? Whenever you are importing the goods and those goods are missing pilferage. Pilferage means what? Petty theft. Pilferage means what? Petty theft. So, whenever there is a petty theft, pilferage, in that case no need to pay customs duty. That is what section 13 says. Section 22 says whenever the goods are damaged. So, in that case reduced duty. So, in case of pilferage, no duty, no duty, but in case of damaged goods, there is something called as reduced duty. This reduced duty can be understood as abatement, reduction. So, no need to pay full custom duty, but you need to pay the reduced duty. Remission of duty. So, 23 subsection 1, remission of duty which says that when the goods are destroyed, in case of 22, the goods are damaged, but in case of 23, when the goods are destroyed, in that case, there will be remission of duty. How remission of duty is different from? abatement. In abatement, we need to pay duty but at reduced value. Whereas, in case of remission, we need to pay duty and we need to prove that the goods are destroyed and we will get the refund. How is it different from section 13? In section 13, they don't need to pay the duty at all but in remission of duty, first pay duty, prove that the goods are destroyed and you will get the refund. Whereas, 23 subsection 2 is there that is relinquishment of title. You imported the goods and the goods are not according to the specifications. When the goods are not according to the specifications, so that goods you can relinquish the title so that you don't have to pay duty. So, in the first case and last case, no need to pay duty. Which one? 13 case, no need to pay duty. Whereas, in case of 23 subsection 2, also no need to pay duty. But in case of 22 and 23 subsection 1, in case of 22, we need to definitely pay duty but reduce the duty. But in case of 23 subsection 1, we have to pay duty and prove that the goods are destroyed and then we will get the refund. That is how the connection between this is. And the duty shall be charged at that rates as may be specified under Customs Tariff Act. Already I told you that whatever goods that are imported on which we need to pay custom duty will be mentioned in the Customs Tariff Act. And garment goods shall be traded on par with non-garment goods also. Then here we need to understand there are two cases which talks about the taxable event under customs in case of import. So, when the goods are said to be imported, so there are two cases pa, that is garden silk mills case and Kiran spinning mills case, both are supreme court cases only. So, what is that these cases are telling? These cases are telling that when goods are imported that is crossing the territorial waters, it is not called as import, it is called as import only when the goods cross the customs barrier. For example, when the goods are imported which is under the control of customs, it is not said to be imported. Only when it cross the customs barrier, it is said to be imported. So, crossing of the customs barrier will be treated as import. So, what is the summary that you need to remember? As per Kiran spinning mills case and garden silk mills case of Supreme Court. So, what is the taxable event in case of import? So, the taxable event in case of import, taxable event in case of import, in case of import is what? Crossing customs barrier, crossing customs barrier is known as taxable event, 
crossing customs barrier is known as taxable event in case of import. So, that is what these two cases says. So, which means that when the goods are imported, the goods are dutiable, but at the time when we cleared it from the customs, so it got exempted, should we pay duty, no need to pay duty, same way. At the time when we imported, these were exempted and it was kept under the customs control. Thereafter, we cleared it from the customs control and it became dutiable. Should we pay duty? Yes, we need to pay the duty. So, the taxable event is crossing the customs barrier. Okay. So, at that time, whether the goods are dutiable or non-dutiable or exempted, we need to see and we need to pay the customs duty accordingly. This is in case of import. Okay, then what is the meaning of export? Export means already you know, so taking goods outside India and here we have crossing the territorial waters of India is treated as export. So, this is given under two cases pa, that is, so there are two cases which talks about taxable event in case of export. Taxable event in case of export. What is the taxable event in case of export? Crossing the territorial waters is known as taxable event. So, this is based on two cases that is you know, sun exports, sun exports case, sun exports case, this is also a supreme court case and Rajendra, Rajendra dying, dying and printing mills case, Rajendra dying and printing mills case, these two are of supreme court cases. What does these two cases tells? These two cases is telling that, so goods are said to be exported only when goods cross the territorial waters. In this Rajendra dyeing and printing mills case, it so happened that goods were sunk within the territorial waters, whether the goods are said to be exported, no goods are not said to be exported. But in Sun Exports case, it said that the goods cross the territorial waters and the goods return due to engine trouble and again at a later point of time it is going, when is, this, when is it said to be exported? At the time first when it crossed the territorial waters, the goods are said to be exported, that is given in Sun Exports case. Okay. Then whenever we are importing the goods, so what is the taxable event that we have seen here now? and based on the case last. So, there are two options available to an importer. Whenever the imported goods are there, either it can be cleared for home consumption or it can be cleared for warehousing. So, there are two options available to the importer. Option number one. So, imported goods can be directly cleared for home consumption. For clearing it directly for home consumption, they need to file one bill of entry called as bill of entry for home consumption. That is, so in the customs area, in the customs area, when the goods are unloaded, when the goods are unloaded, okay. So, say for example, this is customs port. This is customs port, okay. So, in this customs port, the goods will be unloaded. When the goods are unloaded, so these unloaded goods, these unloaded goods, okay, these unloaded goods were in port, these unloaded goods in port may be cleared directly to importer's place, may be cleared directly to importer's place. For clearing it directly to importer's place, so this is option 1, what they need to do? They need to file one bill of entry. What is that bill of entry? That is known as bill of entry for home consumption. So, directly it can be taken to importer's place. This is option 1. So, for that they need to file one bill of entry. What is it known as? BOE for home consumption, BOE for home consumption. Whether they need to pay customs duty? Yes, they need to pay customs duty. So, pay customs duty. Whereas, another is there, that is, they can take the goods to a customs warehouse. So, they can take the goods to a customs warehouse. So, in that customs warehouse, the goods can be deposited, okay. In that customs warehouse, the goods can be deposited, but for depositing the goods into the customs warehouse, we need to execute one bill of entry, that is known as bill of entry for warehousing. This is option number two, BOE for warehousing, BOE for warehousing also known as inbound bill of entry, also known as inbound or into bond bill of entry, inbound or into bond bill of entry. This is for what? For depositing the goods in the warehouse. Whether we pay customs duty or we will not pay customs duty, without payment of customs duty, without customs duty, it will be deposited in the warehouse. Again, we can take it from the customs warehouse to importer's place. Under option 2, we can take it from customs warehouse to importer's place by filing one bill of entry that is known as ex-bond bill of entry, 
X bond BOE for home consumption. Whether we need to pay customs duty or not, yes, we need to pay customs duty. So, these are the two options available to the importer. So, that is this information that is given. Okay. Then, next, uh, duty liability in certain special circumstances. Section 20 talks about reimportation of goods. What is this reimportation? Whenever, first of all, we are exporting the goods, those exported goods are reimported. Should we pay customs duty? Yes, we need to pay customs duty as if those goods are being imported for the first time into India. However, there are certain relaxations. There are two notifications which you need to remember 45 2017 and 60 2018. This is notification 45 2017. Okay, and then another notification is there. That is 60 2018 notification 45 2017 and another notification is there this notification 60 2018 updated okay it is 158 of 95 but that is updated by 60 2018 these are the two notifications that you need to remember the moment you see section 20 the moment you see section 20 what is section 20 dealing with section 20 dealing with reimportation of goods reimportation of goods so, whenever you are reimporting the goods, okay. So, there are two notifications that we need to understand. One notification is notification number 45 of 2017. What does this notification says? That is, you are first of all exporting, uh, importing the goods. See this. So, notification 45 2017. So, concessional duty payable in respect of reimportation of goods exported under duty drawback or exported for repairs. Okay. So, what is happening? First, you are importing the goods. When you are importing the goods, what you will do? You will pay customs duty. Okay. So, customs duty payable. And again, what you are doing? So, you are exporting it back. You are exporting it back. Why you are exporting it? any reason okay imported goods can be exported for any reason okay so whenever the goods are exported simple are you claiming any benefit are you claiming any benefit yes if you are claiming that benefit at the time of re-import at the time of re-import okay this is known as re-import at the time of re-import what you need to do pay back that benefit okay whereas if it is exported for repairs at the time of re-import, so you need to, you know, pay customs duty on fair value of repairs and freight and insurance both ways. Now, what happens at the time of export, we will see. Depending upon that, the re-import will change. At the time of export, say, at the time of export, what you are doing, you are paying customs duty. At the time of export, uh, sorry, at the time of export, you claimed incentive, claimed incentive, claimed incentive. So, what are the incentives that are available? We have duty drawback and we have, uh, you know, GST refunds like that. You claimed incentive. Upon re-import, what you need to do? So, you need to repay, that is pay, pay back incentive, pay back incentive. Whatever incentive that you claim, you pay back that incentive with interest. So, you don't have to pay full customs duty. Because already those goods are imported. Again, when you are re-importing, no need to pay customs duty. Then number two, at the time of export, suppose you have exported for repairs, for repairs, then you will not be claiming any incentive. Then at the time of re-import, pay customs duty on fair value of repairs, fair value of repairs. Fair value of repairs means what? means even though you are paying less an amount or whatever amount you pay the fair value how much is the real value that has been because if it is covered under warranty you will not pay the full amount so maybe some amount only you will pay or you will not pay any amount so we need to take the fair value means not the amount which you are paying not the amount that the importer is paying but the fair value of the repairs plus freight and insurance both ways freight and insurance Freight and insurance both ways. So, that should be taken. Okay. So, pay back the incentive with interest and pay customs duty and fair value of repairs plus freight and insurance both ways. This is when, when the goods are exported for repairs. Suppose, if the goods are exported upon payment of customs duty, upon payment of customs duty, upon payment of customs duty. So, then what will happen? Then at the time of re-import, 
सो कस्टम्स ड्यूटी नॉट पेएबल कस्टम्स ड्यूटी नॉट पेएबल ऑन री इम्पोर्ट कस्टम्स ड्यूटी नॉट पेएबल ऑन री इम्पोर्ट एंड कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन एक्सपोर्ट कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन एक्सपोर्ट कैन बी क्लेम्ड एज रिफंड बट दैट वी विल सी लेटर बट यू जस्ट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट कस्टम्स ड्यूटी नॉट पेएबल ऑन री इम्पोर्ट बट वॉट आर कस्टम्स ड्यूटी वी पेड ऑन एक्सपोर्ट दैट वी विल गेट एज अ रिफंड अंडर अ सपरेट सेक्शन कॉल्ड एज सेक्शन ट्वेंटी सिक्स विल गेट दट रिफंड बट so this is what the three points you need to remember at the time of export if you claim incentive pay back that incentive with interest at the time of export if it is exported for repairs you need to pay customs duty on fair value of repairs plus freight and insurance both ways at the time of export if you pay customs duty at the time of re import no need to pay any customs duty that is given here so under the claim of duty drawback or any incentive amount of incentive avail you need to pay and uh, suppose if it is for repairs abroad fair value of repairs and freight and insurance both ways and any other case means upon payment of duty no need to pay any customs duty upon re import what is the time limit the time limit for re importation from the time when it is exported it should be brought back within 3 years and it can be extended for a further period of 2 years so what is this time limit pa 3 years plus 2 years 3 years plus 2 years is the time limit from where to where from the export to re import the time limit is given as 3 years plus 2 years suppose if the goods are exported under you know advance authorization or epcg or any reward scheme under ftp the time limit is 1 year which can be extended for a further period of 1 year okay so generally the time limit is 3 years plus 2 years however if it is exported under any incentive for ftp okay so or in case of ftp foreign trade policy under foreign trade policy if it is exported advance authorization epcg or any incentive under foreign trade policy if it is exported so one year plus one year but otherwise it will be 3 years plus 2 years that is the time limit okay next so imported goods that is re imported goods and the exported goods should be same goods and there should not be any change in the ownership okay that is at the time of export whatever goods are there at the time of reimport also same goods at the time of export which person has exported at the time of reimport also the same person should have been reimported and this concessions will not be applicable to 100% eou or a unit in ftz why because first of all at the time of original import itself they would not have paid customs duty that's why this will not be applicable to them reimported goods has been exported from a public warehouse or private warehouse at the time of original import itself they would not have paid customs duty so therefore there is no customs duty at all first of all so why they are giving this concession because at the time of original import there is customs duty payable that's why they are giving this concession but in these two cases original import itself there is no customs duty that's why so re imported goods which fall under fourth schedule 2 central excise act that is uh, tobacco products and petroleum products so on that first of all you know there is uh, no levy of igst so due to that reason so these two products tobacco products and petroleum products they have given so therefore this is not applicable this notification 45 2017 not applicable in which cases so this is not applicable to this is not applicable to so eou eou and uh, then what is that eou public or private warehouse customs warehouse you remember it as customs warehouse customs warehouse then tobacco and petroleum products tobacco and petroleum products for these you know this notification 45 2017 will not be applicable okay then next one the next notification is 60 of 2018 so what is that 60 of 2018 this so here what happens is that first we are exporting okay notification 60 of 2018 notification number 60 of 2018 what happens first we are exporting first we are exporting there is something called as export and after export first we are exporting first there is export 
after export so the goods are imported so the goods are imported okay and after import after import the goods are again re-exported the goods are again re-exported okay so this is the process first export then import and again re-export so what will happen in this case so now for what purpose we are importing exported goods are re-imported so at the time of import no need to pay customs duty that is the benefit at the time of import customs duty not payable because whenever you are exporting those goods which are imported no need to pay customs duty but for what purpose we are importing for the purpose of refining processing repairs etc any reason okay so that is given here suppose if the goods are manufactured in india and re-imported for repairs or reconditioning other than specified goods what is the time limit within which it should come three years and in case of specified goods it will be seven years in case of specified goods it will be seven years and also you know this time limit for nepal and bhutan will be 10 years so you need to divide it into two that is remaking remaking for what purpose we are being bringing remaking comma reprocessing reprocessing comma refining refining for these three reasons if you are bringing the good should be brought back within what time limit one year within one year okay reprocessing refining remaking so one year what is the time limit for, for this one year means what is this one year from the export to, to import the time limit should be one year suppose if it is for if it is for repairs repairs are reconditioning reconditioning if it is for repairs or reconditioning then what is the time limit first we need to see what is the type of goods so notified goods other goods for notified goods it is seven years and for other goods for other goods it is three years and in both cases nepal and bhutan nepal and bhutan how many years 10 years this is the time limit within which the goods should be imported at the from the time of export then again at the time of re-export what is the time limit within which it should be re-exported so it should be re-exported within six months extendable to one year which means what is the time limit within which it should be re-exported pa this time limit this time limit six months six months plus six months it can be extended for a further period of six months now what is the benefit that you are getting here customs duty not payable that is the benefit so this time limits you need to remember why for refining remaking reprocessing it is one year because that is mainly because of the manufacturing defects whereas repair or reconditioning is based on usage that's the reason why the three years seven years time limit is given and 10 years also taken in case of you know nepal and bhutan so that much time after that only no, they will know that whether the goods are repaired or not so due to that reason so based on usage if there is any defect so the time limit of seven years three years ten years is given manufacturing defects identified within one year so that one year time limit is given okay and six months plus six months is the time within which it should be re-exported what will happen if you are not re-exporting within six months or extended time limit of six months then on this import whatever customs duty you did not pay that you need to pay okay this is the first condition in case of re-export then second condition is what that is good should be same the assistant commissioner or deputy commissioner should be satisfied as regard identity of the goods okay so that is goods must be same goods must be same and number three a bond should be executed bond should be executed bond should be executed okay so this is with respect to that notification number 60 of 2018 okay so that is with respect to this these two notification that we need to know how a question will be asked based on this so see this question a machine was originally imported from japan at 250 lakhs in july on payment of all duties of customs so the goods were exported sent back to the supplier for repairs for repairs we are sending so which notification 45 2017 and re-imported without any remanufacturing or reprocessing in october next year 
What is the time limit within which it should come back within three years plus two years? Yes, we are sending in which date? We are sending, you know, December, October next year. So within three years. So since the machine was under warranty period, the repairs were carried free of cost. So they have not charged anything. However, the fair cost of repairs would be 9 lakhs. So 9 lakhs will be taken. 9 lakhs. So what should be taken as value? Fair value of repairs plus freight and insurance both ways. So 9 lakhs. Actual insurance and freight both ways will be 3 lakhs. So 9 plus 3. What will be taken as value? Value will be 9 plus 3. 12 lakhs will be taken as the assable value. And the rate of basic custom duty is 10%, IDTEC rated is 12%, ignore compensation says and any other says and compute the uh, agriculture infrastructure says compute the custom duty payable. So if the assessable value, what should be taken as assessable value 12 lakhs, reason notification 45 2017. So customs duty, basic customs duty, basic customs duty will be 10% of this 12 lakhs, so 1 lakh 20,000 and then we have social welfare surcharge, social welfare surcharge always we need to take on basic custom duty which is 10% of basic custom duty. So 1,20,000 into 10% is what 12,000. So therefore 1,32,000. Now IGST, while computing IGST what we need to do, assable value plus all custom duties we should take. So what is the assable value 12 lakhs plus 1,32,000. So 12 lakhs plus 1,32,000 will be 13,32,000 on 13,32,000. So what is the IGST 12%. So therefore into 12%. So that will be 1,59,840. So this will be taken as the total customs duty payable. What is the total customs duty payable? 1,59,840. 1,59,840 plus. So 1,32,000. That will be 2,91,840 will be taken as the answer. Okay. You can see this. So the answer is 2,91,840. Understood? So this is the manner in which we need to compute the customs duty. So in case of notification 45 2017, first we need to write the notification. What is this notification 45 2017? What are the conditions? What is the time limit? And imported goods and uh, re-imported goods should be same and the ownership should not have changed. So then it will be coming under the concession. No need to pay full customs duty on the original value, but we need to pay customs duty on the reduced value. What is that reduced value that we need to write? Okay. Then we need to do the computation. This is about section 20. Then section 21. Section 21 talks about derelict, wreck, etc. Section 21. So section 12 we completed. 12 is what? Levy. 13 is what? Pilferage. And 22 is what? Abatement. Reduced customs duty. And 23 subsection 1. Remission of duty. 23 subsection 2. Relinquishment. 20. Concession with respect to reimportation and 21 we are discussing that is derelict jet sam wreck. So first we will understand what is derelict. Derelict refers to the ship which got derailed into the sea. Then jet sam. So whenever we need to save the ship from sinking, so we will throw the goods into the water that is known as jet sam or jettisoned goods. Then float sam, whatever goods that we have thrown into the water will continue to float. And wreck refers to damaged parts of the ship. Okay, so this derelict jet sam, float sam wreck brought or coming into India shall be dealt with as if they were imported into India. So normally how if goods are imported into India like that we need to treat and we need to pay the customs duty accordingly unless the proper officer has admitted duty free under this act. So otherwise no need to pay customs duty but if the officer is not admitting them duty free then we need to pay customs duty on this section like uh, these goods okay that is derelict jet sam float sam and brick what is the difference between jet sam and float sam so jet sam means those goods which are thrown into the sea is called as jet sam and float sam refers to those goods which are thrown into the sea which will continue to float is known as float sam both cases we need to pay duty if it is brought into india that is about uh, you know section 21 import of goods at concessional rate of duty import of goods at concessional concessional rate of duty rules rate of duty rules actually it is 2021 so it got updated okay 2017 that got updated and what happens here is that there is a importer pa there is a importer and this importer may be a manufacturer or a service provider. This importer may be a manufacturer, may be a manufacturer or service provider. What this importer is doing? This importer 
is eligible for import of goods at concessional rate of duty or without payment of customs duty. So, this importer is eligible for exemption. This importer is eligible for exemption notification, okay, eligible for exemption or concession, eligible for exemption or concession. When he will be eligible for exemption or concession, if suppose, say for example, a person is manufacturing COVID vaccine. For the sake of manufacturing COVID vaccine, they may allow the raw material to be imported without payment of custom duty like that. Okay. So, therefore, the importer is a manufacturer or a service provider and they are eligible for a exemption or a concession. What is the first step that they need to do? So, say this importer is located in, uh, that is located in one place. So, they need to submit the information and they need to execute a bond with the customs common portal. What is that customs common portal, ICE gate? Customs common portal, customs common portal is known as ICE gate, okay. ICE gate, ICE gate is the customs common portal. To this customs common portal, so what this importer has to do, he need to submit the information as to what are the goods that he want to import and why he is eligible for that exemption notification and what quantity he want to import, in which port he, need, he want to import, all that information he need to submit plus he need to execute a bond also, okay. Because if those goods are not used for the purposes for which it is imported, then the duty should be recovered from that person along with interest now for that reason he need to execute a bond also. Then immediately this is the first step. After that, this customs common portal ICE gate will be giving him one number. What is that number? So, import identification number. Import identification number. This import identification number IIN should be quoted with the customs officer at the time of filing bill of entry. So, in the port, in the port or airport, in the port or airport when the goods are imported. So, this person who this importer will be filing a bill of entry. This importer will be filing a bill of entry that is the third step and in that bill of entry he need to quote the IAN. Okay. So, bill of entry, bill of entry is one document which is filed by the importer with the customs officer to import the goods and he will, it will contain the details of what are all the goods that are required to be imported that is what is the goods value, duty payable etc. So, that bill of entry along with that is with IAN, with IIN, import identification number. So, then the port or airport, customs officer will know that these goods are to be imported without payment of customs duty or concessional customs duty. So, therefore, the goods will be released without payment of customs duty or at concessional customs duty, okay. So, that is clearance, clearance without payment of customs duty without payment of customs duty or concessional, concessional customs duty, okay. So, these are the four steps that the importer need to follow. So, now importer got the goods without payment of customs duty or at concessional customs duty. Now, what importer has to do is that, so he need to manufacture and export those goods, okay. So, this person is there now, one importer, he need to use those goods. So, use those goods for manufacture or provision of services, okay. So, now there will be some unutilized or defective goods, unutilized goods that is imported goods which are unutilized are defective goods, defective goods, okay. So, these are arising out of what imported on which no customs duty paid. Now, what are the options available? These unutilized goods or defective goods should be exported should be exported. When it is exported, no customs duty, no customs duty. That is, whether we are using it for the purpose of, purpose for which it is imported, no, we are not using. No customs duty, even though not used for the purpose for which it is imported, no need to pay customs duty because you are exporting it back. Or, clear it in India, sell, sold in India, sold in India, upon payment of, upon payment of customs duty plus interest, customs duty along with interest, 
along with interest. What is this? Why we need to pay interest? At the time when you are importing, you have imported without payment of customs duty. Na? So, at the time when you are imported, you have imported it without payment of customs duty. Na? So, when you imported without payment of customs duty, so therefore, you need to pay it now because you are selling it. Why I am not using it for the purpose? Because it is unutilized or defective goods. So, that goods is not used for the purpose for which it is imported. That is why we are paying customs duty along with interest. So, either this or this, we should complete within what time? Within 6 months. Okay. So, all this either export or sold in India. So, this should be done it is unutilized or defective goods, either you need to export or sell it in India. What is the time limit for this? Within 6 months. But this 6 months time limit is not applicable for capital goods. Not applicable for capital goods. This is not applicable for capital goods. So, whether this person only should manufacture or they can send the goods on job work. So, this manufacturer is there now. Either he can manufacture or he can get it manufactured on a job work basis. Okay. So, that is own manufacture, own manufacture, own manufacture or through job work or through job work. Okay. They can get it done through job work also. However, job work not permitted in case of jewelry, precious stones, etc. However, job work, however, job work not possible, not possible in case of jewellery and precious stones, precious metals, etc. In that case, job work not possible. Now, whenever we sell the goods upon payment of customs duty, whether what is that customs duty, that is original customs duty that were be, that was exempted or given concession that much. However, in case of capital goods, we need to pay customs duty on depreciated value. Okay. So, customs duty on capital goods. In case of capital goods, in case of capital goods, in case of capital goods on depreciated value. So, what we need to do? So, we need to pay customs duty, but not full value because capital goods we are using. So, in case of capital goods on depreciated value, depreciated value. What is the depreciated value? Easily you can remember. So, first year it is 4 percent. Sorry, I just changed it. For every quarter or part thereof, in the first year it is 4 percent. Then, second and third year it is 3 percent. Second and third year, second and third year it is 3 percent. Fourth and fifth year, fourth and fifth year it is 2.5 percent thereafter it is 2 percent. So, this is the way in which depreciation needs to be computed on this. So, this much if you remember for import of goods at concessional rate of duty rules that is sufficient. So, with this, this part is over. They have given lot of information, but this is what really you need to remember. Okay. And then section 14 talks about assessment, uh, assessment that is valuation of goods. The valuation of goods is given in section 14. So, what does section 14 says? that the assable value should be taken as the transaction value. So, that we will learn in another chapter that is valuation chapter. Whereas, section 15 talks about relevant date for determination of rate of duty. What you need to remember first, if it is import, if it is import and in that import also we have two options. So, what we are trying to understand relevant date for determination of rate of duty, relevant date for determination, determination of rate of duty, rate of duty. So, which date duty rate should be taken? Okay. So, first in case of import, in case of import it is given in section 15, whereas in case of export it is given in section 16. So, import again two cases we have now that is home consumption or warehousing, correct? Two options are there. If it is for home consumption, if it is for home consumption or if it is for warehousing, okay. Then, if it is imported goods for home consumption, 
what is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty if it is by vessel if it is by vessel we need to take grant of entry inwards grant of entry inwards the date on which grant of entry inwards is given or bill of entry date boe date boe date whichever is later whichever is later grant of entry inwards or bill of entry whichever is later should be taken in case of aircraft in case of aircraft or vehicle in case of aircraft or vehicle we need to take arrival date arrival date or bill of entry date whichever is later should be taken okay arrival date or bill of entry date whichever is later should be taken this for what relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of imported goods and for cleared for home consumption if it is for warehousing all cases only one that is ex bond bill of entry only one bill of entry we file now for clearance from the warehouse so therefore ex bond bill of entry only should be taken in both the cases okay whereas in case of export what is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty it is let export order what is the rate of duty prevailing on let export order this let export order is one order passed by the customs officer for the purpose of export that should be taken this is for what this for the purpose of relevant date for determination of rate of duty suppose if it is improper import or improper export what is improper import or export means smuggled goods you need to take the date on which we pay the customs duty on the date whatever is the rate prevailing that should be taken okay then what is the relevant date for determination of exchange rate relevant date for determination relevant date for determination of exchange rate exchange rate what is the relevant date for determination of exchange rate in case of exchange rate what we need to do again import or export okay it is divided into two import export in case of import option 1 that is home consumption home consumption or option 2 warehousing warehousing okay so what should be taken as the relevant exchange rate so in case of home consumption only one bill of entry we file that is normal bill of entry for home consumption boe date this for what exchange rate for warehousing there are two bill of entries inbound bill of entry and export bill of entry which should be taken inbound bill of entry into bond bill of entry should be taken as the relevant date for determination of exchange rate in case of export shipping bill there is one document which will be presented by the exporter with the customs officer that is shipping bill or bill of export shipping bill or bill of export so that should be taken this is the relevant date for determination of exchange rate so that is what is given here goods cleared for home consumption bill of entry date or entry inwards date in case of aircraft or vehicle arrival date whichever is later warehouse date on which bill of entry ex bond bill of entry presented any other goods date on which duty is paid okay then next so you see this question an importer imported consignment of goods chargeable to duty at 40% ad valorem the vessel arrived on 31st may vessel vessel imports by vessel a bill of entry for warehousing warehousing was presented on 2nd june and the goods were duly warehoused in the meantime an exemption notification was issued on 15th october reducing the effective customs duty to 25 ad valorem so what is the taxable event the date at which goods are cleared from the customs barrier that is that in the warehouse when we keep the goods the goods are still under the control of customs so the date when we clear the goods from the warehouse that should be taken as a relevant rate so that is ex bond bill of entry when you present at the time of clearance only na from the warehouse so therefore ex bond bill of entry date thereafter bill of entry filed for home consumption this is only known as ex bond bill of entry on 20th october as on 20th october whether there is change in rate yes effective rate is 25% ad valorem so what is the rate that we need to take 25% only the rate is the what we need to take department is asking for 40% which is wrong the relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of warehouse goods is the ex bond bill of entry for home consumption in this case it is 20th october on that date the rate is 25% so that 25% only we need to pay okay 
so this is about relevant date for determination of rate of duty then remission so this section 13 we discussed now vaguely that section 13 22 and uh, 23 subsection 1 23 subsection 2 in detail it is given here so no duty payable on pilfered goods so section 13 no need to pay any good duty and when the goods should have been pilfered the goods should have been pilfered before order for clearance is made suppose if the goods are cleared and thereafter the goods are pilfered so in that case it will not be applicable okay the goods should have been pilfered before the order for clearance is made okay so now what we will do so i am just making a comparative statement with respect to this all the four sections so then you will get an idea about this okay so concessions with respect to import of goods concessions concessions with respect to import of goods import of goods what is that concession with respect to import of goods so there are total section 13 section 22 section 23 subsection 1 and section 23 subsection 2 these are the various sections now what is the title of this section section 13 no duty on pilferage no duty on pilferage okay whereas section 22 abatement abatement on goods damaged then 23 subsection 1 remission on goods destroyed okay whereas 23 subsection 1 relinquishment of title relinquishment of title okay now what is the reason what is the reason for application of this section? What is the reason for application of each and every section? What is the reason? When section 13 will be applicable in case of pilferage? What is pilferage means? Petty theft. Pilferage means petty theft. And when 22 is applicable in case of damage or deterioration, deterioration. And when 23 is applicable, destruction destruction of goods then uh, destruction of goods or abandonment of goods abandonment of goods then when 23 subsection 2 is applicable goods not conforming to specifications goods not conforming to specifications so these cases these are the reasons for which that section will be applicable so what is the meaning of pilferage pilferage refers to petty theft petty theft okay now what is the benefit that we will get in each and every case what is the benefit what is the benefit that we will get in case of pilferage whether we need to pay duty or no need to pay duty no duty duty not payable duty not payable by importer duty not payable by importer okay but who will pay duty the imported goods will be kept under the control of a custodian that custodian will pay the duty custodian who is a officer of port trust authority or airport authority of india so that custodian shall pay customs duty custodian shall pay customs duty then in case of abatement what will happen in case of abatement abatement so we need to pay proportionate customs duty with respect to damaged goods okay so for original value for original value what is the original customs duty okay and for damaged value for damaged value what is the customs duty payable proportionate customs duty cross multiplication that is damaged value into original customs duty divided by original value that's how the proportionate customs duty payable okay so what is that we do here proportionate customs duty proportionate customs duty payable okay then in case of remission of duty what will happen first pay customs duty pay customs duty then prove 
that goods are destroyed prove that goods are destroyed and you will get the refund okay you will get the refund that is with respect to this whereas in the last case whether we need to pay customs duty no duty not payable by importer whenever we relinquish the title duty not payable by importer okay and when this can be claimed when it can be claimed when it can be claimed when it can be claimed in case of section 13 that is pilferage when it can be claimed so before order for clearance when it can be claimed before order for clearance before order for clearance and when we can claim abatement abatement also before order for clearance so customs officer will pass an order now before order for clearance that is as well as at any time after after order for clearance means you remember before actual clearance that way you remember before actual clearance even after order and before actual clearance we can claim abatement before actual clearance means it is applicable for warehoused goods yes then here when remission same way before actual clearance before actual clearance and when there will be this uh, relinquishment of title first you should not take the title so before order for clearance before order for clearance whether applicable for warehoused goods whether applicable whether applicable for warehoused goods whether applicable for warehoused goods in case of section 13 whether it is applicable for warehoused goods no because any time before order for clearance this is before actual clearance so yes here also before actual clearance yes here it is before order for clearance so it is no but remember the deterioration should have happened before or at the time of unloading thereafter if deterioration happens we will not get benefit okay so some special points in this regard last pa some special points in this regard what is that special points in case of pilferage suppose if the goods are restored then importer should pay the customs duty actually goods are miss missing that's why importer did not pay customs duty if goods are restored goods are restored okay goods are restored customs duty payable by importer customs duty payable by importer when if the goods are restored suppose if the goods are not restored no need to pay customs duty this is the special point in case of pilferage abatement so abatement you need to remember deterioration deterioration should be should be before or at the time of unloading before at the time of unloading not after before or at the time of unloading before or at the time of unloading which one deterioration whereas in case of remission of duty we don't have any special points and in case of relinquishment of title relinquishment not possible relinquishment not possible in case of prohibited goods so whatever you are importing itself is prohibited goods for that under relinquishment is not possible in case of prohibited goods in case of prohibited goods which are imported it is not possible so these are the various concessions that we have with respect to import of goods so this comparative table when you remember pa so any question that is asked on this you will be able to happily answer without any confusion okay so this is what you need to remember so we completed all these four sections in a summary form which is given in your uh, study material okay so how the abatement is computed for one question is there you see if the value of goods is 10,000 
and after damage the value is 2000 then duty payable on 10000 should be proportionately reduced to 20% like that okay now see this question number 5 peerless scraps imported during august by c a consignment of metal scrap weighing 6000 metric tons from usa they filed a bill of entry for home consumption the assistant commissioner passed an order for a clearance of goods and applicable duty was paid on them paid by them so peerless scraps thereafter found on taking delivery from the port trust authorities that only 5500 metric tons of scrap were available they imported 6000 metric tons 5500 so 500 metric tons were missing that cannot be called as pilferage because 500 metric tons is not petty theft so it's a huge then the only benefit that we will be getting will be section 23 subsection 1 that is remission of duty okay so we need to write about section 23 subsection 1 remission of duty related provisions peerless craft may take shelter under 23 justifying his claim for remission of duty then section 24 talks about denaturing or mutilation of goods denaturing means when you import the goods that goods are capable of twin purposes so depending upon the purpose the duty will be there now you will make the goods denatured so that it will be unfit for the other purpose so for whichever purpose you are importing for that purpose only you will be using okay for example they have given one uh, uh, example ethyl alcohol ethyl alcohol can be used for industrial as well as human consumption suppose if it is used for industrial you know then it attracts lower rate of duty then what they need to do so therefore they need to denature this and make it unfit for human consumption and that is used only for industrial purpose then they will make customs duty they will pay only on the denatured ethyl alcohol at a lower rate of duty like that when it is capable of using it for twin purposes depending upon the purpose when the duty is payable so we can denature it make it unfit for other purpose so that we can use it for another you know, the purpose for which we import and pay that appropriate customs duty that is known as denaturing whereas mutilation of goods mutilation of goods means we are importing second hand cars second hand cars are having highest customs duty in india so therefore what we need is not second hand car the parts of that car but we are importing a second hand car so import the second hand car take the parts and remaining body of the car you crush it only parts you take so that you need to pay customs duty only on parts of the car okay at a lower rate but if you import it as a second hand car you need to pay higher customs duty so you can make a request for mutilation of goods that is known as denaturing or mutilation section 24 okay then 25 talks about exemption from payment of customs duty actually section 12 to 25 everything is covered here except 14 14 is coming in valuation be other than 14 everything is covered 12 levy 13 pilferage 14 is valuation another chapter 15 so relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of import and 16 relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of export and 17 18 19 so these three are related to self-assessment provisional assessment and articles liable to different rate of duties those three that also we have not discussed that will come in a different place this 14 then 17 18 19 20 covered here 20 that is concession with respect to reimportation the two notifications 45 2017 and 60 2018 and then 21 derelict jetsam wreck uh, etc 22 abatement 23 again two subsections 23 1 remission of duty 23 subsection 2 relinquishment of title 24 denaturing or mutilation of goods 25 talks about exemption from payment of customs duty so central government is having power to grant the exemption from payment of customs duty either it can be a general exemption or it can be a specific exemption general exemption means from time to time in the public interest what they will do so by notification in an official gazette they will be exempting okay and so whereas special exemption is that is also in public interest but not by way of notification but by special order in exceptional circumstances for example covid or some other cases exceptional circumstances they will be giving an exemption that is known as specific exemption so whenever they are giving exemption they need to keep in mind that it should be for the general public interest only they are giving this exemption okay so that is with respect to this and what is the effective date of the exemption notification the date on which it is issued for publication in the official gazette but not the date when it is published in the official gazette okay see this when the exemption notification does not mention the date the notification comes into effect from the date of its issue 
date of its issue for publication for publication not the date when it is published suppose if the notification says with effect from this date then the date only will be taken okay so the date on which they will be telling that date will be taken date of its public that is date of notification if they are not giving okay suppose if it is through special order then so they will be telling as to whenever it is issued or even they can give retrospectively also okay so this 25a and 25b these two sections are actually enacted but it is not made effective these two sections covering only we have notification 45 2017 and notification 60 2018 so you don't have to learn this note sections 25a and 25b so in this types of customs duties what we have is that already we saw section 12 charging section which says that customs duty is payable at that rates which is prevailing in customs tariff act 1975 so and accordingly for computation of customs duty we need to refer to customs tariff act 1975 and as per section 2 of customs tariff act there are two schedules that we have in customs tariff that is first schedule which talks about import tariff and second schedule which talks about export tariff okay and in this first schedule and second schedule whatever is the rates that we have that rate only will be taken as the basic customs duty then we have standard rate of duty and preferential rate of duty so when you are importing from any country it will be standard rate when you are importing from countries with which India is having a trade agreement then the preferential rate of duty will be applicable but what are the conditions for preferential rate of duty so that is the importer should make a specific claim for the preferential rate and the goods are manufactured or produced in such preferential area and that area should be notified as preferential area and country of origin certificate should be made available the origin of goods shall be determined so country of origin certificate should be made available in that case the preferential rate of duty will be applicable okay then so whether we need to pay igst also on import and compensation says also on import yes so now this we are learning in connection to this we are learning in connection to so gst that is whenever we are manufacturing that is domestic versus import we will see so domestic domestic versus import domestic versus import now alcoholic liquor for human consumption if you take alcoholic liquor for human consumption domestic alcoholic liquor alcoholic liquor for human consumption human consumption sold in the domestic market okay what is that we need to pay whenever it is sold in the domestic market we need to pay excise duty we need to pay what part present excise duty we need to pay domestic okay domestic whenever alcoholic liquor for human consumption is being sold we need to pay you know excise duty which excise duty is state excise duty and cst and what okay state excess duty is payable and cst slash vat is payable what about gst gst is not applicable gst is not applicable a state excess duty is payable on import we need to pay cvd countervailing duty under section 3 subsection 1 of customs tariff act 3 subsection 1 of customs tariff act 1975 countervailing duty payable and wherever cst or vat is there there we need to pay special additional duty under section 3 subsection 5 of customs tariff act 1975 wherever there is gst is there on import we need to pay igst under section 3 subsection 7 and ses under section compensation says under section 3 subsection 9 is payable okay so igst is levied under section 3 subsection 7 compensation says under section 3 subsection 9 we need to pay 
as there is no GST on alcoholic liquor for human consumption, we do not have to pay this IGST on compensation cess on import and CSTR VAT is there, then parallel SAD should be there, but SAD is also not applicable, they have relieved, which means on domestic sale of alcoholic liquor for human consumption, we need to pay state excise duty as well as CST VAT, whereas on import, we need to pay only CVD with respect to alcoholic liquor for human consumption. Then, next one, pa. second product is petroleum products. Petroleum products. What are those petroleum products? We have five petroleum products. We have five petroleum products that is crude oil, natural gas, crude oil, natural gas, petrol, diesel and ATF, aviation turbine fuel. So, these are the five petroleum products. Domestic, what we need to pay? We need to pay central excise duty, then CST or VAT and GST on domestic. But GST is not there. As GST is not there, so therefore, parallelly, IGST under section 37 and composition, compensation says under section 39 will not be there. Okay, this will not be there. Then, as central excise duty is there, we have CVD under section 3 subsection 1 of customs tariff act and SAD as CST and VAT is there. We have SAD under section 3 subsection 5 of customs tariff act. Okay, I am just linking between domestic and import so that you will know what are the duties that we need to pay. So, wherever state excise duty or central excise duty is there, we need to pay CVD. Wherever CSTR VAT is there, we need to pay SAD. But in case of alcoholic liquor, no need to pay SAD. Wherever GST is there on import, we need to pay IGST and compensation says. Okay. Then, next one, number three, that is tobacco and tobacco products tobacco and tobacco products in case of tobacco and tobacco products on domestic we need to pay what so we need to pay central excise duty and gst we don't have to pay cst and vat we don't have so we have to pay only central excise duty then GST, we do not have to pay anything, we do not have to pay remaining CST, VAT and all. So, our central excise duty is there. So, on import of tobacco and tobacco products, we need to pay CVD under section 3 subsection 1 of customs tariff act and as GST is there, domestic, so on import we need to pay IGST under section 3, 7 and compensation says under section 3, 9. So, this is what we need to remember. Then, apart from this, any other goods, any other goods, apart from this, any other goods, any other goods, domestic, we need to pay only GST. So, on import, we need to pay IGST under section 37 and compensation says under section 39. Okay. So, this chart you need to remember so that it will help you in both GST as well as in customs, okay. Then, so how to compute the customs duty payable? Procedure for computation of customs duty payable. Computation of, computation of customs duty payable. So, what is this CVD and SAD? That is, even after implementation of GST, still there is something called as excise duty, central sales tax and what? on locally sold goods. So, therefore, this excise duty and sales tax as a counterbalance on import we used to pay CVN and SAD. So, at present what are all the goods on which excise duty and sales tax is applicable? Those goods if it is imported CVN and SAD is payable. Okay. Now, how to compute the customs duty payable? Customs duty payable will be in three blocks. So, in the first block we need to take basic customs duty. Okay. Basic customs duty at some rate which is given, that will be given in the exam itself, you do not have to do anything at the given rate. Okay. 
on what on accessible value we need to compute so now you will get some basic customs duty then social welfare surcharge at the rate of 10 percent always it will be 10 percent on what on basic customs duty so that will be taken then we have something called as cvd cvd under section 3 subsection 1 at so that rate will be given in the question itself but that will be computed on what? On assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge. On these three, CVD will be computed. But CVD is applicable on what goods? Only two goods CVD is applicable. What are those two goods? Alcoholic liquor and petroleum products. Huh? Alcoholic liquor and petroleum products and tobacco and tobacco products these three cases cvd will be applicable okay cvd will be applicable on what products pa alcohol alcohol petroleum petroleum products then tobacco products on this cvd will be applicable if it is given then only we need to take and the sum of this this is the first block the sum of this is known as customs duties customs duties excluding additional customs duties okay what are the additional customs duties that we have we have safeguard duty pa safeguard duty this safeguard duty will be levied under section 8b of customs tariff act 1975 how to compute this it will be at a percentage at a rate and that rate will be given in the question and it will be computed on assable value or landed value it will be computed on assable value or landed value so what is the meaning of landed value landed value means same av plus bcd plus social welfare surcharge that is known as landed value so it will be given in the question itself Suppose if the question is silent, you take it on assable value. If it is given in the question on assable or land value, we will take. Okay. So that will be called as safeguard duty. And thereafter, we have something called as anti subsidy duty. This anti subsidy duty will be levied under section 9 of Customs Tariff Act 1975. And this anti subsidy duty also at the rate which will be given in the question itself it will be given on what it will be computed on assable value or landed value on assable value or landed value that will be given in the question itself if the question is silent you take it on assable value so that will be anti subsidy duty this anti subsidy duty also known as countervailing duty but already there is one countervailing duty under 31 that's the reason why i just changed the name to anti subsidy duty then anti dumping duty anti dumping duty will be levied under section 9a of customs tariff act 1975 and what is that anti dumping duty it will be absolute it is not a percentage it will be dumping margin or injury margin whichever is lower dumping margin or injury margin dumping margin or injury margin whichever is lower will be taken so now when you add that you will be getting anti-dumping duty now this is block two so in this block one in this block one we have only three but next block two we have only three additional customs duties so now when you add this we will be getting customs duties excluding customs duties excluding igst and compensation says comma sad okay now for this we need to add igst at the rate that will be given in the question you don't have to worry on what igst on what on a civil value plus all customs duties up to this all customs duties up to this stage what are all the customs duties is there 
that should be taken. So first assemble value we need to take and all customs duties up to this stage we need to take and on that we will be computing IGST. Whereas GST compensations is also the same way. Okay, GST compensation says at the rate which is given, at the rate which is given and this will be computed on what? Again same, it will be computed on assemble value plus all customs duties, all customs duties. Now, whatever you get. Now, then we have something called as SCAD, special additional duty at, again, this will also be at the given rate, computed on what? Ditto, ditto on what? Same, assemble value plus all customs duties up to this stage, okay? Now, remember that whenever there is IGST or GST compensation says SAD will not arise, okay. So, actually these three will be third block, but IGST, GST compensation says versus SAD is mutually exclusive, why? SAD is applicable only on which products? Petroleum products, only on petroleum products only on petroleum products, but on petroleum products we do not have GST, na? so due to that reason SCD, SAD wherever it is coming, IGST, GST compensations will not come. Now finally what you get is the total customs duties payable, total customs duties payable, so this is what you need to remember, pa. okay. How to compute the customs duty payable? This template, if you remember, you will be able to arrive at the answers. Okay. Then, so IGST computed on what? So all these things is given. Now, we will be looking into this section 3.8a. Manner of computing IGST in case of warehoused goods and also we will see in case of goods imported on high sea basis, how the customs duty will be computed, okay. So that part we will see now. So computation of customs duty, this is general. This is general. What is the template? Computation of customs duty, general, okay. Whereas we will see computation of customs duty on high sea basis computation of customs duty on high seas, high seas basis. What is this high seas basis? Now listen carefully. First, Mr. A is the original importer. Mr. A is the original importer and this original importer Mr. A whether CVD applicable on alcoholic liquor for industrial consumption, no pa. Because on alcoholic liquor for industrial consumption, we have GST. Wherever GST is there, IGST will come. Only on alcoholic liquor for human consumption, so there is no GST. So we have state excise duty, so CVD is applicable, okay. Now, Mr. A is a original importer who is importing goods for, you know, $10,000 imported goods, import value, imported goods, imported goods for $10,000. Now where the goods are in transit, the goods are in transit. Now what Mr. A did, he transferred the document of title to Mr. B. Subsequent buyer to this subsequent buyer, so what A is doing, A has transferred the document of title to the goods. So transfer of documents. What is the documents? Airway bill or bill of lading like that. For what value? For say $10,500. Now, who will be considered as importer? Mr. B will be considered as importer. And this transfer of documents of title is there na. This is known as 
high C cell because where the goods are in in transit. Now again, what Mr. B did, Mr. B sold to Mr. C a, at another subsequent buyer, at another subsequent buyer. So Mr. C to Mr. C, the sale has taken place. Now there is transfer of documents. There is transfer of documents and for this transfer of documents some amount has been paid okay say $12,000 $12,000 now who will be called as the importer for the purpose of customs so for customs purpose Mr. C is the importer importer for customs importer for customs purpose okay who will be called as importer for customs purpose Mr. C. So who will be filing the bill of entry Mr. C will file bill of entry okay Mr. C will file bill of entry pa file bill of entry file BOE and pay customs duty okay now what is the customs duty that Mr. C will pay what will be taken as the assable value what will be taken as the assable value assable value is not $10,000 the assable value is $12,000 the assable value is what $12,000 the last purchase price will be taken the last purchase price will be taken now this transfer of document to title is there na this will be called as this will be called as high C sale. This transfer by way of transfer of documents to title is there na. This is known as high C sale. Okay. And so this 10,500 received by A is not a supply under GST. Not a supply under GST. Excluded from supply. Not a supply under GST. This is excluded from supply pa. And same way, B is transferring the document of title to Cena. That is also excluded from supply as per section 7, subsection 2, read with schedule 3 of CGST Act. It is excluded from supply, not a supply under GST. So, whether they need to pay any GST, no, not a supply under GST. They don't have to pay GST, but the ultimate importer is there, na? that is Mr. C. He need to pay customs duty by taking assable value as 12,000. Now, suppose if basic customs duty is 10%, if basic customs duty is 10%, okay, if basic customs duty is 10% and IGST BCD is 10% and IGST is 18%, compute customs duty payable, come on, and the exchange rate, exchange rate exchange rate so is 79 rupees per dollar first assable value what is the assable value assable value equals to 12,000 dollars into 79 rupees per dollar that will be equals to rupees so 12,000 into 79 will come to 9,48,000 9,48,000 is what? Assable value. So, 9,48,000 is assable value. But we need to compute customs duty payable. So, what is the basic customs duty? Basic customs duty at the rate of 10% on 9,48,000 that will be 94,800. Add social welfare surcharge at the rate of 10% on basic customs duty that is 94,800, 94,800 is 9,480. This is social welfare surcharge. Then you need to add this too. So, 948,000 to 11% directly. That is, so 104, 104,280. To this, add IGST. IGST at what rate? 18% on what? On so 9,48,000 into 
plus this one lakh four thousand. So ten lakh fifty two thousand two eighty. So on that you calculate eighteen percent. That will be one lakh eighty nine thousand four ten. Now if you do the total, that will be called as total customs duty payable. That is one lakh four thousand two eighty plus this. So two lakh ninety three thousand six ninety will be taken as total customs duty payable, excluding the additional customs duties etc. The total customs duty payable will be two lakh ninety three thousand six ninety. This will be taken as the correct answer. Okay. So this is how we need to do. Suppose what if Mr. B is selling for Nine thousand dollars to Mr. C. What will be taken as the assessable value? If Mr. B is selling for nine thousand dollars to C, what will be taken as assessable value? Come on, respond. If B is selling to C for nine thousand dollars, what will be taken as the assessable value? If B is selling for nine thousand dollars to C, what will be taken as the value? Nine thousand dollars or or any other amount? What will be taken? Nine thousand only. The last purchase price should be taken as the assessable value. The last purchase price should be taken as the assessable value. Sir, why like that? That's how the provision is given. The last purchase price. But department may not agree. Department will ask. So why you have imported? Because they will have an invoice. Department will get the invoice and department. That is Mr. A name will be there on the goods. So the invoice should be of Mr. A. And Mr. C should produce the price at which he purchased from B, along with the price at which B purchased from A. Everything should be made available to the department. Now, department will ask: When original import is for ten thousand dollars, why are you buying at nine thousand dollars? So there could be some genuine reason that so maybe the imported goods life has come down or damaged or some reason. Then customs department will agree. Otherwise, they will reject and they will determine the value. Okay. So the last purchase price should be taken as the value in case of high seas. Then computation of customs duty payable on warehoused goods. Computation, computation of customs duty, computation of customs duty payable on warehoused goods on warehoused goods. Okay. How the customs duty will be payable on warehoused goods? Simple pa. First, you know, Mr. A is the original importer. Mr. A is original importer. And what Mr. A did? Mr. A has originally imported for. So import. Imported goods for ten thousand dollars, and these goods were deposited in warehouse without payment of customs duty. Okay, what happened? These imported goods deposited in warehouse. Deposited in warehouse without payment of customs duty. Without customs duty payment, where these goods are kept, these goods are deposited in warehouse. Now, what Mr. A is doing? So he is transferring the document of title to Mr. B, subsequent buyer. Subsequent buyer, they are transferring the warehouse receipt. Okay, warehouse receipt. Now, who will do the clearances? Mr. B will do the clearances. So what A is doing? Transfer of warehouse receipt. Transfer warehouse receipt. Transfer warehouse receipt. For which, so Mr. B has paid a consideration of, you know, eleven thousand five hundred dollars for this warehouse goods. Now who will be called as importer for the purpose of customs? So Mr. B will be called as importer. For customs, for customs purpose, for customs purpose, who will be called as importer, Mr. B? Now A is getting eleven thousand five hundred. Now that will be not a supply under GST. 
that will also be excluded from supply under 7 subsection 2, not a supply under GST, okay, not a supply under GST. Now, what B is doing? So, B will be filing bill of entry, okay. So, B files bill of entry, file X bond bill of entry, X bond BOE to clear warehoused goods, to clear warehoused goods, okay. What will be taken as assable value in this case? What will be taken as assable value in this case? Come on. So, how much will be taken as assable value? $10,000 only. It is not 11500 That's the difference between warehoused goods and high sea sales. In case of high sea sales, we will be taking the last purchase price. But here we will not take last purchase price. The assable value will be the price at which goods are originally imported only. So, assable value will be $10,000 only. Then, what will be taken as the customs duty payment if BCD is 10%, IGST is 18% and exchange rate, exchange rate is exchange rate is 80 rupees per dollar okay now what we need to do in this case simple first what is the assable value what is the assable value assable value equals to 10000 dollars into rupees 80 per dollar that will be so 10000 into 80 8 lakhs okay 8 lakhs will be taken as assable value over a now, basic customs duty, simple, 8 lakhs into 10 percent, that equals to 80,000. Then, social welfare surcharge, 80,000 into 10 percent, that equals to 8,000. Uh. Then, 88,000 will be taken as customs duty, excluding IGST. Now, for computing IGST, there is a treatment. What is that? Yay. Yay. Assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge. IGST is computed on assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge into 18 percent. Okay. What is that? So, that is 8 lakh 88,000 into 18 percent. 8 lakh 88,000 into 18 percent. 1,59,840 or, or, or B, B, another point is there, B. What is the value at which A is selling to B? What is the value at which A is selling to B? Transaction value, $11,500, take that. $11,500 into, what is the exchange rate? 80 rupees per dollar into 18%, how much? So, 11,500 into 80 rupees into 18 percent, that will be 1,65,600, whichever is higher, whichever is higher should be taken, whichever is higher is what? 1,65,600, got it? This is how we need to compute IGST, I do not know whether you learnt it or not. So, this is the way in which we need to compute IGST and what is the total customs duty payable? Total customs duty payable will be, total customs duty payable will be 1,65,600 plus 88,000, that will be 2,53,600 will be taken as the total customs duty payable. Sir, where is it given, sir, that IGST will be computed this way? This is given in section 3, clause 8A, see that. So, what should be taken as the value for the purpose of calculating IGST, where the whole of the goods are sold, the value determined under subsection 8, regular, regular, or the transaction value of such goods, whichever is higher should be taken, okay. Regularly, whatever you do, that one, or the transaction value at which the goods are sold, whichever is higher should be taken, and that will be taken as the IGST payable. And remember, this will be applicable only when the goods, warehoused goods are sold by the original importer to another person. Suppose, if A is only clearing the goods, if A is only clearing the goods from the warehouse, 
IGST computed normally only. What is it normally? Assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge into 18%. That much only. No need to compare transaction value. When that will be applicable? When the A is original importer is selling the warehouse goods to subsequent buyer and that subsequent buyer is clearing, then only the section 3 sections, uh, subsection 8A will be applicable. So, whichever is higher will be taken. Okay. Now, what if, what if A is selling to B, B is selling to C and C is making the clearance, then we need to take the transaction value as the last purchase price, the price at which B sells to C that should be taken for the purpose of IGST computation only, not for assable value. Assable value will be always $10,000, but for computation of IGST, we will compare between the regular IGST versus IGST on transaction value. While doing that comparison, only the last purchase price should be taken, okay? That is with respect to this. So, we have got the clarity related to what are the various customs duties and how to compute each and everything. Then next, uh, we need to know, uh, sir, if B sold it to C at 8000, we will compare 10 and 8 or 11.5 and 8, 10 and 8, 10 and 8, 10 and 8, 10 will be, 10,000 will be for assable value, normal and 8,000 will be taken as transaction value, not 11.5, 10 and 8, the price at which? The last purchase price at which C has purchased that, okay. Next, section 8, emergency power to impose or enhance export duties. Central government is empowered to impose or enhance the export duties and what are the conditions to be satisfied. So, the goods may or may not be specified in second schedule. The government is satisfied that the circumstance exists which render it necessary for imposition or enhancement of export duties. This is about section 8 of Customs Tariff Act, emergency power to impose or enhance export duties. Same way, emergency power to impose or enhance import duties. So, they have power to impose or enhance import duties. Which goods? Goods specified in first schedule and the government is satisfied that circumstances exist, which renders it necessary for enhancement of import duties. Okay. Then, safeguard duty or safeguard measures that are given in section 8b. Safeguard duty or safeguard measures that are given in section 8b. Have a look into this additional customs duties on import. So, this is a comparative chart. So, we have total four additional customs duties, protective duty, safeguard duty, anti-subsidy uh, duty, this countervailing duty is known as, this countervailing duty is known as anti-subsidy, anti-subsidy duty. This countervailing duty is known as anti-subsidy duty, then anti-dumping duty. So, the section reference, we have section 6 for protective duties, 8B for safeguard duty, 9 for countervailing duty and anti-dumping duty, 9A. Who will be levying protective duty? Protective duty is levied by central government based on the recommendations of the Tariff Commission of India. But who will levy safeguard duty, countervailing duty and anti-dumping duty? That, that will be levied by central government based on the complaint or information received from the, from which domestic industry. So, upon receipt of complaint or information from domestic industry, they will be deciding for levy of these three. And protective duty is not actually a separate duty. So, enhancement of the regular basic custom duty, already some basic custom duty will be there now. So, that enhancement is known as protective duty, but safeguard duty, countervailing duty and anti-dumping duty. So, will be coming under, so not able to view screen. Uh, uh, everyone same issue, not able to view the screen, what is there in the screen you are not able to see. Visible, okay, then check pa. So, maybe you have to just sign log out, log in, I do not know, just see that. Fine, so relief to domestic industry, protective duty is not a new duty, it is 
an enhancement to the basic customs duty whereas safeguard duty countervailing duty and anti dumping duty is additional customs duties means separately it will be a line item in the computation of customs duty so where protective duty will come protective duty will come here that is whatever is the regular basic customs duty for that basic customs duty an enhancement is known as protective duty protective duty is an enhancement of basic customs duty so it is not something separate whereas this anti subsidy duty anti dumping duty and safeguard duty is a separate line item in the computation of customs duty how the relief will be given why protective duties are applicable to give the relief to the domestic industry against imports to protect the interest of domestic industry against imports so they will be levying protective duty whereas safeguard duty to protect the industry when the domestic industry when there is serious injury to the domestic industry on account of imports in large quantities because of imports in large quantities so when the industry is, domestic industry is getting affected they will be levying safeguard duty whereas whenever a product enjoys subsidy for example china government will be giving subsidy to a manufacturer in china when they are exporting the product to india thereby the product will be imported to india at a lesser price because exporting country gives a subsidy so then to avoid that reduction in price here in india to import it at a cheaper price so then lot of domestic manufacturers gets affected na so for that reason they will be levying anti subsidy duty serious injury on account of subsidy enjoyed in export pricing whereas anti dumping duty is whenever the manufacturer outside india will be selling to india at a price less than their selling price why they will do that because they will be achieving the economies of large scale production the fixed cost will remain the same so suppose if the contribution is positive they will be selling those goods okay so then in that case serious injury on account of import of goods at a cheaper rate so for these reasons this additional customs duties are applicable so why safeguard duty when goods are imported in large quantities there is serious injury to domestic industry so they will levy safeguard duty when the imported product enjoys the export subsidy then also the product is imported at a lesser price so because of that there will be serious injury or the goods will be imported at a cheaper price from the manufacturer then also there will be serious injury to the domestic manufacturer then there will be anti dumping duty what is the extent of relief so in case of safeguard duty to prevent the remedy to prevent the remedy so therefore it will be usually a percentage of assable value or landed value so that we have already discussed that you know usually this safeguard duty will be a percentage that will be given in the question computed on what either assable value or landed value landed value means what we know whereas this uh, anti subsidy duty is also the same way a percentage of assable value or landed value but in case of anti dumping duty it will be lower of injury margin or dumping margin dumping margin we should see from whose perspective exporters perspective the price at which the exporter is selling in his country minus the price at which he is exporting to india so that difference will be taken as the dumping margin whereas injury margin is from domestic industry importer perspective the price at which the pr product is sold in india minus landed value of the imported goods for example if the product is sold in exporters country for 100 dollars but they are exporting to india at 50 dollars so that 50 rupees will be called as the dumping margin whereas so in india the product is being imported and is uh, imported for say for example 75 dollars and the selling price in india is 110 dollars so then the difference between 110 and 75 the difference is there na that will be taken as the injury margin okay so therefore dumping margin or injury margin whichever is lower will be taken as the anti dumping duty now so investigation as protective duty is based on the recommendations of tariff commission there is no need of any investigation done by the department so customs department will not be doing any investigation so it will be levied but in case of safeguard duty countervailing duty and anti dumping duty as this is based on receipt of complaint or information an investigation will be carried out and thereafter they will decide 
as to levy of this uh, duty and for that purpose so provisionally they can levy safeguard duty anti subsidy duty or anti dumping duty what is the provisional period for which it will be levied it will be levied provisionally safeguard duty for a period of 200 days and anti dumping duty for a period of 6 months anti subsidy duty for a period of 4 months so 200 days in case of safeguard duty 4 months in case of anti subsidy duty 6 months in case of anti dumping duty that is the provisional period for which they will be living till the time they give a final notification and upon final notification what will happen suppose if they reduce it from provisional to final then the extra amount collected will be refunded suppose if they enhance the additional amount will be collected so differential duty payable or refund allowed with respect to excess amount what is the duration of levy so this uh, safeguard duty will be levied for a period of four years and it can be extended for a period of six years but in no case it can go beyond 10 years that is the maximum time but in case of an anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty five years and it can be extended for a further period of five years and further five years further five years further five years means there is no limit time so unlimited time it can be extended which one anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty but safeguard duty 4 plus 6 10 years only and every 5 years anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty for every 5 years they will be doing a review what if they could not extend there is an automatic extension for 1 year that is an amendment automatic extension for 1 year if not decided whether to extend or not so then there is an automatic extension for 1 year which means 5 years over still they have not decided whether to you no know, cancel this notification or to extend this notification now automatically there will be one year within that one year they need to decide what if in that one year also they have not decided then the notification will be invalid if it is not extended okay that is this then suppose sir in this uh, dumping margin i don't know what is the price at which exporter is selling to you know that is normal selling price in his country what if it is not known then that exporter will be selling to a third country na take that price so if not sold in exporters country then sale price to third country will be taken or cost of production plus usual profit margin will be taken got it suppose in dumping margin the normal selling price in exporters country minus export price to india what if we don't have normal selling price in exporters country the price at which that exporter sells to a third country or the usual uh, cost of production plus profit margin will be taken as the normal selling price minus export price we will be arriving that is this then next uh, non applicability or exemption in case of uh, this three the, which three safeguard duty anti dumping duty and anti subsidy duty not applicable in case of imports by 100% EOI or a unit in ACZ. However, if it is clear to DTA, if it is clear to DTA, so then it will be applicable. Retrospective levy, safeguard duty cannot be levied retrospectively, but the other two can be levied retrospectively within 90 days prior. So today they can give a notification for levying this anti subsidy duty and anti dumping duty retrospectively, so within 90 days prior. Okay. Then there is two concepts circumvention of anti subsidy duty and anti dumping duty what is that if you try to escape from payment of anti dumping duty or anti subsidy duty by changing the description or name of the article or importing the article in unassembled or disassembled form or changing the country of origin suppose if you are importing from china only there is an issue you will change the country of origin to australia or you will be importing it in unassembled form or disassembled form or you will be changing the name or description or any way you try to escape from payment of anti-dumping duty or anti-subsidy duty then that notification whatever they have given can be extended to that article which you have changed the name so for the change in name also they can extend the notification for unassembled or disassembled also they can extend the notification for that another country of origin also they can extend the notification it may extend the central government may extend the ASD or ADD to such, to such other articles also then absorption of anti subsidy duty anti dumping duty what is this absorption say for example there is a product which is exported from China 
so what the china government is doing so china and india what china government is doing they are giving a subsidy to the exporter okay so that is normal selling price normal selling price normal selling price is say for example 100 dollars and what china government did they gave a subsidy if the product is exported to india so they gave a subsidy of 30 dollars so because of which what is the selling price to india so export price to india export price to india export price to india is say that is 70 dollars okay now this product will be coming to india so from ex china to india when it is coming there will be some freight and insurance na freight insurance that is assable value landed value if you see the landed value the landed value will be say 90 dollars the landed value will be 90 dollars and what is the selling price in india what is the selling price in india this product's normal selling price in india if you take the normal selling price in india is 120 dollars normal selling price in india okay normal selling price in india is 120 dollars so therefore they are levying this anti subsidy duty or anti dumping duty what is that anti subsidy duty so levied will be anti subsidy duty levied will be so 90 and 120 so therefore 90 to 120 to inflate the price so for ex already 90 dollars was there so they have added some extra amount so that the price will be equal not necessary the amount of subsidy they are increasing to make it equal so therefore 30 dollars normal selling price 120 dollars so 90 so the anti subsidy duty levied is 30 so that it will be import price will be equal to the normal selling price in india so therefore asd levied is 30 dollars now what china is doing so they are giving a further subsidy they are giving a further subsidy now okay already they gave a subsidy of 30 dollars huh? now further subsidy further subsidy they gave further subsidy further subsidy they gave to the extent of say 10 dollars why so that the import price should be cheaper so that the import price should be cheaper so then what happened to the export price to india export price to india export price to india is 60 dollars and landed value landed value is say 80 dollars now what they are doing further asd further asd levied further asd levied what is that further asd levied 10 dollars so whatever subsidy that is given by the exporting country to that extent they can increase they can modify the notification by modifying by modifying notification issued okay so previously this benefit like this way it was not done so now they are doing this is known as absorption so therefore what is the revised asd revised anti-subsidy duty revised anti-subsidy duty already it was 30 dollars now it will be 10 dollars so therefore 40 dollars will be taken as the revised anti-subsidy duty so previously it was not there this is known as absorption of anti-dumping duty or anti-subsidy duty okay so that absorption is there where central government on such inquiry as it may consider necessary is of the opinion that absorption has taken place whereby the anti-dumping duty so imposed is rendered ineffective it may modify such duty to counter the effect of such absorption from such date not earlier than the date of initiation of the investigation what is the meaning of absorption it is said to have taken place if there is a decrease in the export price without any commensurate in change in the cost of production so there is a decrease in the export price without any change in the cost of production so purposively they are trying to reduce the price so then in that case there will be absorption so here also whatever is the regular duty that was levied they can enhance it 
to capture that okay and remember anti dumping duty and anti subsidy duty are mutually exclusive because you know both cases there will be you know both cases are because of the cheaper rate why the product comes at a cheaper rate because export country gives a subsidy in case of anti subsidy duty because exporter is selling at a cheaper price in case of anti dumping duty so therefore add anti dumping duty and asd anti subsidy duty are mutually exclusive or mutually exclusive anti dumping duty and anti subsidy duty are mutually exclusive got it that is with respect to this then next pa so so that you got the clarity with respect to this anti dumping duty anti subsidy duty and safeguard duty hope you understood this now let's see how a question is framed on that with reference to the customs tariff act discuss the validity of imposition of customs duties in the following cases both countervailing duty countervailing duty means anti subsidy duty and anti dumping duty have been imposed on an article to compensate for the same situation of dumping true or false no false why because if anti dumping duty is there anti subsidy duty will not be there okay both are mutually exclusive due to that reason countervailing duty that is anti subsidy duty has been levied on an article for the reason that the same is exempt from duty borne by an article when meant for consumption in the country of origin no so that is not subsidy subsidy means what sir the product is exempted so exempted from duty will not be called as anti subsidy duty really that exporting country should have given the subsidy then only it will be called as you know subsidy enjoyed on the product and there will be anti dumping duty so when they give the exemption that is common for all whether they are selling it to india or not selling it to india that product is exempted for that there won't be any anti subsidy duty then definitive anti dumping duty has been levied on articles imported from a member country of wto as determination has been made in a prescribed manner that import of such article into india threatens material injury to the indigenous industry so yes so that is definitive anti dumping duty imported from a member country only but otherwise it will not be there the statement is valid okay then next pa social welfare surcharge and all we discussed now when there won't be any safeguard duty actually that point we need to remember that is so whenever goods are imported by 100% eou there is no safeguard duty generally a product once a safeguard duty is attracted if you import that product there will be always safeguard duty however safeguard duty is not applicable in few cases what are those cases what are those cases if imports are made by 100% eou or if imports are made by scz or if the notification itself says that for import from a particular country so safeguard duty is not applicable or imports from a developing country does not exceed 3% of the total import of that article into india then also safeguard duty is not applicable or import from more than one developing country and imports from each developing country with less than 3% taken together does not exceed 9% okay then also there is no safeguard duty so we are importing only from one developing country now that developing country import does not exceed 3% less than or equals to 3% suppose if you are importing from more than one developing country imports from more than one developing country taken together for example we are importing from developing country developing countries developing countries so a b c d and e so 2% 1.8% 3.6% 3% 3 3 and 2.9% uh, 1.3% 2 like that now imports from more than one developing country correct and now you need to group import from developing country with less than 3% not equal to 3% with less than 3% so which country is a b okay so a b then e 
and F. Okay, taken together. What is this taken together? 2 plus 1.8 plus 2.9 plus 1.3. So, how much? 8. 8% 8 which does not exceed 9%. Therefore, safeguard duty, safeguard duty not applicable, not applicable on imports from on import from A, country A, B, E and F. However, safeguard duty applicable. However, however, it is applicable. However, it is applicable on import from import from C, comma D and developed countries developed countries. So, this exemption is given only for imports from developing countries, not from developed countries. Okay. So, that you need to remember pa, this point, these two points. Now, we will proceed to this uh, Q and A. Any doubts up to this pa? So, have a look into question number one. Yes. So, these are the questions from chapter number two of customs. I say study material questions. Look into this number one. With reference to section 9 AA of Customs Act, state briefly the provisions of refund of anti-dumping duty. That is, whenever we pay this anti-dumping duty, so in excess, so because there is a provisional anti-dumping duty, so under provisional anti-dumping duty, when we pay excess amount, we will be able to get the refund. Okay. So, therefore, it is subject to the provisions of unjust enrichment. What does it mean? Which means that we should, for example, we paid 20% as anti-dumping duty and we recovered that from our next person. Now, the provisional is 20, but the actual is only 12. So, that 8% we will not get as a refund if we recovered that money from the other person. That is known as a refund subject to unjust enrichment. So, refund of excess anti-dumping duty paid is subject to provisions of unjust enrichment okay so then suppose a government a person has paid any anti dumping duty on any article in excess of the actual margin of dumping he shall be entitled to refund of such excess duty okay so then the next question with reference to section 9a subsection 1a mention the ways that constitute circumvention of anti-dumping duty imposed on article which may warrant action by the central government. When it is called a circumvention of anti-dumping duty, if we alter the name or description or if we are importing it in unassembled or disassembled form or if we change the country of origin or in any other way when we try to circumvent the anti-dumping duty, the central government may extend the notification of anti-dumping duty even for such article for which we change the description or we change the country of origin or imported in unassembled or disassembled form. So, you have altered the description or name or in assembled, unassembled or disassembled or changing the country of origin or in any other manner then central government, okay. So, what they can do? So, they can investigate and ensure that the anti-dumping duty are levied on these articles also. Okay, That is about this. Then question number 3. When shall the safeguard measures under 8B be not imposed? Not imposed. Okay, Discuss briefly. Total 5 situations. Number 1. If 
the goods are imported by a 100% EOU or unit in SCZ, okay. And uh, suppose if they import it to EOU or SCZ and carry it to DTA, then there will be safeguard duty. But import by 100% EOU or SCZ, no safeguard duty. And specifically, if it is mentioned in the notification itself that the safeguard duty is not applicable, then also there is no safeguard duty. Then import from a developing country does not exceed 3% of the total import of that article into India or imports from more than one developing country. So when this 3% will be applicable, import from a developing country, only one developing country. If we are importing from more than one developing country and imports from developing country with less than 3%, less than 3%, less than 3%, taken together does not exceed 9%. So then also there is no safeguard duty, okay. Then question number 4, what are the conditions required to be fulfilled by importer to make the imported goods eligible for a preferential rate of duty prescribed by the central government by notification under section 25? There are two types of customs duties in basic customs duty, standard rate of customs duty and preferential rate of customs duty. Whenever we are importing goods from the countries with which India is having trade agreements, then the preferential rate of duty will be applicable. But for that, the condition should be fulfilled. Number one, the importer at the time of importation should make a specific claim for the preferential rates. And he should also claim that the goods are produced or manufactured in such preferential area and that area has been notified under the Customs Tariff Act as preferential area and the origin of goods shall be determined in accordance with the rules. A country of origin certificate should be produced, okay. So then in that case, so they will be eligible for the preferential rate. So how to determine the origin? So if the goods are unmanufactured, it should be grown or produced in that area. If it is fully manufactured in that country, it should be manufactured from material produced or with unmanufactured materials from that country. If it is partially manufactured in that country, final process should be completed in that country. Then only the goods country of origin will be applicable. So if you are importing it in unmanufactured form, it should be grown or cultivated or produced there. Suppose if you are purchasing the goods which are fully manufactured there, even the raw material should be produced or grown out of there. And suppose if it is partially manufactured in other country and partially manufactured in that preferential country, the final process should have been complete in that preferential country. So then only this uh, preferential rate will be applicable. Okay. Then next. Question number 5, write a short note on emergency power to impose or enhance import duties under section 8A of Customs Tariff Act. So central government so has power to enhance or levy, so the impose or enhance you know customs duties on import but whenever they are enhancing they need to enhance the goods which are covered under first schedule and it is necessary that they wanted to do so, okay. So then they can increase this. So section 8A provides that where central government is satisfied that the basic customs duty should be increased and the circumstances exist which will render it necessary to take action. It may by notification amend the first schedule because first schedule contains imports. So to increase the import duty or to levy the import duty to such extent as it thinks necessary, okay. Then question number 6, determine the customs duty payable under Customs Tariff Act 1975 including the safeguard duty of 30% under section 8B of the said act with the following details available on hand. So safeguard duty is usually a percentage but that percentage is computed on what? That percentage is computed on assable value or landed value. Now what is the landed value? Assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge. So check the question whether it is given anywhere that it should be levied on assable value or landed value like that. So determine the customs duty payable including the safeguard duty of 30% under section 8B. Nowhere they have given that on what it will be levied means I told you that we need to take it on the assessable value. So when the, in the absence of information, we need to take assable value. What is assable value? 30 lakhs. So on 30 lakhs, we need to compute 30%. So that will be 9 lakhs. So first assable value 30 lakhs. 
basic customs duty 10%. So therefore, 30 lakhs into 10%, 3 lakhs. And social welfare surcharge, 30,000, 3 lakh 30,000. Now we need to do uh, this safeguard duty, that is 9 lakhs. 9 lakhs will be safeguard duty, should be computed on assable value. Then while computing IGST, 3 lakh 30,000 plus 9 lakhs, so that is, you know, 12 lakh 30,000 plus assable value 30 lakhs. So therefore, on that we will compute. So 30 lakhs plus 3 lakh 30,000 plus 9 lakhs. On that we need to compute IGST, 42 lakh 30, we need to compute IGST 12 percent, that is 5 lakh 7600. So you can see that 30 lakhs, 3 lakhs will be basic customs duty, social welfare surcharge 30,000, safeguard duty will be 9,000, so integrated tax 5 lakh 7600 and this is the total customs duty payable, okay. And when there will be no safeguard duty, if we are importing from a developing country, so, imported from a developing country, imported from a developing country, but see the percentage. So, share of import of sodium nitrate from developing country against total import of sodium nitrate to India is 4. So, we will not get any relaxation. When we will get relaxation or exemption from safeguard duty, if imports from a developing country does not exceed 3% of the total import of that article into India, then there won't be any safeguard duty on that article, okay. But here safeguard duty is applicable. Then question number 7. Differentiate between protective duty and safeguard duty. Protective duty is levied by central government on the recommendations of tariff commission. But safeguard duty levied by central government based on investigation. Protective duty is enhancement of basic customs duty. But safeguard duty is an additional duty that will be levied. And investigation not required in case of protective duty. Investigation required in case of safeguard duty. There is no provisional protective duty, but there is provisional safeguard duty for a period of 200 days. And then there is protective duty applicable in all cases once levied, but safeguard duty not applicable in few cases. So that is imports from imports by 100% EOI or SCZ like that. So the differentiation between protective duty and safeguard duty we need to write. Okay. Then period. There is no period for protective duty. But in case of safeguard duty, six, four years, it can be extended for a further period of six years. Okay, these are the differentiating points. Briefly explain, examine the nature and significance of levy of anti-dumping duty under customs tariff act. It's a theory question. We need to write completely about anti-dumping duty. When there will be anti-dumping duty as per section 9A and how much is the anti-dumping duty. When anti-dumping duty is not applicable like the theoretical part we need to write. Then... Chain top industries has challenged the imposition of anti-dumping duty retrospectively on the grounds that it is unconstitutional. Explain whether it would succeed in its contention. No. Anti-dumping duty and countervailing duty that is anti-subsidy duty under section 9 can be levied retrospectively within 90 days prior. So today they can give a notification for a retrospective levy within 90 days prior they can do that. Okay. That is valid. So, retrospective effect they can do. So, within a period of 90 days, 90 days from the date of notification. Okay. Then, next uh, question number 10 Determine the total duties payable under Customs Act if Mr. Rao imported rubber from Malaysia at a landed price of 25 lakhs. It has been notified by central government that share of imports of rubber from developing country against total imports to India exceeds 5%. Safeguard duty on this product is 30%, IGST 12%, BCD 10%, ignore agriculture infrastructure developments. First, what will be taken as the value? 25 lakhs. 25 lakhs will be taken as the value. Basic customs duty will be, so 12% or 10%. So therefore, we will be taking 25 lakhs basic customs duty 2 lakh 50 thousand and social welfare surcharge 10 percent of 2 lakh 50 25 and what is the safeguard duty 30 percent again they did not give anything means it will be computed on assable value what is assable value 25 lakhs 25 lakhs into 13 percent 7 lakh 50 thousand okay and while computing integrated tax we need to take basic custom duty social welfare surcharge and safeguard duty on that we need to compute integrated tax that is 4,23,000, 4,23,000 plus 
So, 14,48,000 will be taken as the total customs duties payable. Then, question number 11, during the year 2021, the customs authorities have noticed that there is an increased quantity of product XYZ being imported into the country. Determine whether central government should consider levying safeguard duty or anti-dumping duty. When goods are being imported in large quantities and that causes serious injury to the domestic industry, then safeguard duty shall be levied under section 8B but not anti-dumping duty and enumerate any exemption. So, we have already discussed that question. Exemptions 100% EOU, SCZ, import from a developing country does not exceed 3%, more than one developing country. So, those five points. Also, central government may specifically mention in the notification about non-applicability of safeguard duty for import from a particular country like that. Okay. So, this is about safeguard duty related uh, provision. Valuation under customs. Okay. So, in this, we need to understand what should be taken as the value for the purpose of customs duty computation, assable value that is given in section 14. What does section 14 says? Section 14 says that the assable value will be transaction value. What is transaction value? Transaction value means price prevailing at the time and place of importation. In case of import, price prevailing at the time and place of exportation in case of export. Okay. So, in case of export goods, so what is transaction value? Price prevailing, price actually paid or payable when it is sold for export from India for the delivery at the time and place of exportation where the buyer and seller are not related and price is the sole consideration. Okay, Price actually paid or payable for delivery at the time and place of exportation will be taken. Same way, in case of imported goods, the price actually paid or payable when goods are sold for export to India, so prevailing at the time and place of importation that should be taken. So, that is the comparison here is between CIF value of export and FOB value, okay, CIF value in case of import and FOB value in case of export. Now, what is that CIF versus FOB we need to understand, okay, CIF versus FOB value, what is the difference? First, there is an exporter's factory, pa. exporter's factory. From exporter's factory, the goods will be coming to importer's, uh, exporter's port or airport, okay. So, exporter's port or airport, the goods will be coming. This is exporter's port or airport. Exporter's, exporter's port, exporter's port or airport, okay. So, it will be coming to this place. So, from exporter's factory to exporter's port or airport, the goods will be transported, okay. And thereafter, the goods will be transported. So, to importer's port or airport, to the importer's port or airport, so either by waterways or by airways, okay. Importer's, importer's port importer's port or airport, okay, importer's port or airport, either the goods are transported, either the goods are transported by vessel, okay, so either the goods are transported by vessel, assume that it is a vessel or the goods can be transported by way of an aircraft, okay, by way of an aircraft, the goods can be transported, this is aircraft, okay. We will assume that this is aircraft. The goods can be transported by aircraft. Okay. So now, so thereafter from importer's port or airport, so it will be taken to importer's factory. Importer's factory. Okay. Importer's factory. For this again, some transportation cost will be required. Okay. Now, what will be taken as FOB price? FOB price means the price prevailing at exporter's port or airport means if the goods are to be delivered at exporter's port or airport, whatever is the price that exporter is charging is known as FOB price. Okay. So, what is known as FOB price? 
the price prevailing at the exporter's port, that is FOB price, which means whenever FOB price is quoted, the goods will be handed over at the exporter's port. So, until that, exporter only will take care of everything. And what the CIF price means? CIF price means the price prevailing at the importer's port, which means who will bear the transportation cost and insurance cost from exporter's port to importer's port. What is the extra that we will have? Freight and insurance, okay? Freight plus insurance. This freight plus insurance, who will bear? The exporter will bear when he is charging CIF price, okay? Now, so what is the assable value in case of import? The CIF price will be taken as transaction value in case of import, okay? In case of import, what is the transaction value? CIF price. What will be taken as transaction value in case of export? In case of export, the transaction value will be taken as FOB price, okay? So, this you need to keep in mind. So, whenever we are taking export, the assable value will be nothing but FOB price. Whenever we are taking import, the assable value will be CIF price, okay? What is the connection between FOB price and CIF price? So, FOB price plus freight plus insurance equals to CIF price, okay? Now, C refers to what? Cost means FOB. I refers to insurance, F refers to freight, okay? So, therefore, we will take CIF price is the assable value in case of import. AV in case of import. What is assable value in case of import? CIF price. What is CIF price? FOB price plus, plus insurance, CIF. C for cost. Cost is FOB price plus insurance, insurance plus freight. Okay. This will be taken as CIF price. Now, there is something called as X factory price. What is the meaning of X factory price? X factory price means the price prevailing at the exporter's factory means from exporter's factory to exporter's port. So, there will be some charges which the importer should pay. What is that? Transportation charges from exporter's factory to the load airport or port and loading charges at the load airport or port. So, that will be taken as the extra money when the X factory price is given. Okay. So, that is known as X factory price. You can see all these terms which are given here. X factory price means what? FOB means what? CAF means what? What is this free alongside? Free alongside means, so export goods are delivered alongside the ship, ready for shipment. It includes X factory, local freight plus local taxes. Okay. So, then what is the difference? The loading charges will not be there. What it? So, here... So, transportation is there now. Thereafter, what is there? Loading. Thereafter, loading is there. Thereafter, loading. Okay. Loading charges. Thereafter, we have loading charges. So, this is known as transportation cost. Transportation charges. This transportation charges is for what? For bringing the goods from exporter's factory to exporter's port. Transportation charges then loading charges. Up to this transportation charges, if you cut, that is known as FAS price, free alongside price, okay. So, what is the difference between X factory to FOB price? X factory price plus transportation charges plus loading charges equals to FOB price. Then, F X factory price plus transportation charges will be FAS price. FAS price plus loading charges will be equals to FOB price, understood? So, FAS plus loading charges will be called as FOB price. Then CIF we already know, okay? So, these are the four prices that we have, understood or not? And at importer's factory gate also one price will be fixed, that is DDP, okay? So, DDP shipment, duty payment, okay, duty payment shipment. So, then everything exporter will take care, but that is not given in steady metal. So, no need to worry about that. These are the four prices which are given. So, in order to know the differences, I just gave you this. Then, 
So what should be taken as FOB uh, sub-L value? CIF price in case of import, CIF price which is FOB price plus you know insurance plus freight. Okay. Now what will be taken as insurance? If actuals are ascertainable, we will be taking actuals pa. So insurance first check whether actuals are ascertainable. So that is insurance is ascertainable. If insurance is ascertainable, we will be taking actuals. If insurance is not ascertainable, not ascertainable, then what we will do? We will be taking 20% of FOB. We will be taking 20% of FOB. Got it? Now, what will be the freight? Freight related provisions. So, freight, again we need to divide into two. Ascertainable, not ascertainable. Okay. Ascertainable, not ascertainable. If it is ascertainable, if it is ascertainable, again you divide it into two. Air freight or other freight. Okay. Air freight or other freight. Air freight or other freight. If it is air freight, we need to take actuals or 20% of FOB, whichever is lower. Why like that? Because the air freight will be usually huge. If that huge air freight is put into the value, then unnecessarily the value also gets inflated. That's why. So, we need to take actuals, actuals or 20% of FOB, whichever is lower should be taken. Whereas if it is other freight, ascertainable, take actuals, take actuals only. Whereas if the freight is not ascertainable, if the freight is not ascertainable, what we need to do? If the freight is not ascertainable, we need to take 20% of FOB as the freight. Okay. So this is the provisions that we need to remember. Now FOB price, can we take directly? No. So, whatever is the given price, whatever is the FOB price that is given, to that given FOB price, insurance will be, sorry, 1.125% of FOB. Insurance is 1.125% of FOB, sorry, not 20% of FOB, 1.125%, okay. So, FOB price given should be taken and then we need to make some adjustments. Where are these adjustments given? These adjustments are given in Rule 10, Rule 10 sub Rule 1 of Customs Valuation Rules 2007 is there that should be taken, okay. So whatever is the FOB price given plus adjustments in Rule 10 of uh, sub Rule 1 of Customs Valuation Rules. So then you will get the revised FOB, then you will get the revised FOB. So that revised FOB you need to take. And that revised FOB only we need to do 20%, 1.125%, etc. This 1.125%, 20% we compute. Nah, don't do it on the FOB that is given. You take it on the revised FOB. What is revised FOB? FOB price which is given plus adjustments in rule 10. So then you will get revised FOB. On that revised FOB, we need to compute the insurance and freight. Okay. So this is the methodology that we need to adopt. Now, what are the adjustments in Rule 10 sub Rule 1? We will come to that. So, I just told you what will be taken as the transaction value and then in second. Rule 10. Costs and services. What are the costs and services that should be taken? That is, we discussed this freight and insurance. But for this FOB price given, we need to make some adjustments. Now, what adjustments we need to make? So, for that they are telling. So, rule 10 sub rule 1, some adjustments to be made. The following to the extent they are incurred by the buyer, but not included in the price actually paid or payable. That is, Supplier liability made by the recipient. What is that supplier liability made by the recipient? Commission and brokerage except buying commission. Which means which commission to be included? Selling commission. Because buying commission is the expenditure of the importer. So, importer paying commission to his agent is known as buying commission. That will not be included. But to exporter's agent, to exporter's agent, if importer is paying any commission, that should be included. That is known as selling commission. 
then the cast of container which are treated as being one for customs purposes with the goods in the question so cost of container packing cost okay then the cost of packing so whether for labor or materials so what are the inclusions that we need to make as per rule 10 so that we are going to discuss okay what are the inclusions what are the inclusions what are the inclusions in the value what are the inclusions in the value so what will be taken as inclusions in the value number one pa that is uh, expenditure incurred by importer expenditure incurred by importer on behalf of expenditure incurred by importer on behalf of exporter on behalf of exporter so what are those expenditures so number one so which commission selling commission selling commission and next second container cost container cost then packing cost so these three are actually whose liability exporter liability but who is incurring importer is incurring so that should be included in the value that is one point first point then second the value as apportioned as appropriate that is any materials number two so importer is sending some materials or consumables or capital goods whatever it is so what importer is doing importer is sending something to the exporter exporter okay so on free of cost basis free of cost basis it is sent now what exporter is doing using that he is making so using that he is making finished goods he is making finished goods and these finished goods are sent back to the importer okay are sent back to the importer so what is that which are sent by the importer to the exporter either he may send materials he may send materials raw materials or he may send consumables consumables okay see that either materials okay or any consumables materials consumed in the production okay or tools dies molds okay tools comma molds and dies molds and dies then or he can also send engineering development work artwork design work undertaken elsewhere than in india so not in india design and engineering charges design and intangibles design and intangibles where where undertaken outside india not in india because if it is undertaken in india already there is gst on that so undertaken outside india undertaken outside india so these should be this free of cost which are sent by the importer to exporter na and using this using this so the finished goods are made and sent to the importer and in this finished goods so all these materials consumables tools molds and dies included in the value of finished goods included okay either actual or apportioned actual or apportioned apportioned means so based on depreciation because it's molds and dies and all based on depreciation or amortization it will be included okay that is that second point pa b point then c point royalties license fees related to imported goods that the buyer is required to pay directly or indirectly as a condition of sale of the goods being valued to the extent such royalties are not included in the price okay so what is that royalties and license fees payable as a condition of sale okay royalties royalties and license fee royalties and license fee which is payable then the value of any part of the proceeds of any subsequent resale disposal that accrues directly or indirectly to the seller so it's simple so that is any other amounts all other payments so other amounts 
other amounts other amounts payable by payable by importer to exporter payable by importer to exporter importer to exporter when is it payable so before import or after import before import or after import you check suppose if it is before import so definitely includable included okay to be included suppose if it is after import whether it will be included if it is after import see what is the wording that is used all other payments actually made or to be made as a condition of sale of imported goods uh, okay to the extent such payments are not included in the price so after import also included when if it is as a condition of sale not as a condition of sale example installation is condition of sale so then it will be included so because as a condition even though the goods are delivered thereafter you need to pay the installation charges so it should be included not as a condition of sale customization charges not as a condition of sale customization charges so not to be included not to be included so these are the four inclusions that we need to remember so these are the four inclusions that we need to remember expenditure incurred by importer on behalf of exporter these three expenses and importer is sending something which is used by the exporter in manufacture of finished goods and sending it back so that cost should be included either on actual or apportion royalties and license fees any other amount payable by importer to exporter before import or after import but as a condition of sale okay so this is what then sub rule 2 already we discussed what should be taken as freight and insurance so actual ascertainable actual not ascertainable what we need to do etc so all those are given here okay now this is about so the valuation in case of import transaction value in case of import we need to make these adjustments to arrive at the caf price on that caf price we will compute the customs duty payable okay okay we'll start pa say this so we completed the computation of value assable value what are the changes inclusions etc and all now actually whenever we refer to section 14 we need to refer to customs valuation rules 2007 as per customs valuation rules 2007 rule 3 so is very very important so rule 3 and rule 10 so section once the moment we see transaction value three things we need to refer section 14 rule 3 of customs valuation rules and rule 10 of customs valuation rules what does rule 3 says so you can see here rule 3 says subject to rule 12 the value of imported goods shall be transaction value adjusted in accordance with the provisions of rule 10 correct then the value of imported goods under rule 1 sub rule 1 shall be accepted if there are no restrictions so imported goods are unrestricted no restrictions placed by the exporter or the sale or price is not subject to some condition or consideration so it should be unrestricted sale it should be unconditional sale and no part of the proceeds of any subsequent resale or use of the goods by the buyer will accrue directly or indirectly to the seller and the buyer and seller are not related okay and price must be the sole consideration that's what no part of the proceeds are made payable apart from price means what so price is the sole consideration if these conditions are satisfied then transaction value will be taken so what is that assable value equals to transaction value okay so av what is the assable value in case of import assable value in case of import equals to transaction value transaction value so plus we will make some adjustments as per rule 10 adjustments adjustments as per rule 10 okay that will be taken pa adjustments as per rule 10 assable value in case of import is transaction value plus adjustments as per rule 10 now provided provided few conditions are fulfilled what is that provided number 1 it is unrestricted unrestricted sale unrestricted imports unrestricted imports means what exporter is not placing any restriction 
Number two, unconditional imports. Unconditional imports means exporter is not placing any conditions. Number three, price must be sole consideration. Price must be sole consideration. Okay. Then next, supplier and recipient that is importer and exporter are not related. Importer and exporter. Importer and exporter are not related. Okay. If these conditions are satisfied, then only we will take transaction value, assable value as the transaction value. Okay. Then, suppose if they are related or the price is not sole consideration, etc., then we need to determine the value as per rules. Okay. And even the value, value declared by the importer may also be rejected by the proper officer. Okay. So, one more condition is also there. Value declared is not rejected. Value declared by importer. Value declared by importer. Not rejected by. Not rejected by customs officer. Customs officer. On the grounds of comparable imports. On the grounds of comparable comparable imports okay so then only we will be taking transaction value so what are the five conditions it should be unrestricted imports unconditional imports price must be the sole consideration exporter and importer are not related and value declared by the importer not rejected by the customs officer on the grounds of comparable imports if all these conditions are satisfied then only assable value equals to transaction value where is it given this is given in rule 3 Suppose, if this is not satisfied, what we will do? We will take rule 4, rule 5, rule 6 like that. Okay. What does rule 4 say? Rule 4 talks about identical goods. We will take the value of identical goods. And rule 5 talks about similar goods. Okay. Rule 5 talks about similar goods. And then rule 7. Rule 7 comes, which says, computed value okay computed value uh, sorry deductive value deductive value rule 7 is talking about deductive value you can see identical goods similar goods uh, deductive value deductive value then rule 8 computed value rule 8 computed value and rule 9 is residual value. Residual value. You need to remember TIS DCR. What is that? Transaction value. If transaction value fails, identical goods. If that also fails, similar. Then deductive value, computer value, residual value. Okay. So, this is what the order in which you need to apply. However, this D and C are interchangeable. This D and C are interchangeable. So, means what? So, we can use as per rule 6, as per rule 6, okay, interchangeable. Means we can apply computed value first and then deductive value or deductive value first and then computed value. Interchangeable, okay. So, as per rule 6, it is interchangeable. Either we can apply deductive value first and then uh, computed value or computed value first and then deductive value. Got it? So, this is what we need to do. First, identical goods. What does it say? Identical goods means imported goods that also imported goods and that imported goods at or about the same time. At or about the same time and what is the meaning of identical goods? First, we need to understand. So, identical goods means so, that is also imported goods. In uh, rule 2, it is given identical goods means, so that is also imported goods having the same physical features and characteristics produced in the same country, produced by the same person, but this is preferably. If it is produced by any other different person also, it can be taken. Okay. So, we are taking rule for identical goods. What does identical goods say? identical goods identical goods which is given in rule 4 okay 
rule 4. So, it says identical goods means those identical goods are also imported goods. Those identical goods are also imported goods and they are having same physical features, same physical features and characteristics, same physical features and characteristics, okay. And it is from the same country of production, same country of production and it is by the same producer, same producer, but the same producer is, is compulsory, no, preferably, preferably same producer, but even otherwise it is okay. For example, you are importing a washing machine, top load washing machine, another top load washing machine imported and having the same physical features and you are importing from Korea, that should also be imported from Korea. You are importing Samsung and the comparable one is LG, it will be taken okay. That will be considered as identical goods. And these identical goods we need to take and then we need to make adjustments. We need to make adjustments. What are the adjustments which we need to make to this? What are the adjustments that we need to make? For example, uh, quantity adjustments. So, quantity difference in quantity difference in quantity means what if we are importing 1000 units but someone that is a, that comparable is importing 2000 units had we import 2000 units what should be taken that price we need to take that is difference in quantity number two so difference in quantity then difference in you know freight difference in transportation cost difference in transportation cost that is we are importing it to Chennai the comparable one is imported to Gujarat if it is imported to Chennai what would be the extra freight the difference in transportation cost we need to make and third point difference in commercial level difference in commercial level what is this difference in commercial level means we are importing from manufacturer the comparable one is imported from a wholesaler. If he imports from manufacturer, what is the price? That adjustment we need to make, okay. After making these adjustments, so if we get more than one price, more than one price, more than one price, so which one should be taken? So consider, consider lowest one okay consider lowest one understood or not if you get more than one price consider the lowest one so that is what we need to remember here and then at what time at or about the same time so these imported goods having same physical features same country same producer preferably at or about the same time at or about the same time so, this is the rule 4, okay, identical goods point. So, that's how we need to determine and that is given here rule 4, adjustments, what are the adjustments to be made here and related to this, there is one question we will see. So, have a look into, So, in illustrations it is there. Yes. So, a consignment of 800 metric tons of edible oil of Malaysian origin was imported by a charitable organization in India for free distribution to below poverty line citizens in a backward area under the scheme designed by food and agricultural organization. This being a special transaction, a nominal price of US dollar 10 per metric ton was charged for the consignment to cover the freight and insurance charges. The customs out found that at or about the time of import of this consignment, so there were following imports. As this is imported at a lesser rate, 10 dollar per metric ton, so that is not considered by the customs. So, but there are some comparable imports. So, First, the comparable imports also, we are importing this 800 metric tons edible oil of Malaysian origin. The comparable also should be <coughs> import of edible oil of Malaysian origin. And what is that quantity? We have difference in quantities. So, now we will take all these as comparable. 
but this 20 and 100 are two less compared to 800 metric tons. So, we will take all these and out of this which is the lowest price 160, 160 should be taken. Okay. So, therefore, 160 will be taken <laughs> and multiplied on 800 metric tons. So, 800 into 160, 128,000 and then we will compute the customs duty payable like that. Okay. So, this is in case of identical goods. Then next one is similar goods. What is the difference between identical goods and similar goods? Everything is same. But only thing, in case of similar goods, it is commercially interchangeable. Commercially interchangeable means, so we can take the literally the same way. So here identical goods is there now. So I will copy paste. Similar goods also the same way. Okay, but little changes are there in case of similar goods. Now see this. So, similar goods as per rule 5. Similar goods as per rule 5. And that is also imported goods. But the same physical features and characteristics will not be there for similar goods. But commercially interchangeable commercially interchangeable commercially interchangeable means what suppose we are importing a top load washing machine a front load washing machine will be similar not identical similar comparable but we need to make adjustment with reference to difference in engineering work difference in engineering work should be taken and if there is more than one price, consider the lowest one. Everything is same. This is about similar goods. Okay. Then rule 6 says, <coughs> rule 6 says, <coughs> if we are unable to determine the value as per rule 4 or rule 5, then as per rule 6, it says either we can apply rule 7 or rule 8. Whichever we want, we can apply it first. <coughs> rule 7, deductive value says, so first we need to take the price. Okay, rule 7 we are discussing. So, deductive value. What does deductive value says? First take the price in India. Deductive value. So, what should be taken in case of deductive value rule 7? So, we need to take price at greatest aggregate quantity. So, we need to take the selling price in India at greatest aggregate quantity. Price at greatest aggregate quantity. What is the meaning of greatest aggregate quantity? Greatest aggregate quantity means, so at the highest quantity level, whatever is the price that should be taken. Price at greatest aggregate quantity after the first level of importation after the first level of importation after the first level of importation okay so what is this after the first level of importation means so not the retail price the importer will be selling it now that price should be taken after the first level of importation that we will take and for this price we will be reducing all post importation expenses because we are taking after import now. So, all post importation expenses, post import expenses. So, like local agents commission etc and all that is whatever payments that are made after import. Then minus customs duty at the time of import, customs duty on import. So, now after reducing these two, you will be getting some value that will be taken as deductive value, that will be taken as deductive value or a subal value under rule 7, okay. That is about deductive value, you can see here. So, we need to reduce commission paid or to be paid or the additions usually made for profits and general expenses of imported goods. Then usual cost and transportation and insurance associated within India. Then customs duties and other taxes payable in India. All these should be excluded. So then we will get deductive value. Suppose 
immediately at or about the same time we don't have that is this is at or about the same time suppose if you don't have even some goods which were imported within 90 days prior and sold today that can also be taken so imported at the earliest day after importation but before the expiry of 90 days after such importation that should also be taken suppose if you do some processing if you do some processing then that processing cost should also be excluded if there is any processing cost post importation expenses including processing charges any processing cost is there further processing so that and all also should be excluded that is deductive value computed value says first you need to take cost of production okay that is simple computed value is simple computed value is as per rule 8 we need to take cost of production okay so for that cost of production cost of production we need to take cost of production and general expenses and usual profit margin general expenses and usual profit margin you need to add then you will be getting the price prevailing at the time and place of exportation and add costs that is freight and insurance okay so freight and insurance freight and insurance from where to where from exporters port to importers port freight and insurance so if you add then you will be getting so the computed value okay so this is when deductive value you cannot apply you can go for computed value or first you can go for computed value itself if nothing is available then residual method the value will be determined by the customs officer that's it pa. okay so these are the rules that we have in case of import now look into this illustration answer the following with reference to the provisions of section 14 of customs act what shall be the value if there is a price rise of the imported goods in the international market between the actual date of contract and the actual date of importation between the date of contract and the date of importation but the importer pays the contract price which should be taken as the assemble value that is contract price should be taken or the market price should be taken come on respond contract price or market price the price actually paid or payable is what the price actually paid or payable is what contract price so that contract price only should be taken the price actually paid or payable that is the meaning so therefore we need to take contract price suppose if the contract price is rejected by the officer then we will not take but otherwise contract price will be taken whether the payment for post importation process is includable in the value if the same is related to imported goods and is a condition of sale of imported goods yes we need to include i told you example installation charges even though it is after import but it is as a condition of sale it should be included okay so even though it is after import but it is as a condition of sale it should be included in the value got it then so rule 11 talks about declaration by import uh, rejection of declared value all these things we have seen now these are some interpretative uh, notes for this not required but we will see in case of export what should be taken generally in case of export valuation in case of export so in case of export it is FOB value okay and and that FOB value should we make any adjustments no we don't have to make any adjustments just the FOB value should be taken but there also these conditions are there price must be sole consideration etc now look into this question Mother Mary Hospital and Research Center imported a machine from Delta Scientific Equipments Chicago for in-house research. The price of the machine was settled at US dollar 5000. The machine was shipped on 10th April. Meanwhile, the hospital authorities negotiated for a reduction in price. As a result, Delta Scientific Equipments agreed to reduce the price by 850 and sent revised the price of 4150 under a telex. The machine arrived in India on 18th April. The customs commissioner has decided to take the original price as the transaction value. Can we take that? No. The price prevailing at the time and place of importation. So, reduced price should be taken. Okay. Then, next, uh, sir, when we take this freight, should we include? So, transportation cost we are taking now. So, freight, freight. When we take this freight, should we include 
So transshipment cost and transit cost, no. Transit cost should be included, but transshipment cost should not be included. What is transit cost versus transshipment cost? See this, transit cost, transit cost versus transshipment cost, transshipment cost. So transit cost means you are coming into a port in India. Say first we arrived at Gujarat port. First we arrived at Surat port. First the goods have arrived at Surat port. Thereafter the goods are taken to Chennai port. Thereafter the goods are taken to Chennai port. So first a ship has arrived at the Surat port and thereafter the goods are that is ship A, ship A, okay. The same ship A is taking remaining goods to Chennai port, okay. So, the same ship A. So, in this ship A, so they have unloaded in Surat port, they have unloaded in Surat port some uh, thousand containers, thousand containers and so, total how many containers are there? 1500 containers are there in this ship A. Now, the same ship A transporting 500 containers and that 500 containers are unloaded in Chennai port. Okay. 500 containers is unloaded in Chennai port. Now, in this case, so suppose for bringing the goods to Surat port, the freight and insurance, the freight and insurance, the freight and insurance is say, so 20 lakhs, the freight and insurance is 20 lakhs. Here, the freight and insurance, the freight and insurance is 5 lakhs, okay. Now, what should be taken as the freight and insurance for Surat port? For Surat port, for this 1000 containers, what should be included as freight and insurance? Come on. Freight and insurance, how much should be included? Freight and insurance included. Freight and insurance included will be, so first for 20 lakhs, fully for 1500 containers. But here we are unloading only 1000 containers. So 20 lakhs divided by 1500 into 1000. So that proportionate will be included, okay. So 20 lakhs divided by 1500 into 1000 that will be so 13 lakh 33333 will be included okay whereas here what will be included as freight and insurance in chennai port for unloading that 500 units or 500 containers freight and insurance included will be freight and insurance included will be so 20 lakhs divided by 1500 into 1000 sorry into 500 into 500 how much it will be so 20 lakhs divided by 1500 into 500 that will be 6 lakh 66667 plus transit freight what is that transit one 5 lakhs so what will be taken as the value so 6 plus 5 11 lakhs 66,667 will be taken, okay. Whereas, if it is transshipment, as another ship is bringing, that freight and insurance will not be included, okay. So, transshipment cost will not be included. Only transit cost will be included, but transshipment cost will not be included. Is it clear, Pa? So, transshipment means what? One, one, uh, Ah, that is one port, one ship to another ship, okay. So, same one. So, let us take. So, same pa, no change. So, what happens is that, so the goods will be unloaded into another ship. So, then the same ship is not taking. So, now another ship is taking. Ship B is taking. This is known as transshipment. So, now 500 containers are unloaded. 
Now, what will be taken as the freight and insurance? So, 20 lakhs by 1500 into 500 only, but this transshipment will not be included. The transshipment freight will not be included, okay? Transshipment freight will not be included. So, 6,66,667 will be taken. Clear, pa? So, that is with respect to this transit freight and transshipment freight, freight. Not only this, that is, which one will be included in freight we have seen? Not only this, even light rate charges and barge charges. Light rate charges and barge charges means for bringing the goods from the ship to the shore. Those are extra charges payable that will also be included. You can see this. He has imported goods from Finland and due to deep drought at the port, such goods were not taken to the jetty in the port but were unloaded at the outer anchorage. The charges incurred for such unloading and transport of the goods from outer anchorage to the jetty in barges, that is small boats, were 1,35,000. A claims that such charges form part of loading and unloading charges and should be deemed to be included. Yes. So, this 1,35,000 should be included in the value. That is true. So, that is, ACE claims that such charges form part of loading and unloading and should be deemed to be included in the CF value. So, that is, one second, outer anchorage. So, say this, for the purpose of section 14, value of imported goods shall be value of such goods and include cost of transport, loading, unloading, handling associated with the delivery of imported goods to the place of importation. When big vessels cannot enter, the goods are brought to docks by smaller vessels. The cost incurred by the importer for bringing the goods to the landmass or place of consumption, such as barge charges, will also be included in the cost of transportation. Okay. But what A is telling, such charges form part of loading and unloading and should be deemed to be included. Already it is included. No, we need to add it again. So, we need to add it again. Separately, we need to add those charges. Okay. Then, next one. Customs valuation rules in case of export. So, in case of export, it is simple. We don't have much. So, that is, we need to generally take FOB value. And whenever we take FOB value, suppose if price is not the sole consideration or if buyer and seller are related, so or if it is rejected, then in that case, value will be determined as per rule 4. Rule 4 is like identical goods, uh, similar goods only and computed value method, residual value method. Okay. Okay. Say this. First, in this importation, exportation and transportation, we have the procedure for import and export. So, we need to first understand what are the various modes by which the goods can be imported. So, either the import can be by sea, that is through waterways, by vessel, we call it as by vessel, by airways, aircraft and by land, that is through vehicle and uh, post. So, then baggage, post includes courier also, post includes courier also, okay. And then baggage import and ship stores. So, these are the six procedures that we have. In that, so they have given first the procedure for import. So, you can see. So, different sections are there, but I am just giving you the basic procedure for the purpose of import. Okay. So, first what will happen? The import procedure will be revolving around. So, total four parties. So, there will be an exporter where outside India and there is an importer where in India, okay, and customs officer, customs officer. So, then shipping company, shipping company, shipping company, okay. So, now what will happen is that first this exporter will hand over the goods to the shipping company. When exporter hand over the goods to the shipping company, the shipping company will be giving so, one document of title to the goods, okay. So, that document of the title to the goods is known as airway bill or bill of lading like that depending. So, what I am doing is that I am taking the imports by vessel as the base and I am discussing, okay. So, therefore, what is the document? That document is known as bill of lading. So, after receiving this bill of lading, so then exporter will send that bill of lading to the importer. 
So because the importer should prove that he is the owner of the goods, not due to that reason. So therefore, this bill of lading is sent by the exporter to the importer, bill of lading. And next, what will happen? So the person in charge, so for the shipping company, there will be one person in charge. So who is that person in charge? So that person in charge will be captain of the ship or master of the vessel, okay, person in charge. And this person in charge will be filing one document with the customs officer. What is that document? That is import manifest. So that contains the details of the goods which are present in the vessel. So that import manifest will be submitted. Who will be submitting? The person in charge will be submitting that document. So import manifest with the customs officer. For submitting that import manifest, step number four, import manifest, import manifest. So after verifying that import manifest and if the goods are allowed to be imported, the customs officer will be giving grant of entry inwards. That is the step number five. Grant of entry inwards. Grant of entry inwards. So once a grant of entry inwards is given, the person in charge of the conveyance will be unloading the goods and these goods will be unloaded under the supervision of a proper officer. So that goods are unloaded under the control of a custodian. So there will be one custodian. So with that custodian's control, the goods will be delivered, okay, unloading of goods. So this unloading of goods will happen. So that is step number six, unloading of goods, unloading of goods. So now where the goods are with the custodian. Now with this, the person in charge role is over. Now what importer should do? Importer should be filing a bill of entry with the customs officer. So importer will be filing a bill of entry, step number seven, bill of entry. After filing bill of entry and upon payment of customs duty, the customs officer will be giving to the importer. So out of customs charge order, out of customs, out of customs order. So this out of customs order is for the purpose of taking the goods out of customs area, means he has paid the customs duty. Now importer should also get the delivery order from the person in charge. So what importer will be doing to the person in charge, he will be submitting the bill of lading. So with the person in charge, the importer will be submitting bill of lading. So this bill of lading when it is submitted to the person in charge, the person in charge will be giving a document called as, you know, delivery order, DO, delivery order. Delivery order will be given by the person in charge. Now, the importer should submit to the custodian two orders, okay. So what are those two orders? Delivery order and out of customs charge order. Delivery order when he is submitting, which means that, he is the owner of those goods, so to this person the goods should be given. And then out of customs charge order, out of customs order when he is submitting. So when he is submitting this out of customs order, which means that he has paid the customs duty. So thereafter, what custodian will do? Custodian will release the goods and that goods can be taken by the importer. Okay, that is the 12th step, release of goods, release of goods. So these are the 12 steps that are involved in case of import procedure, okay. Now, what happens in case of aircraft? So here, this point number two, point number two, bill of lading, and point number three, bill of lading, and point number seven, bill of, uh, sorry, point number nine, bill of lading. So this document will be called as airway bill in case of aircraft, airway bill in case of aircraft. And it will be called as, you know, uh, lorry receipt or railway receipt, lorry receipt, lorry receipt or railway receipt, railway receipt. In case of, in case of vehicle, it is called as lorry receipt or railway receipt. Which one? The second, third and ninth point. And then this import manifest is there now. That import manifest will be called as arrival manifest arrival manifest in case of aircraft. So this is the same procedure, but there is a difference, slight difference in the wording, naming, okay. So arrival manifest in case of aircraft and it is called as import report, import report in case of vehicle, okay. 
in case of vehicle it is called as import report so this is the change in case of aircraft and vehicle but otherwise everything will be same so this 12 steps that will be same this is the procedure for import the brief procedure for import now in this what we have there are some sections section 29 arrival of vessel and aircraft in india so which says that so the vessel or aircraft should be arriving only in the approved port or airport okay and so they need to that is whenever they are coming so to a approved port or airport suppose it any port or airport they can go provided on account of unavoidable reasons okay this is not applicable in case of so accident stress of weather or unavoidable cause they can land in any place but the person in charge has got some obligation what is that obligation they need to report the arrival or vessel of the aircraft to the nearest customs officer or officer in charge of the police station and should produce a log book okay and should not allow unloading of any goods without the permission and should not allow any passengers to leave the uh, leave that particular uh, vicinity of the vessel or aircraft however because of the safety reasons or because of the health reasons they can permit uh, unloading of the goods or because of the passengers health condition they can allow the passengers to leave okay and this is what section 29 says arrival of vessel and aircraft in india okay means what you need to remember in short form they need to come to the only particular airport or port which is called as a customs port or airport no other port or airport is permitted but any other port or airport is permitted provided it is on account of accident or stress of weather or any avoidable reason and the person in charge should uh, submit the information to the nearest customs officer or the police officer and submit the log book he should not allow any goods to be unloaded or passengers to leave the vicinity but in case of emergency situations they can do okay then section 30 says that every person in charge should be submitting the arrival manifest or departure uh, arrival manifest or import manifest or import report okay arrival manifest in case of aircraft import manifest in case of vessel and import report in case of vehicle and when they should submit it so they should submit it before the date of arrival but in case of the import report that can be submitted within 12 hours after its arrival okay so when the import manifest should be submitted import manifest should be submitted before the date of arrival okay so there are few sections which we are discussing section 29 what does it says arrival arrival only at customs port or airport okay customs port or airport then section 30 talks about time limit time limit of IM, AM, R, IR. What is the time limit? In case of import manifest, it should be submitted. Import manifest or arrival manifest should be submitted before arrival. Before arrival of the vessel or aircraft, that should be submitted. Whereas import report can be submitted within 12 hours. Within 12 hours after arrival, after arrival, that can be submitted. Okay. So which one? That import report. Okay. Then. So that is this. So arrival manifest in case of aircraft anytime before the arrival whereas uh, import manifest also anytime before arrival of the aircraft electronic filing whereas import report within 12 hours after arrival and for that manual filing. And suppose if any provision that is suppose if there is a belated filing then the penalty will be up to 50,000 rupees okay. So for belated filing for belated filing late filing belated filing so what is the penalty belated filing penalty up to 50000 belated fi filing penalty is up to 50000 that will be the late fee or penalty for late filing of this uh, import manifest arrival manifest or import report can this import manifest be uh, amended yes we can amend that import manifest suppose if any goods are loaded at a later point of time after originating so that amendment can be done that is up to this then section 38 talks about passenger and crew arrival manifest section 30a passenger passenger and crew arrival manifest arrival manifest means so whatever are the whomsoever are the passengers who are present in that vessel or aircraft their details should be submitted along with passenger name record information 
passenger name record information when it should be submitted they have not given any time limit so which means immediately after arrival they need to submit okay passenger name record information so this needs to be submitted by the person in charge and when it is to be submitted they have not given so that's why so before arrival in case of an aircraft or vessel and upon arrival in case of a vehicle so like that we need to take and suppose if there is any belated filing here also so there is a late fee of 50,000 rupees okay so in case of aircraft or vessel aircraft aircraft or vessel so when it should be submitted before arrival before arrival it should be submitted and in case of uh, vehicle when it should be submitted upon arrival upon arrival it should be submitted suppose if there is any late submission belated filing same penalty so belated filing penalty will be up to 50,000 belated filing penalty belated filing penalty will be up to 50,000 rupees so that is about section 30 a then imported goods not to be unloaded until entry inwards is granted okay but this entry inwards is only for the vessel so this is not given in case of so entry inwards shall not be given until the arrival manifest or import manifest has been delivered or proper officer is satisfied the valid reason is given for not delivering so usually without entry inwards the vessel cannot enter but aircraft or vehicle can enter but the goods cannot be unloaded so that is about this grant of entry inwards okay so section 31 talks about grant of entry inwards grant of entry inwards when this grant of entry inwards will be given who will be giving this grant of entry inwards by the customs officer when is this grant of entry inwards will be given whenever the import manifest or arrival manifest or import report is filed so this grant of entry inwards is given in case of vessel the grant of entry inwards is to enter but in case of aircraft or vehicle it is for the purpose of unloading of the goods that is this okay and then so entry inwards date is crucial for calculation of applicable rate of duty yes because the relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of vessel is date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inwards whichever is later now so due to that reason then section 32 says imported goods not to be unloaded unless mentioned in the arrival manifest okay so section 32 only those goods only those goods only those goods mentioned in which place mentioned in import manifest arrival manifest or import report should be unloaded any other goods should not be unloaded okay only those goods mentioned in this should be unloaded and other goods should not be unloaded but that is what section 32 says and then 33 loading and unloading of goods at approved places only okay so that is inside the customs port airport also there will be some approved place so in that approved place only the goods should be unloaded okay section 33 unloading of goods only at approved place unloading of goods only at approved place okay only at approved place so these actually these are all the points that we need to remember so even if you are not remembering the section it is okay but these points you need to remember that's why i'm just writing it okay then section 34 goods not to be loaded or unloaded except under the supervision of customs officer so this section 34 so section 34 says that unloading under the supervision unloading under supervision of proper officer under supervision of customs officer okay under the customs officer supervision only the unloading should happen suppose if the unloading is on holidays okay holidays are after office hours holidays holidays are after office hours so they need to pay some charges what is that charges merchant overtime charges mot charges so merchant overtime charges payable merchant overtime charges payable okay mot charges will be payable when suppose if the unloading is on holidays or after office hours they need to pay merchant overtime charges that is as per section 34 then section 35 so section 35 talks about boat notes boat notes means when imported goods are water bond that is what will happen from the ship to the shore the goods will be transported from the ship to the shore so this transportation of the goods from ship to the shore should accompany boat note okay boat note for for what purpose transportation of goods 
transportation of goods through boats through boats from where to where through boats from where to where so through boats from so transportation of goods through boats from which place to which place from ship to shore from ship to shore that will be done okay through this so that is with respect to this then section 35 and uh, so these are the procedures to be followed the section 29 to 35 these are the procedures to be followed by person in charge okay now what are the procedures to be followed by the importer so that is given here so in that section 45 it starts with section 45 that is restrictions on custody and removal of imported goods so whenever the goods are imported that will be under the control of a custodian and in case of pilferage that custodian is liable to pay customs duty that is about section 45 and uh, for example you can see here there is one query question measures Pipli imports imported certain goods which were unloaded in the customs area on 1st October. When the order for clearance was passed by the proper officer on 5th October, it was found that there was some pilferage of such goods. As imported goods were in the custody of the port trust, the department demanded duty from the custodian on such pilferage. The port trust denied such demand contending that it was not on approved custodian falling under section 45 and possession of goods by it was by virtue of powers conferred under major port trust. Hence, it is not liable to customs duty on pilfered goods. So, for this, so Bombay High Court in Board of Trustees case is telling that, so when the custodian is responsible for payment of customs duty in respect of pilfered goods, okay, so therefore, they are not required to pay the value of the goods. So, what happened is that, so customs department order for clearance was passed some pilferage as the imported goods were in custody okay so the department demanded duty from the custodian yes so whether there will be duty payable by the custodian yes they have to pay okay so but they cannot de demand it from the poor trust they cannot de demand it from the poor trust they have to demand it from the custodian of such goods so that is this uh, case that is given and filing of bill of entry so section 45 is what imported goods will be under the custody of a custodian that is section 45 imported goods imported goods unloaded unloaded under the custody of unloaded under the custody of the custody of a custodian a custodian then section 46 talks about bill of entry talks about bill of entry what is this bill of entry it is a document to be filed by the importer containing the details of the imported goods what is the value of it and what is the customs duty payable and this bill of entry is divided into three bill of entry for home consumption in case of clearance for home consumption bill of entry for warehousing for deposit of goods into the warehouse without payment of customs duty then ex bond bill of entry for clearance of goods from the warehouse upon payment of customs duty so that is what section 46 talks about and uh, bill of entry for home consumption for warehousing this is into bond for clearance of warehouse goods for home consumption that is ex bond these are the three bill of entries okay and this bill of entries you know uh, whenever it is filed so it contains the details of what the bill of entry shall ensure the following the accuracy and completeness of the information given the authenticity and validity of the document and the compliance and when importer is unable to file the bill of entry what will happen so then the customs officer can deposit the goods in a warehouse without payment of customs duty that is known as warehousing without warehousing okay warehousing without warehousing because this warehousing is not done by the importer but this warehousing is done by the customs officer so it will be called as warehousing without warehousing understood or not and then such goods okay such goods shall not be deemed to be warehouse goods for the purpose of the act accordingly warehousing provisions shall not apply to such goods then what is the time limit for filing so what is the time limit for bill of entry that is very very important the time limit for filing bill of entry is before the date of arrival previously the time limit is within one day after the date of arrival but now the time limit is before the date of arrival before the date of arrival will be taken as the time limit very very important okay so previously it was one day from the date of arrival but now this section got amended so this is amended 
So you need to refer to the amendments related to this for November 22 exam. So what is it they are telling? So within that is before the date, before the date of arrival we should be filing. Even if it is a holiday that is a time limit. Okay. So this is there and can we file it any time before? No. So latest by before the date of arrival. Okay. And within 30 days prior to the date of arrival within 30 days prior to the date of arrival prior to the date of arrival means suppose if the date of arrival if the date of arrival is 23rd march is the date of arrival 23rd march is the date of arrival now when the bill of entry should be filed so you take 30 days prior so what is the 30 days prior to this 30 days prior to this means so 23rd you don't count so before that before that so you'd count 22 days in the month of march and 8 days in the month of february so therefore on or after 21st february because in february 28 uh, days and in march 22 days so this is within 30 days prior okay this is within 30 days prior within 30 days prior to the date of arrival the boe can be filed okay boe should be filed during this time boe should be filed this time suppose if there is any delay if there is any delay okay so here a slight change we should not take 23rd so 22nd should be taken 22nd okay before the date of arrival 23rd march is the date of arrival so therefore 23rd march before the date of arrival is 22nd march so this is the time limit by which the bill of entry should be filed okay before the date of arrival suppose if there is any belated filing what is the late fee that is payable date of arrival date of arrival so late fee what is the late fee that will be payable for delay in filing bill of entry so late fee if the delay is up to three days if the delay is up to three days if the delay is beyond three days so up to three days up to three days and beyond three days okay up to three days the late fee will be 5000 rupees per day 5000 rupees per day whereas for the delay beyond three days it will be 10000 rupees per day subject to maximum subject to 100 percent of customs duty payable so what is the maximum late fee so maximum will be 100 percent of customs duty payable 100 percent of customs duty payable if it is exempted goods then 50,000 rupees that is a maximum late fee okay so what is the late fee for delay in filing bill of entry if it is up to three days then it will be 5,000 rupees per day if the delay is beyond three days 10,000 per day suppose if the delay is somewhere 10 days so for three days it is 5,000 per day 15,000 so remaining seven days seven days into 10,000 70,000 70,000 plus 15,000 will be 85,000 so therefore 85,000 will be taken as the late fee that will be payable subject to maximum 100 percent of the customs duty payable this is the late fee that is payable pa. okay then assessment of goods so here along with this section 46 they are also talking about self assessment provisional assessment etc so section 17 18 so that we will be seeing little later we will see that little later and continue to the other uh, questions other sections one second mm. clearance of goods so this assessment and audit is connected for the purpose of bill of entry that is a separate area so clearance of goods section 47 so these are the provisions related to bill of entry which you need to remember then section 47 so what does section 47 says so clearance of goods upon payment of customs duty so whenever we pay the customs duty we can clear those goods so section 47 clearance of goods clearance of goods upon payment of customs duty upon payment of customs duty so this customs duty we have two options pa what are the two options that is immediate payment option and deferred payment option we have what is immediate payment option immediate payment option means immediate payment option immediate payment option means so the date on which bill of entry is filed so on that date itself customs duty payable okay customs duty payable on boe date 
customs duty payable customs duty payable on boe date so whenever the bill of entry is filed okay so that date itself we need to pay customs duty or else what will happen otherwise interest at the rate of 15% per annum is payable otherwise otherwise interest at the rate of 15% per annum in GST, the rate of interest is 18% per annum. In customs, the rate of interest is 15% per annum. Otherwise, interest at the rate of 15% per annum is payable. Okay. For what? For the period of delay. For the period of delay, for the period of delay, we need to pay this interest. This is in case of immediate payment option. Whereas, another option is there. What is that? Another option, deferred payment option deferred payment option so in this deferred payment option what will happen is that so the imported goods need not be paid that is we can clear it we can pay the customs duty at frequent intervals what is that frequent intervals that is suppose if the bill is filed between 1st to 15th of a month boe filed boe filed between between 1st to 15th 1st to 15th of a month First to 15th of a month, we need to take 16th working day of that month. 16th working day, 16th working day of that month should be taken. 16th working day of that month should be taken. Suppose if the BOE is filed, if the BOE is filed between, BOE filed, BOE filed between 16th and end of that month, 16th to end of that month end of that month then we need to take next month first working day first working day of next month first working day of next month should be taken for the month of march <laughs> that is boe boe filed between between 16th march 16th march to 31st March. So, the due date will be 31st March itself. So, 31st March itself will be taken as the due date in this case. This is under deferred payment option. Suppose by this due date, if it is not paid, okay, by due date, if customs duty not paid, customs duty not paid by due date, customs duty not paid by due date, by due date, then what will happen? interest will be payable so what is that interest interest at the rate of 15 percent per annum for the period of delay for the period of delay we need to pay the interest so this is about deferred payment option to whom this deferred payment option is given this deferred payment option is not given for all but only to importer certified under authorized economic operator program or authorized public undertaking for these two people only they have given this deferred payment of import duty option okay so that is this then what is the time limit and all we have discussed deferred payment of import duty first to 15th 16th to 31st march so what is that we need to take okay and deferred payment not to apply in certain cases that is if there is a default in payment more than once in three consecutive months okay so deferred payment option not applicable when it is not applicable this deferred payment option will be not applicable if not applicable if if defaulted defaulted if not paid by due date if not paid by due date how many times how many times so more than once in three consecutive months by due date more than once more than once in three consecutive months three consecutive months if it is not paid then deferred payment option not applicable and to whom it is applicable this deferred payment option is applicable to whom so this deferred payment option is applicable to so aeo importer under aeo applicable to applicable to importers importers okay notified as notified as aeo authorized economic operator and authorized psu authorized 
PSU. So for them only this deferred payment option they are giving. Okay, and then mandatory electronic payment. What is that? Importers registered under authorized economic operator and any importer paying ten thousand rupees or more per bill of entry, not one lakh per ten thousand rupees or more per bill of entry, they need to make the e payment only. So therefore they cannot make the payment by cash. Okay, that is about this payment of customs duty, and then. So this faceless assessment concept is there. So that also we will see little later. So section 47 up to 47 we have discussed. So section 46 will talk about the bill of entry. Section 47 clearance of goods upon payment of customs duty and section 48. So section 48 talks about so disposal of goods. Disposal of goods if not cleared within 30 days. Okay disposal if goods not cleared within 30 days disposal of goods if not cleared if not cleared within what is the time limit ma within 30 days after unloading within 30 days after unloading if the goods are not cleared so that goods will be disposed of okay and so alternatively customs officer is having a option of keeping the goods in the warehouse also see this if any goods are not cleared within 30 days from the date of import unloading okay so then the goods imported goods may be disposed of or it may be kept it in the warehouse okay so that is what they are telling and for how many days it will be kept in the warehouse so that is what section 49 says that it can be kept in the warehouse for a period not exceeding 30 days and thereafter again so it will be reviewed for every 30 days at a time okay so that is the provision so section 49 says deposit of goods in warehouse by whom deposit of goods in warehouse deposit of goods in warehouse by customs officer and warehouse by customs officer for a period of for a period of 30 days at a time what is the meaning of 30 days at a time means so every 30 days they need to decide okay for example there is a date of arrival there is date of arrival date of arrival or date of unloading date of arrival date of arrival or date of unloading before the date of arrival or before the date of unloading boe should be filed boe should be filed before this date BOE should be filed. Suppose if the BOE is not filed, what will happen? So now within three days, within three working days, within three working days, within three working days, okay, within three working days, the goods should be removed, okay, by filing bill of entry. Within three working days, the bill of entry should be filed and it should be cleared, okay. BOE filed, BOE filed within three working days. So what are the consequences for these three working days? If the BOE is filed for these three working days, within these three working days, BOE is filed. What are the consequences? Whether any late fee is payable for delay in filing bill of entry? Yes, the late fee will be payable because there is a delay. So late fee is payable. And then whether any demurrage charges is payable, so demurrage charges because the goods are not cleared within the time. So demurrage charges payable. Demurrage charges will not be payable if you are clearing within three working days. If you are not clearing within three working days, then only the demurrage charges and all will come into the picture. So if you are making the clearances within this time, so we are not required to pay any demurrage charges. Then custodian charges. Whenever the goods are imported, that imported goods will be under the custodian, control of a custodian. So custodian charges, whether it is payable, yes, custodian charges will be payable, okay. Then what about warehousing charges? No, because the goods are not deposited in the warehouse. So therefore, warehousing charges, whether it is payable, no. Warehousing charges, warehousing charges are not payable. So just uh, we need to pay late fee for the three days and custodian charges and what is the time limit up to which it can be kept in the like uh, custodians control 30 days so this 30 days will be counted from the date of 
this 30 days will be counted from the date of arrival. So, therefore, the three working days also counted from the date of arrival and then 30 days also will be counted from the date of arrival. So, 30 days which means what is the time gap between this to this. So, this to this the time gap will be so 27 days here. Okay, 27 days, 27 days, but that cannot be taken because 3 working days. So, not necessary that everything will be working day. So, due to that reason, this time, this period, suppose if you are making any bill of entry, if the bill of entry is filed here, if the bill of entry is filed during this stage, BOE filed during this stage, then what is that we need to do? So, whether we need to pay late fee, no doubt we need to pay late fee. Demerit charges, yes. Why demerit charges are payable? Because the goods are not cleared within 3 working days. So, demerit charges payable. Custodian charges, yes. Warehousing charges is not required to be paid for this balance days up to 30 days. Then, after 30 days, what will happen? Either the goods may be disposed of by the customs officer. Disposal by customs officer. Okay. Disposal disposal of goods disposal of goods or it can be kept in the warehouse disposal of goods or it can be retained in the warehouse for a period of 30 days for a period further period of 30 days for a further period of 30 days so warehousing but this warehousing is done by home warehousing warehousing by customs officer so for what period for a period of 30 days this can be kept during this time if the bill of entry is filed during this stage if the BOE is filed what is that we need to pay so whether any late fee is required to be paid yes no doubt late fee is payable for delay in filing bill of entry demerit charges will not come because the goods are cleared for warehouse so it is not in the port or airport so demerit charges not payable and what about the custodian charges as the goods are crossing the you know custodian stage so we don't have to pay the custodian charges but we need to pay warehousing charges for that period like that for every 30 days like that for every 30 days okay for that infinite time there is no time limit for every 30 days the customs officer has to decide okay so 30 plus 30 this is for a further period of 30 thereafter every 30 days the customs officer has to decide whether to dispose of the goods or they can be warehoused by the customs officer okay clear pa got the clarity about this any doubt in this So, that is with respect to the section 49, storage of imported goods in warehousing pending clearances. So, these are the sections that we need to know when it comes to import procedures. Okay. So, section 29 to 35 to be followed by the person in charge and section 45 to section 49 to be followed by the importer. Okay. Now, in this connection, there are some more provisions which are connected to this import procedure that is assessment, assessment. So, what are the assessments that we have? So, we have two types of assessments. Pa. We have two types of assessments that is self-assessment and provisional assessment. This self-assessment is given under section 17 whereas provisional assessment is given under section 18. We have only two types of assessment, self-assessment and provisional assessment. So, that is section 17 and section 18. This self-assessment, what, how it will work? So, what will happen? Importer or exporter will be filing a document. What is a document? Bill of entry or shipping bill will be filed by the importer or exporter. So, this bill of entry or shipping bill will be taken up for scrutiny by the officer. Okay. So, what will happen in self-assessment? Step 1. Step 1, BOE filed by importer, bill of entry filed by importer, bill of entry filed by importer or shipping bill filed by exporter or shipping bill or shipping bill filed by exporter. filed by exporter 
So upon filing of this shipping bill or bill of uh, that is shipping bill or bill of entry by the exporter and importer, step two scrutiny of BOE scrutiny of BOE or shipping bill scrutiny of that BOE or shipping bill. So after doing this scrutiny, if everything is proper, okay, you can see that assessment. So this assessment in study material they connected to this uh, payment of uh, filing of bill of entry topic itself. Okay, so there self assessment you can see. Yes, so duty to be self assessed by the importer or exporter. An importer entering any imported goods under section 46. What is section 46? Bill of entry. Exporter entering any export goods under section 50. That is shipping bill. Shall save as otherwise provide in section 85. Self assess the duty if any leviable on such goods. And then what will happen? This will be verified by the proper officer. So whatever bill of entry made under section 46 or shipping bill filed under section 50 will be self assessed. Uh, is self assessed that will be taken up for scrutiny by the proper officer. If everything is proper in that, so then it will not be there. Suppose if there is any discrepancy, then the proper officer will do the reassessment of duty. Okay. So, so after this scrutiny, so step 3 is what? Step 3. Either reassessment, reassessment by officer reassessment by officer or or completion of self assessment completion of self assessment that is they are taking up the bill of entry or shipping bill for scrutiny na so now after this scrutiny either they will do the reassessment or completion of self assessment suppose if they are doing reassessment so then we need to pay that reassessed duty either we can pay that reassessed duty or we can go for appeal. A speaking order will be passed within 15 days from the date of reassessment of bill of entry. Okay. So, step 4, either pay reassessed duty and clear goods, either pay reassessed duty, reassessed duty and clear goods, either pay reassessed duty and clear goods or or disposal of goods uh, that is uh, or appeal against self reassessment or appeal against reassessment appeal against reassessment is it clear pa either we can pay the reassessed duty or we can go for appeal a speaking order will be passed reassessment order will be passed reassessment order passed within reassessment order passed within 15 days within 15 days suppose if you are not making the payment so within 15 days they will pass a reassessment order this, this much only you need to remember these four steps you need to remember for self assessment whereas provisional assessment what are the cases where provisional assessment can be resorted first we need to know what are the cases what are the cases where provisional assessment can be resorted either importer or exporter is unable to determine the value or rate of duty okay so that is one case where importer or exporter is unable to make self assessment so importer or exporter unable to make importer or exporter unable to determine unable to determine to determine value or rate value or rate in that case so the resort will be made to you know provisional assessment but not only this when the customs officer is of the opinion that they need to carry out any chemical examination or test okay so officer required to carry chemical examination officer required to carry carry chemical examination chemical examination or test chemical examination or test so in that case also provisional assessment can be resorted or third step uh, or third case what is that importer or exporter was required to submit the information but they have not submitted any information okay importer or exporter not submitted information 
importer or exporter not submitted information not submitted information okay that is one case where provisional assessment can be resorted fourth case last case importer or exporter submitted information but proper officer requires further information okay importer or exporter importer or exporter submitted information submitted information but proper officer requires but officer requires officer requires further information further information so this is important question pa what are the cases where provisional assessment can be resorted these four cases we need to write importer or exporter unable to determine the value or rate or officer required to carry chemical examination or test importer or exporter not submitted the information importer or exporter submitted the information but the officer requires further information okay these are the four cases so in these cases the provisional assessment can be resorted okay so what happens after provisional assessment after provisional assessment so they need to finalize the assessment so upon finalization of the assessment either differential duty will be payable or they will get the refund suppose they need to pay differential duty then they need to pay interest so that interest should be computed from when to when we need to know okay so interest should be computed for at the rate of 15 percent per annum from the first day of the month in which so it is the provisional assessment order is passed and till the actual date of payment so you can see this illustration so mr maurice lal has imported goods from germany and is finally reassessed under section 182 of customs act for two consignments particulars are as follows date of provisional assessment 12 december date of final reassessment 2nd february duty demanded for first consignment 180000 and refund for second consignment 420 date of refund made by the department 28 april date of payment of duty demanded 5th february now simple first we will take consignment number 1 consignment number 1 we need to pay the differential duty 180 so what is the interest that is payable interest payable to government so we need to compute it on 180000 and what is the rate of interest 15 percent per annum from when it will be computed from the first day of the month in which provisional assessment order is passed what is the first day of the month in which provisional assessment order is passed means first december we need to count from first december so in the month of december so 31 days till the actual date of payment what is the actual date of payment 5th february so february that is uh, december 31 days january 31 days and february it will be 5 days so for 67 days we need to compute the interest 67 divided by 365 okay so 180000 into 15% into 67 divided by 365 that will be so how much 180000 into 15% into 67 divided by 365 that comes to 4956.16 so 4956 will be taken this is the interest payable on first consignment you can see 4956 rounded off understood or not so interest should be computed from when from the first day of the month in which provisional assessment order is passed so provisional assessment order is passed on 12th december so from 1st december what if the provisional assessment order is passed on 28th december then also we will take it from 1st december only okay then in case of refund in case of refund when refund will come under provisional assessment we paid extra but under final assessment we need to get that refund so then there is a statutory time limit of three months within three months if they are giving refund no need to pay any interest otherwise they need to give us an interest at the rate of six percent per annum so when the final assessment is over final assessment is over on 2nd february and what is the date on which refund is made 8th april so 2nd february to 2nd march 2nd march to 2nd april so 2nd april to 2nd may so within three months they are giving the refund so no need to give any interest why there is no need to pay interest because within three months from the date of final assessment so it is given so interest is not payable in this case okay so therefore two interest provisions we need to remember in case of provisional assessment in case of provisional assessment we need to remember two interest provisions what is that interest payable interest payable so interest payable on what on differential duty interest payable on differential duty how much is that interest payable on differential duty at the rate of 18 15 percent per annum from from 
first day of the month first day of the month first day of the month in which provisional assessment order is passed in which provisional assessment in which provisional assessment order is passed order is passed till the date of refund sorry till the date of payment okay till the date of payment this is in which case interest payable on differential duty interest receivable on refund interest receivable on refund what is the interest receivable on refund interest receivable on refund how much is the interest receivable on refund so that will be at the rate of 6% per annum from when from the first day after 3 months from so that is 6% per annum after 3 months after 3 months from finalization of assessment from final assessment final assessment till the date of refund okay till the date of refund so these are the two interest provisions that you need to remember in case of provisional assessment part so with this we completed self assessment and provisional assessment okay and uh, then we have customs audit under section 99a in this customs audit there is nothing so customs audit you need to know so who will be doing this customs audit customs officer only will do this customs audit and who will be called as audit who will be called as audit audit can be any person so that is importer or exporter importer or exporter even custodian also can be audited or warehouse licensee also can be audited or any other person directly or indirectly clearing forwarding or stocking goods also can be audited so customs brokers also can be audited okay and this audit will be post clearance audit so where this audit will be conducted this audit can be conducted either at the premises of the proper officer or at the premises of the audit okay so this audit will be conducted at the premise of the audit who will uh, by the authorized officers who will intimate you know within 15 days in advance so what is a notice that they will be giving 15 days notice will be given and the audit should preserve the records for a period of 5 years so every person should preserve the records for a period of 5 years and this audit is on selected basis some risk parameter basis means not every person will be audited so based on the findings so they need to pay and uh, so they can take chartered accountant cost accountant or it professionals as the support team for the purpose of conducting the audit and contravention of provisions of these regulations will attract a penalty up to 50000 rupees what are the types of audit that will be conducted there are two types of audit pa transaction based audit and premises based audit in transaction based audit what will happen is that first so they will be taking few transactions and they will audit those transactions and if everything is proper they will leave suppose if there is any discrepancy then they will convert the transaction based audit into premises based audit and in premises based audit they will verify everything okay under transaction based audit what will be audited only transactions are audited and it may be noted that tba may subsequently be converted into premises based audit in premises based audit not only that import and export all relevant records all relevant commercial records financial statements contracts everything will be audited by the department okay and uh, that is about assessment and audit so we completed assessment and audit also in this now there is one concept called as faceless assessment what is this faceless assessment faceless assessment so we don't have that much detailed provisions like in income tax faceless assessment under customs so faceless assessment is rather than the verification or scrutiny which is done by the jurisdictional customs officer so this verification can be done by that is once we file the bill of entry self assessment we file one bill of entry na that bill of entry may not be verified only by our jurisdictional customs officer it can be verified by any customs officer in faceless assessment okay so what happens in faceless assessment is that so faceless assessment is a major custom reforms where bill of entry that is identified for scrutiny where this case so we saw in self assessment one step called as scrutiny na so this scrutiny scrutiny is assigned to an assessing officer 
who is physically located at a custom station which is not the port of import which is not the port of import so it will be allocated to one customs officer assigned to one customs officer who is not physically located in the port of import means some other place and who will do this the customs automated system will take care of this allocation okay and it separates the assessment process from the physical location of the port assessment process from the physical location of the port using a technology platform okay now in faceless assessment so what happens so same point is repeated again Techno use as a technology platform to separate customs assessment from physical location of customs officer and this will ensure objective free fair and just an assessment so bribes and all will not be there mainly for that purpose only and from importer perspective there is no change in process they will normally file the bill of entry and they will be getting the out of customs charge order but what happens at the back end is only changing and what are the key objectives of faceless assessment anonymity in assessment for reduce the physical interface between trade and customs so which means that so there is no need that the importer has to interact with the customs officer speedier customs clearances through efficient utilization of manpower okay then greater uniformity of assessment across location promoting sector and functional specification in assessment so these are the objectives you need to remember this suppose if you get any question on write a brief note on faceless assessment you need to write this paragraph what is faceless assessment what are the key objectives of faceless assessment okay then next one payment through electronic cash ledger and credit ledger so there are two sections section 51a and section 51b section 51a talks about electronic uh, cash ledger for payment of duty interest and penalty whereas section 51b talks about electronic duty credit ledger okay so what is this cash ledger so that is whenever we need to make the payment of customs duty interest penalty fees etc so that can be paid through the cash ledger we will make a deposit into the cash ledger once we make deposit into the cash ledger so that money in the cash ledger can be used for payment of our duty etc mainly why they have brought in this so because many times the customs house agents will be paying the customs duty on behalf of the importer because of the delay in making payment of tax unnecessarily there will be interest to avoid this interest only they are bringing this electronic cash ledger okay so it provides for advanced deposit which would enable payment of duties so whatever balance that is there in the cash ledger can be used for payment of duties taxes fee interest and penalty okay so uh, this cash ledger so whatever balance is there so can we carry forward that yes we can carry forward that and with the use of authorized mode of payment persons who regularly make payment of duty are permitted to deposit certain amount of money and whatever money they have deposited can be used for payment of customs duties and even penalty fees etc the balance in ledger after payment of duty will be refunded in the prescribed manner okay so that is about electronic cash ledger then we have electronic duty credit ledger in electronic duty credit ledger it is like any incentives that we are getting or any refunds that we are getting under customs so any duty remission of duty tax or any incentive financial benefit so that will be created into duty credit ledger which we can use for payment of only customs duty so we cannot use it for payment of anything but we can use it only for payment of customs duty only okay so the duty may be used by the person so towards making payment of duties under customs okay and whatever is the balance so can we transfer that yes so it can be transferred to another person also and we have this much information only under electronic cash ledger and electronic duty credit ledger again for short note question it can be asked so that is with respect to import fully in detail we have completed then exportation so exportation the much provisions are not there the same sections will be there section 39 because here it stops at section 35 now it stops at section 35 so that section 36 onwards is given here so section 39 which says export goods not to be unloaded so that is uh, loaded 
until entry outwards is granted. In case of export procedure, there is an entry outwards that will be granted. Only after getting the grant of entry outwards, the goods can be loaded. And section 40, not to be unloaded unless duly passed by the proper officer. So, that should be approved by the proper officer. And then delivery of departure manifest, export manifest, export report. In case of export, person in charge will be submitting in case of aircraft departure manifest and in case of vessel export manifest and in case of vehicle export report as per section 41. Export procedures are not that important. That's why I'm not discussing much about it. Okay. Then as per section 41A, they need to give the passenger and name record information. So whatever we have seen for import, the same replica. Section 42, no conveyance to leave without written order. Okay. Then next uh, we have procedure for clearance of exported goods. So that is to be followed by exporter. Every exporter should be filing a shipping bill or bill of export. In case of vessel and aircraft shipping bill, in case of uh, vehicle, it is bill of export. And once they file that shipping bill or bill of export, the proper officer will be passing a let export order. Okay. So that is with respect to this. So what happens in export procedure is that, so we have completed import procedure. In export procedure, in export procedure, there will be three parties. So that is exporter, exporter, person in charge, exporter, customs officer, exporter, customs officer, okay. And we have person in charge person in charge. What will happen first? So, first the exporter will be filing shipping bill or bill of export with the customs officer. Shipping bill, shipping bill or bill of export, shipping bill or bill of export will be filed with the customs officer. And after verification, customs officer will be passing let export order let export order will be passed by the customs officer. Then exporter will be handing over the goods to the person in charge for loading. Okay. So handing over the goods for the purpose of loading to the person in charge and person in charge should be getting grant of entry outwards. So person in charge should get grant of entry outwards grant of entry outwards. So, after getting grant of entry outwards, so whatever goods that are loaded into the vessel or aircraft that will be submitted to the customs officer. So, that is export manifest or departure manifest or export report. Okay. Export manifest in case of export manifest, export manifest in case of vessel. Then departure manifest departure manifest. This departure manifest is in case of aircraft, is in case of aircraft and export report is there. That export report, that export report is in case of vehicle. So, these are the documents to be filed. Okay. Export manifest in case of vessel, departure manifest in case of aircraft and export report in case of vehicle. This is the document to be filed by the customs officer with the person in charge. Okay. So, that is with respect to this. Then, procedure for postal articles. So, in case of postal articles, you need to remember some important points that is as per section 83. What is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty? Okay. In case of import or export by post, import or export by post, import or export by post. So, what is that information that you need to remember? That is, what is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty? Okay, relevant date, relevant date for determination of, relevant date for determination of, for determination of rate of duty rate of duty, relevant date for determination of rate of duty. If it is import by post, import by post or if it is export by post, okay. And import by post again divided into two, that is in case of vessel, in case of aircraft or vehicle, 
in case of vessel in case of aircraft in case of aircraft or vehicle in case of vessel we need to take date on which the postal authority submits the parcel list to the proper officer so date of submission of parcel list date of submission date of submission of parcel list to officer to officer like date of presentation of bill of entry okay or or b date of arrival of vessel date of arrival of vessel whichever is later that will be taken whichever is later will be taken whichever is later will be taken in case of aircraft or vehicle it is only one day that is the date of submission of parcel list to the proper officer date of submission of date of submission of parcel list parcel list to officer that will be taken okay date of submission of parcel list to officer will be taken okay this is in case of you know import and uh, that's what you can see the rate of duty applicable on any goods imported by post or courier shall be the rate in force on the date on which postal authorities or authorized courier present to proper officer a list containing particulars of such goods however where the postal goods arrive on vessel and the list containing is available and filed by postmaster before the arrival of vessel the list shall be deemed to have been filed on the date of arrival that's what whichever is later in case of any other case it will be the date of presentation of post parcel list okay whereas in case of export so all this information is given in which place section 83 so this is given in section 83 so that section 83 alone you need to remember one section in case of export the date on which parcel is handed over to the postmaster the rate of duty in case of export shall be the valuation on the date on which exporter delivers the parcel to the postal authorities date on which date on which parcel parcel delivered to parcel delivered by exporter to by exporter to postal authorities to postal authorities now wherever i say postal authorities if it is courier it will be replaced with courier agency remaining and all will be same that is about section 83 84 is about the procedure so this procedure and all is not important pa so you don't have to learn about this procedure so because that's not that much important related to this then stores so the stores also not at asked questions are not much asked on this related to stores then baggage baggage is a very very important area so so far what we have discussed import or export procedures import procedures export procedures assessment audit faceless assessment electronic duty credit ledger and electronic cash ledger in case of import or export by post what should be taken as a relevant date for determination of rate of duty now finally we are looking like uh, listening into baggage provision so baggage refers to passengers luggage and in case of baggage we need to pay custom duty there are some sections related to baggage so section 77 says that every person who is bringing the goods should cross through two channels red channel and green channel and they need to make a declaration as to what are the goods that they are bringing as per section 77 the person who is bringing the goods through baggage dutiable goods through baggage is required to make a declaration first of all what is baggage baggage refers to passengers luggage pa okay baggage refers to passengers luggage and it includes unaccompanied baggage also unaccompanied baggage means what that baggage will be coming either before their arrival or after their arrival that is known as unaccompanied baggage but it does not include motor vehicles why motor vehicles no one will no idiot will bring motor vehicles as a part of baggage na so that's why this is the meaning of baggage so what is baggage baggage means passengers luggage or crew luggage it includes unaccompanied baggage and it does not include motor vehicles okay then so any goods which are brought into india in the form of baggage will also be treated as imported goods and on that customs duty payable so that provisions only we are discussing as per section 77 so the owner of baggage has to make a declaration of contents declaration of contents to the proper officer in one form called as baggage declaration form and as per section 78 
the relevant date for determination of rate of duty is the date on which they submitted the declaration baggage declaration that will be taken as the relevant date for determination of rate of duty okay and then what is the applicable rate of duty on baggage the applicable rate of duty on baggage is 35 percent so basic customs duty okay so what is the rate of duty on baggage rate of duty rate of duty on baggage rate of duty on baggage so we have two rates pa one is in case of alcoholic liquor oh, sorry not alcoholic liquor firearms in case of firearms in case of firearms number two in case of cartridges of firearms cartridges of firearms cartridges of firearms exceeding 50 exceeding 50 numbers then number three cigarettes cigarettes exceeding 100 cigars exceeding 25 cigars exceeding 25 and tobacco exceeding tobacco exceeding 125 grams okay in these three cases the applicable rate of duty on baggage is 110 percent how 100 percent basic customs duty and 10 percent social welfare surcharge that comes to 110 percent whereas in case of other goods in case of other goods what is the rate of duty on baggage it is 38.5 percent how 38.5 percent 35 percent basic customs duty 10 percent on the 35 that will be 3.5 so 38.5 percent so whether any igst payable no so this is the effective effective rate of duty on baggage and no igst there is no igst uh, no igst payable okay so just this much only so at 110 percent on case of three goods that is firearms cartridges firearms exceeding 50 cigarettes exceeding 100 cigars exceeding 25 tobacco exceeding 125 grams all other goods it will be 38.5 percent so where is this rate given section 77 78 section 78 what does section 77 says section 77 says that so section 77 says that you know declaration to be filed declaration declaration of contents declaration of contents to be filed declaration of contents to be filed okay and whatever is the rate of duty prevailing on the date on which we file the declaration that will be taken then section 79 there is some exemption with respect to baggage what is that exemption with respect to baggage that is used personal effects is exempted irrespective of the value used personal effects irrespective of the value is exempted okay and household effects so we have some exemptions with respect to this so but that exemptions is subject to the allowances like whatever provisions that we have under baggage rules okay so as per section 79 as per section 79 exemptions exemptions with respect to baggage exemptions with respect to baggage okay this is read with baggage rules this is read with baggage rules 2016 okay this is read with baggage rules 2016 so there the provisions are given what is that exemption first pa first you need to remember that used personal effects exempted used personal effects used personal effects are exempted irrespective of value what is that used personal effects means what is the meaning of used personal effects personal effects have been defined which says that it is used by the passenger or his family so passenger has been used by the passenger but it does not include jewelry one second where is it ah personal effects means things required to satisfy daily necessities but does not include jewelry so what is that daily necessities but used personal effects is only exempted new ones are not exempted so required to satisfy daily necessities but does not include jewelry so jewelry will not come under personal effects so this is exempted irrespective of value it is exempted next number two you need to check one laptop computer okay laptop for a person for a person okay one laptop only one laptop only so one laptop 
वन लैपटॉप फॉर ए पर्सन फॉर ए पर्सन ग्रेटर दैन एटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एज ग्रेटर दैन एटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एज दैट इज ऑल्सो एग्जेप्टेड बट वेन वी टेक दिस लैपटॉप सो वी शुड एंश्योर दैट सो लैपटॉप इज नॉट फॉर सैटिस्फाइंग डेली नेसेसिटीज that's why laptop will not come under personal effect let it be a used one or a new one used one or a new one only one laptop will be allowed okay that too for a person greater than 18 years of age this is the second then next number 3 travel souvenirs travel souvenirs travel souvenirs means when you visit a particular place as a memory of visit of that place you will be bringing that is known as travel souvenirs not in commercial quantity okay for example any person who visits uh, paris will be buying something as a memory of visit of that particular place so that uh, paris uh, eiffel tower that model is there na eiffel tower uh, mold model so that they will be bringing so that you will be coming under travel souvenirs but it should not be in commercial quantity that is also allowed free irrespective of the value whatever is the value that will be taken okay irrespective of value irrespective of value it is exempted so what are the three exemptions that we have seen used personal effects one laptop for a person greater than 18 years travel souvenirs now number 4 other articles other articles okay other articles in that other articles we have allowances okay in case of that other articles we have allowances what are the allowances that we have with respect to the other articles we have jewelry allowance under rule 5 okay so we have a general free allowance under rule 3 and rule 4 and we have allowance for transfer of residence okay so with respect to these other articles we have allowances what are the allowances we have general free allowance we have general free allowance so what is that general free allowance that is given in rule 3 and rule 4 okay general free allowance and then we have jewelry allowance jewelry allowance jewelry allowance with respect to other articles we have general free allowance jewelry allowance and allowance for transfer of residence so allowance allowance for transfer of residence allowance for transfer of residence okay so these are the so three allowances that we have okay this general free allowance is given in rule 3 and rule 4 and jewelry allowance is given in rule 5 whereas this allowance for transfer of residence is given in rule 6 okay so these are the three allowances that we have with respect to other articles sir so these allowances is with respect to other articles because once it is exempted why we should bother about uh, allowances now this general free allowance is depending upon a person coming from which place suppose if the person is coming from नेपाल भूटान म्यानमार नेपाल भूटान नेपाल भूटान आर म्यानमार ओके म्यानमार नेपाल भूटान आर म्यानमार सो देन अगेन वी विल डिवाइड इट इनटू टू वेदर ही इज कमिंग बाय लैंड रूट वेदर ही इज कमिंग बाय लैंड रूट सो देन देयर इज नो जनरल फ्री अलावेंस नो जनरल फ्री अलावेंस सपोज इफ ही इज कमिंग बाय अदर केसेस अदर देन लैंड रूट then general free allowance will be 15000 rupees how much is the general free allowance pa 15000 rupees will be general free allowance okay suppose if the passenger is coming from other countries other countries other than nepal bhutan myanmar okay then again we will divide it into two tourist of foreign origin tourist tourist means his stay in india is not for a period more than 6 months so tourist of foreign origin tourist of foreign origin so if it is tourist of foreign origin then the gfa will be general free allowance will be 15000 rupees suppose if it is if he is others others okay other than tourist of foreign origin then the general free allowance will be 50000 rupees this is the general free allowance in case of rule 3 and rule 4 okay got the clarity 
So we need to remember this Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar land route, no general filaments. Other cases, general filaments is 15,000. And if they are coming from other countries, tourist of foreign origin, general filaments 15,000. In other cases, general filaments will be 50,000. Okay. Now, so what is that I have been discussing? Baggage. First, I have discussed what is the rate, then declaration, exemptions. In that exemptions, so first three fully exempted. Next, other articles. So, we have some allowances, beyond that allowances, we need to pay the duty. In that allowances, general free allowance, up to this we completed, okay. So, there is one query to our friend, uh, that is, is 110% levied on cartridge in excess of 50 or entire lot exceeding threshold? No, in excess of 50. Up to 50, the rate is 38.5% only. So, in excess of 50 only 110 percent, up to 50 it will be 38.5 and cigarettes also up to 100 it will be 38.5, cigars also up to 25 it is 38.5, tobacco also up to 125 grams it is 38.5 on the quantity exceeding this only 110 percent will be applicable, okay. Then jewellery elements we have, so for male passengers separate jewellery elements and for female passengers separate jewellery elements, so jewellery elements is divided into two male passenger, male passenger and female passenger, okay, male passenger and female passenger. For male passenger, what is the jewellery allowance? So, 20 grams with a value cap of 50,000 rupees, 20 grams with a value cap, with a value cap of, with a value cap of 50,000 rupees, whereas for female passenger it will be 40 grams with a value cap of, with a value cap of rupees 1 lakh, okay. So, for male passenger it will be 20 grams with a value cap of 50,000, 40 grams with a value cap of 1 lakh. Sir, how this should be calculated? Simple here, for example, you take uh, Mr. A. Mr. A is bringing, Mr. A is bringing 25 grams of value, of value jewellery, 25 grams of jewellery, 25 grams of jewellery, jewellery with a value of, with a tariff value, usually for jewellery and all, we will take tariff value. So, the tariff value is fixed by the government, so with a tariff value of 60,000 rupees. Now, what will be the dutiable value? Simple. First, uh, we need to take 20 grams how much? For 20 grams, it is how much? For 25 grams, if it is, for 25 grams, if it is 60,000, for 20 grams, it is how much? For 20 grams, it will be 60,000 into 25, uh, 20 divided by 25. So, that will be 48,000 this is one number or 50,000, 50,000, whichever is lower, whichever is lower will be taken, okay. So, therefore, how much will be allowed? 48,000 will be allowed. Therefore, dutiable value will be, dutiable value will be, so 60,000 minus 48,000, whichever is lower is allowed. So, 60,000 minus 48,000 that will be equals to 60,000 minus 48,000, that will be 12,000 will be taken as the dutiable value, understood or not. So, that is with respect to jewellery allowance. Same way for uh, female passenger also we need to calculate. Then, in case of transfer of residence, this transfer of residence is, so depending upon the period of stay, so 3 months, up to 3 months, 0 to 3 months, 3, 0 to 3 months, so nothing, no allowance, okay, nil and 3 to 6 months, 3 to 6 months, what is the number 6, so 60,000, 60,000 rupees worth of goods they can bring, 6 months to 1 year, 6 months to 1 year, so remember 1 lakh, okay, so greater than 1 year in preceding two years, preceding two years, okay. So, two, remember two lakhs, 
okay and greater than 2 years greater than 2 years it will be 5 lakhs so this is the allowance for transfer of residence 0 to 3 months nil 3 months to 6 months 60000 6 months to 1 year 6 months to 1 year okay so 3 months to 6 months 6 months to 1 year so then greater than 1 year greater than 2 years so 60000 1 lakh 2 lakhs 5 lakhs so this is the allowance and what are ineligible articles that we need to know that's very very important what are ineligible okay this is the allowance that we know now what is ineligible cases so ineligible if you see here general free allowance annexure 1 annexure 1 articles annexure 1 articles are not eligible annexure 1 articles are not eligible for what general free allowance then Suppose if the period of stay less than one year, period of stay less than or equals to one year. So not eligible, not eligible means their period of stay should be more than one year. And here, so annexure 1 and annexure 2, both articles are not eligible. Annexure 1 and annexure 2. Annexure 1 and Annexure 2 articles, Annexure 1 and Annexure 2 articles are not eligible where in case of the transfer of uh, residence allowance, okay. Now, what is that Annexure 1 articles? In Annexure 1 articles, already you know 3, Annexure 1 articles, already you know 3. That is 3 articles for which the duty is 110% uh, is there na. That is known as Annexure 1 articles. Total 6 articles are there in Annexure 1. Total 6 articles are there. In that already we know 3. What are they? That is for which 110% will be applicable. For which 110% is applicable. Customs duty. So what are they? Firearms. 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 Then cartridges of firearms exceeding 50 cartridges of firearms cartridges of firearms exceeding 50 numbers then number 3 cigarettes cigarettes exceeding 100 numbers then cigars exceeding 25 numbers and tobacco tobacco exceeding 125 grams Okay, these three. Then three more articles. For the three more articles, so the rate is not 110 percent, the rate is so 38.5 percent, but general relevance is not available. So, what are they? Number one, number four, alcoholic liquor, alcohol in excess of two liters, in excess of two liters means more than 2 liters. So, up to 2 liters, general fuel allowance available. More than 2 liters, general fuel allowance not available. And in all cases, 38.5 percent is the rate, okay. Then point number 6, LED, LCD, plasma TV, plasma TV. Then point number 7, oh sorry, point number 6, gold or silver, gold or silver in any form, in any form other than ornaments, other than ornaments, okay. So, this case and what is the rate? First three cases, the rate is 110 percent and next three cases, the rate is 38.5 percent. But in all cases, GFA not available, transfer of residence allowance also not available, okay. That is this annexure 1 articles, okay. So, annexure 2 articles are this color TV, etc. Okay. Annexure 2 articles, annexure 2, because for this transfer of residence, annexure 2 articles are not eligible. Okay. So, what are those annexure 2 articles? Annexure 2 articles, if you take, so you can see, so one second, annexure 2, where is it? Oh, annexure 2, color TV, okay, video home theater system. So, annexure 2 articles, color TV, 
कलर टीवी वीडियो होम थिएटर होम थिएटर ओके देन नेक्स्ट डिशवाशर डिशवाशर सर शुड बी रिमेंबर यस नो अदर गो वी नीड टू रिमेंबर देन नंबर फोर रेफ्रिजरेटर रेफ्रिजरेटर exceeding 300 liters so suppose if it is up to 300 liters that will be available above 300 liters then deep freezer deep freezer okay then video camera or combination of any such video camera with one or more of the following television receiver sound recording video reproducing apparatus which is remember video camera cinematographic films of 35 mm and above okay so point number 6 video camera video camera and uh, so film so 35 mm and above for home theater we will be using films na so the 35 mm and above films so these are the annexure you know two articles and in annexure two also we have in annexure to also we have gold or silver in any form other than ornaments that already we covered under annexure 1 itself gold or silver in any form other than ornaments so therefore we don't have to remember that separately so these are the annexure 2 articles okay so these are the allowances we have pa. apart from these allowances all other cases it will be dutiable okay so that is with respect to this then rule 7 up to rule 6 we completed rule 7 rule 7 says that so foreign exchange as per the limits prescribed under fema that much only can be brought then unaccompanied baggage whatever provisions we discuss that will be applicable even for unaccompanied baggage also so baggage can be accompanied or unaccompanied baggage can be accompanied baggage or unaccompanied baggage what is accompanied baggage that comes along with the passenger okay or unaccompanied baggage unaccompanied baggage means that is not coming with the passenger that comes either before or after arrival all the provisions of all all the allowances of baggage whatever we discussed is applicable even in case of unaccompanied baggage provided that unaccompanied baggage comes within one month after arrival and two months before arrival just remember this table so a for after b for before and the alphabet a is one alphabet d is two so one month after arrival and two months before arrival of the passenger is known as unaccompanied baggage okay so within one month after arrival within one month after arrival within one month after arrival and two months before or two months before arrival or two months before arrival okay so that will be known as unaccompanied baggage for them also it will be applicable then for crew that is uh, people who are working in the you know ship or aircraft etc crew so for them any baggage allowance is there no so during the time when they are in the contract they cannot bring articles more than 1500 during the time when they are in contract but when the contract is over they are coming out finally so at that time they can bring the articles that general whatever allowances that will come but uh, for the people who are working during the tenure when they are working so not more than 1500 <coughs> now look into this illustration for mr sujay an indian entrepreneur went to london to explore new business opportunities on 14 2020 his wife also joined him in london after 3 months the following details are submitted by them with the customs authorities on their return to india on 15 4 used personal effects worth rupees 80000 two music systems each worth rupees 50000 and the jewelry brought by sujay worth rupees 48020 grams and the jewelry brought by his wife 96000 worth 40 grams in this case used personal effects is fully exempted pa used personal effects is fully exempted we don't have to pay whereas two music systems so they are coming from which place london so then other than nepal bhutan myanmar so therefore this is also general free allowance available why 50000 rupees each okay gfa for mr sujay gfa for mr sujay and mrs sujay there it is accommodated okay 
then next uh, jewelry jewelry allowance jewelry allowance is available for a passenger who stayed in abroad more than one year in this case sujai went on 14 2020 and is returning on 15 for 2021 so jewelry allowance is available to sujai 20 grams with a value cap of 48000 so therefore jewelry allowance is available jewelry allowance is available whereas mrs sujai is joining after three months so then this 96000 will be dutiable why this 96000 is dutiable because jewelry allowance is not available to a passenger who is not staying for a period more than one year so that 96000 will be dutiable and 96000 will be dutiable at what rate 38.5% so therefore that will be dutiable jewelry allowance is applicable only to passenger residing more than one year consequently no duty liability on jewelry bought by mr sujoy however his wife is not eligible for jewelry allowance because you know she is for a period less than a year thus she has to pay customs duty on entire amount of jewelry brought and can we use general free allowance for jewelry also yes gold or silver in any form other than ornaments only general free allowance not available as per an extra one but for jewelry whether general free allowance is available yes for jewelry general free allowance is available okay then illustration five after visiting usa for a month mr S and uh, mr x indian residents aged 40 and 45 years brought to india a laptop computer valued at 80000 even though mr x is eligible for a gfa of 50000 mrs x is eligible for a gfa of 50000 but this 80000 rupees article cannot be accommodated why they cannot accommodate it because so if 80000 rupees 80000 rupees laptop computer used personal effects 90000 exempted and personal computer 52000 so now 180000 rupees so if you take mr x mrs x so mr x mrs x laptop is exempted so let's take uh, laptop exempted whereas mrs x personal computer personal computer value is what 52000 but how much is the general free allowance 50000 so 50000 gfa 50000 gfa then what will be the dutiable value the dutiable value will be 2000 anyhow mr x is having some general free allowance can we use that no there is no pooling facility so that is we cannot pool so the general free allowance of one passenger with the other passenger in this case so therefore on 2000 rupees duty payable at 38.5 percent okay so that is this section 79 what are the exemptions with respect to the baggage then temporary detention of baggage section 80 which says that suppose if you don't want to pay baggage duty you brought those articles you don't want to pay baggage duty in that case no need to pay baggage duty you can keep it temporarily there and that can be taken back at the time when that person is leaving but only those baggage which is declared can be temporarily detained other baggage and all cannot be detained temporarily so only declaration declaration is the essence the declaration should be given then only temporary detention of baggage then regulations in respect of baggage as per section 81 so cbic is empowered to make regulations in this regard okay so that is with respect to this baggage we completed transit and transshipment already we have seen in the yesterday's class itself so what is transit and what is transshipment okay and uh, then so this difference you need to remember transit versus transshipment in transit so section 53 talks about transit 54 transshipment in case of transit the same conveyance which is bringing the goods will be taking it to another place but transshipment there is a change in the conveyance and in case of transit there is continuity of records but in case of transshipment there is no continuity in records as the goods are changed to another conveyance we are moving on to the next chapter that is warehousing under customs this warehousing under customs is like actually added from may 22 exam onwards and uh, see in warehousing we have lot of provisions so let's try to understand because section 57 to section 73a deals with warehousing provisions okay and in that section 57 58 and 58a talks about what are the types of warehouses okay so while calculating deferred payment for first slab we considered sunday and excluded it but for second slab we don't consider sundays why because we will not consider sundays of that month 
we will see the next month first working day. So this time we will not be checking. That is after 16 to 31, we will not see any Sundays. So next month first working day means we will ignore this month. And first month, next month first working day, if that is Sunday or any holiday, the next day will be taken like that. Okay. Then, so types of warehouses, what are the three types of warehouses? So public warehouse as per section 57, private warehouse as per section 58 and 58A special warehouse. These are the three warehouses that we have pa public warehouse, private warehouse and special warehouse. So what is a public warehouse? Public warehouse means wherein any dutiable goods can be deposited. Private warehouse means dutiable goods imported by the licensee, only that person. So these three are actually licensed by the customs. So in public warehouse, suppose if I have the license, not only my goods, some other person's goods also can be allowed to be kept in public warehouse. But in private warehouse, the person whose goods, that is who wants that goods, that person's goods only can be deposited in that warehouse, that is private warehouse. Whereas only some notified goods, only some notified goods by the department, CPIC, can only be deposited, that is special warehouse. And public warehouse and private warehouse and special warehouse, all these are licensed by principal commissioner or commissioner of customs. Okay. Whereas public warehouse and private warehouse will be under records based control, records based control, whereas special warehouse will be under physical control means it will be under customs lock okay so that special warehouse will be completely under the customs lock so these are the three warehouses that we have in section 57 section 58 and section 58a okay so this information you need to remember pa first okay so one second So, this information very, very important. So, this you need to remember, okay. Then, next. So, now we understood. And what are those notified goods that can be kept? We do not have to remember. Clearly, they have given. What are the goods which are notified? No need to remember. This is just for knowledge purpose only. And what are the notified goods? not required to be remembered but there are some notified goods which only can be kept in that warehouse that is 57 58 and 58a as per 58b there is cancellation of license of a warehouse okay so what is that cancellation of license who will give the license of the warehouse that will be given by the principal commissioner or commissioner correct so if at all you are not complying with the provisions that license granted can be cancelled, okay. As per section 58B, as per section 58B, license can be cancelled. License can be cancelled. So, when license can be cancelled, who will cancel? Who gave the license? Principal commissioner or commissioner of customs gave na. So, they only can do the cancellation by commissioner customs, commissioner or principal commissioner, principal commissioner can cancel. Whether any notice can be given, no, no notice. No notice will be given for cancellation of the license. That is this, okay. Now, what a person should do within seven days? So, the goods which are there in that warehouse should be either cleared to another warehouse or should be cleared for home consumption, okay. Within seven days, within seven days, from cancellation, within 7 days from cancellation, what is to be done? Within 7 days from cancellation, clear to another warehouse, clear to another warehouse, okay, or clear for home consumption, clear for home consumption. So, these are the consequences whenever the warehouse license is cancelled, okay. That is with respect to this. 
Then section 59 talks about warehousing bond for depositing the goods in these warehouses. So what is the procedure to be followed? For depositing the goods in these three warehouses, so importer should file one bill of entry. Importer will file, importer shall file, which, which bill of entry shall file? Bill of entry for warehousing, bill of entry for warehousing, okay. And when they file that bill of entry for warehousing, they need to execute a bond, okay. As per section, as per section 59, a bond needs to be executed. For what value? Three times the duty payable. Three times the duty payable on such goods. Three times the duty payable on such goods. A bond needs to be executed as per section 59. So that is this provisions. Okay. And this bond will be consignment bond or general bond. Consignment bond only I told you. Thrice the duty payable. Whereas general bond for the amount as may be specified, as may be specified by the proper officer, we need to execute the bond, okay, that will be general bond. Then, this warehousing bond plus prescribed security to be given, consignment bond price the amount of duty assessed, general bond as per the amount specified by the proper officer. Then, section 60, permission for removal of goods for deposit in warehouse, okay, what is that? This is warehousing order, section 60, so, whenever we file the bill of entry, so then warehousing order will be passed by the customs officer. So, as per section 60, warehousing order by proper officer. Warehousing order, warehousing order by proper officer. Okay, then section 61, what is the period for which goods can be kept in warehouse and what is the interest payable, okay. So, section 61 is important section. So, period of warehousing, period of warehousing and interest payable. Period of warehousing and interest payable. Now, so this is divided into two parts. For a person, EOU, EHTP, STP, EOU, EOU, okay, warehousing period, EOU, EHTP, STP. Who is EHTP? Electronic Hardware Technology Park, STP, Software Technology Park, okay, or warehouses where manufacturing operations are permitted or usually it is a private warehouse, okay, manufacturing operations are permitted, so it is a private warehouse, that is the place where manufacturing operations are permitted, pa. so in this case, so there is no warehousing period, no warehousing period, means what, we can deposit the goods, for an unlimited time, no warehousing period, no warehousing period, that is what, so that is warehousing period is not applicable, so then till it is cleared, so they can keep the goods, but in other cases, what is the warehousing period, one year from the date of order, okay, for other cases, others, for other cases, others, what is the warehousing period? one year from the one year from the date of deposit in warehouse or warehousing order one year from the date of warehousing order one year from the date of warehousing order is taken as the time limit period of warehousing okay and can this be extended for a further time yes this one year may be reduced or may be extended may be reduced in case of perishable goods okay may be reduced, may be reduced in case of perishable goods or it may be extended also. So, in which case, suppose if the goods are such that which uh, requires to be kept, so request is made by the importer, then it can be extended for a further period also, okay. Now, what is the interest? So, that is what 100% EOU, EHT, STP, so or manufacturing other operations, so till the date that goods are cleared other than one about till the expiry of one year from the date of order permitting deposit of goods in the warehouse, okay. Now, interest on warehousing period, in this case, there is no interest, no interest, no interest payable, which case, this case, EOE, HTP, STP or private warehouse, no interest chargeable for the period 
of goods that remain in the warehouse whereas other cases interest will be from 91st day so what is the interest free period 90 days what is the interest free period already this question has been asked in may 22 exam interest for warehousing already asked okay so interest free period what is the interest free period for 90 days from the date of from the date of warehousing order from the date of order and what is the interest payable interest payable how much interest payable at what rate interest is payable 15 percent per annum in customs always the rate of interest is 15 percent 15 percent per annum from the date of from the 91st day from the 91st day okay after order after order till the date of payment till the date of payment because until that point of time actually when you deposit the goods in warehouse you are not paying customs duty na due to that reason 15 percent per annum so it will be computed from the date on which proper officer gives out of customs charge order and the interest will be you know record from the date hence the period of 90 days will be computed so after that 90 days interest is for a period beyond 90 days waiver of interest so the board is having power to waive of the interest in this case so in case of eou ehtp stp no interest other cases interest is payable okay and if customs duty is not payable at the time of clearance even interest is also not payable there is one cases there is one case in this regard pratiba processors case there is one pratiba processors case supreme court case what does that pratiba processors case says at the time of clearance from the warehouse if no customs duty payable then interest is also not applicable okay then that is this then suppose and one more case law is there kesoram rayan case supreme court case as well as sbc sugar's case this kesoram rayan case as well as sbc sugar case says same if the goods are not cleared within the permissible warehousing period on expiry of that warehousing period the goods are deemed to have been cleared like that one point they are telling okay these two cases then look into this illustration one ex an importer imported some goods and deposited them in warehouse on 12th april these goods were re-exported without payment of duty on 15th august yes no need to pay duty here because imported goods are not cleared from the warehouse now it is exported from there itself no need to pay customs duty now in this case whether any interest is applicable no when there is no duty payable interest also will not be applicable that is this pratiba processors case so therefore since the goods have been exported without payment of duty interest will not be payable on x okay then question number two comment on the validity of the following statements goods other than capital goods intended for use in any hundred percent eou can be warehoused only till expiry of five years no unlimited time there is no time limit it can be kept till the actual clearance so then interest free period of 90 days in respect of warehoused goods commences from the date on which into bond bill of entry is presented no it will be counted from the date of warehousing order warehousing order not from the date on which bill of entry is presented from the date on which order is permitted okay then next one section 64 what is section 64 what is the owner right so this is section 61 sir what happened to 62 and 63 62 and 63 were omitted 62 and 63 are not there so we have 64 so what does 64 says section 64 talks about owner's right okay owner's right with respect to warehoused goods owner's right with respect to warehoused goods with respect to warehoused goods what is that owner's right with respect to warehoused goods they can access the goods okay inspect inspect or sort okay they can inspect or sort the goods and show the goods for sale show the goods for sale show the goods for sale or and they should ensure ensure goods are not damaged 
goods are not damaged okay why because if the goods are damaged because of his negligence then we will not get abatement we will not get abatement due to that reason okay so this is owner's right with respect to warehouse goods then manufacture and other operations in relation to goods in a warehouse section 65 and section 66 so this both sections talks about manufacture and other operations in warehouse section 65 and 66 manufacture and other operations manufacture and other operations so what is that manufacture and other operations so whenever you are importing the goods in the warehouse you can do manufacture also with respect to those imported goods and after manufacture you can export it without payment of customs duty that is what section 65 says okay and so this should be under the permission of the proper officer and here suppose if any goods are exported and that related goods and that related goods has some waste and scrap say for example they have given one situation here you are importing 100 kgs of steel you are importing import of import of 100 kgs of steel and the basic custom duty applicable on that steel is say 12 percent okay and what you did you did the warehousing warehoused you warehoused it and after warehousing it you made a manufacture after this manufactured utensils manufactured utensils okay manufactured utensils these manufactured utensils you are exporting okay so now when you manufacture the utensils what is the uh, weight of these utensils the weight of these utensils is 96 kgs 96 kgs then what is the remaining the remaining waste and scrap is 4 kgs so this 96 kgs is exported this 96 kgs of manufactured utensils are exported okay now what is the waste and scrap arising in the process in this process there is some waste and scrap okay what is that waste and scrap waste and scrap quantity is how much 4 kgs 4 kgs is the waste and scrap now when you exported it when you exported it how much exported 96 kgs no need to pay customs duty on 96 kgs customs duty not payable not payable on 96 kgs of steel so why what you imported is 96 kgs what you imported is 100 kgs in that 100 kgs you need to pay customs duty but you exported 96 so no need to pay customs duty on 96 kgs of steel but 4 kgs of steel is in the form of waste and scrap and what is the basic customs duty applicable for waste and scrap say basic customs duty is 5 percent now what they are telling you have two options with respect to this waste and scrap either you destroy either you destroy either you destroy or clear it for home consumption either you destroy or you clear it for home consumption okay so when you clear it for home consumption you need to pay customs duty you need to pay customs duty on 4 kgs at what rate at 5 percent rate then no need to pay customs duty on 4 kgs of steel what it if you are doing either this or this customs duty not payable on 4 kgs of steel what it customs duty not payable customs duty not payable on 4 kgs of steel okay so either you need to destroy that waste and scrap or you need to clear it for home consumption and pay customs duty accordingly that is what they are telling import duty shall be remitted on the quantity of warehoused goods contained in so much of waste or refuse as has arisen from the operations carried on in relation to such goods exported however such waste or refuse is either destroyed or the duty is paid on such waste or refuse as if as if it has been imported into india in that form so as if waste and scrap is imported in that form we need to pay that is this okay so this is the situation which is given in section 65 and 66 
Now 65, another situation also they are telling that is this is situation 1. This is situation 1 and another situation is also given. What is that another situation? There is an another situation pa, situation 2. In situation 2, what happens is that, so using this imported, okay, using this imported 100 kgs of steel, we are making utensils, warehoused and manufacture of utensils, manufacture manufacture of utensils, manufacture of utensils and what is the weight? 96 kgs, 96 kgs. But what we are doing with respect to this? With respect to this utensils, so we are selling it in the domestic that is home consumption and export, okay. Export, export 75 percent and home consumption domestic home consumption 25 percent home consumption 25 percent export is 75 percent home consumption is 25 percent now in that case what we need to do simple so how many kgs we are exporting so 96 kgs into 75 percent so that comes to 96 kgs into 75 percent 96 into 75 percent will be 72 kgs and 96 kgs into 25 percent, 96 into 25 percent will be 24 kgs, okay. Now, we need to check what is the customs duty applicable to the utensils. For the utensils, basic customs duty is say 12 percent, uh, 10 percent, basic customs duty 10 percent. Now, what they are telling is that, Whenever you are importing 100 kgs of steel and you are manufacturing 96 kgs of utensils and you exported 75 percent, so on this 72 kgs, customs duty not payable, okay. Customs duty not payable on 72 kgs of steel, on 72 kgs of steel, okay. But this 24 kgs, you are clearing for home consumption, not as not as steel but as utensils even then customs duty payable as if steel is cleared okay customs duty payable at what rate at 12 percent on 24 kgs of steel why because as if steel is cleared we need to pay customs duty even though utensils are cleared even though utensils are dutiable at 10 percent but we need to pay the customs duty as if steel is cleared okay so that is with respect to this now we got some waste and scrap during this manufacture we got some waste and scrap what is the treatment of that waste and scrap what is the treatment of that waste and scrap so that waste and scrap again divided into two how many kgs of waste and scrap four kgs what is the basic customs duty with respect to that waste and scrap five percent now this waste and scrap also divided into two with respect to export, with respect to export, with respect to exported utensils, with respect to exported utensils, how much is with respect to export uten exported utensils, 4 kgs into 75 percent, because 75 percent we exported na, so what is it, 4 kgs into 75 percent, 3 kgs, 3 kgs with respect to exported utensils okay then with respect to so local that is domestic domestic clearance with respect to domestic clearance how much with respect to domestic clearance it is 4 kgs into 25 percent that equals to 1 kg now what is the treatment of this 3 kgs so this 3 kgs either you destroy either you destroy, either destroy, either you destroy or so clear it in home consumption, home consumption with duty, 
home consumption with duty with duty at the rate of with duty at the rate of 5 percent 5 percent at the rate applicable to waste and scrap. Now, if you do this way customs duty not payable on 3 kgs of steel customs duty not payable customs duty not payable on 3 kgs of steel, but this waste and scrap pertains to domestic consumption na. So, then in that case this waste 1 kg. So, that 1 kg customs duty payable at what rate? At the rate applicable to steel only. At the rate applicable to steel customs duty payable at 12 percent on 1 kg of steel. Okay. So, this is given. Where is it given? Same. If whole or any part of the goods resulting from such operations are cleared, import duty shall be charged on the quantity of warehouse goods contained in so much of the waste or refuse as has arisen from operations carried on in relation to the goods cleared for home consumption. Import duty shall be charged on the quantity of warehouse goods contained in so much of the waste or refuse as has arisen in the operations carried on in relation to goods cleared for home consumption. Okay. So, these two examples will give you the clarity about, so two situations about warehousing that is manufacturing operations. Okay. Then, so this, this uh, information whatever I gave, this two charts only that is available. Okay. Then next, section 67, 68 and 69, from warehouse for what purpose the goods can be taken? It can be taken to another warehouse or it can be cleared for home consumption or it can be exported. Okay. So, now what happens to the warehoused goods? So, once we deposit the goods in the warehouse, so it is known as warehoused goods. Okay. Warehoused goods. Where these warehoused goods are present in, these warehoused goods are present either in public warehouse, either in public warehouse or in private warehouse or in private warehouse or it may be in special warehouse. Okay. So, that warehouse goods may be in public warehouse, private warehouse or special warehouse. So, this warehouse goods for what purpose it can be cleared? So, three reasons it can be cleared. Pa. So, either it can be so for to transfer transfer to another warehouse, transfer to another warehouse, transfer to another warehouse. Then the provisions related to this are governed under section 67 or cleared for home consumption, cleared for or cleared for home consumption by filing an ex-bond bill of entry, okay, cleared for home consumption. So, the provisions relating to this is governed under section 68 or it can be exported, it can be exported from there, it can be exported. The provisions relating to that are governed under section 69. Suppose if it is taken to another warehouse, what will happen? If it is taken to another warehouse as per section 67, if it is taken to another warehouse, whether we need to file any new bill of entry, no, no need to file any new bill of entry, no requirement of, no requirement of, no requirement of new bill of entry. Why? Because already whatever bill of entry filed is enough and whether bond will be released, no, bond continues, bond continues. And whether any customs duty payable, no, customs duty not payable, customs duty not payable and uh, that is in case of transfer to another warehouse, okay. So then, suppose if it is clearance for home consumption, you understood past section 67, that is no need to file any new bill of entry, bond will continue, customs duty not payable and so overall warehousing period they need to satisfy. Whereas section 68, clearance for home consumption. So, what is it we need to do? X bond bill of entry to be filed. X bond BOE to be filed. X bond BOE to be filed. And whether we need to pay customs duty? Yes, 
customs duty customs duty along with interest payable along with interest payable along with interest payable whether bond executed will be released yes bond shall be released bond shall be released okay then suppose if it is exported no need to file ex bond bill of entry shipping bill to be filed shipping bill because you are exporting na in case of export shipping bill in case of export shipping bill or bill of export bill of export to be filed okay shipping bill or bill of export to be filed and whether we need to pay customs duty on export why we need to pay customs duty we are not required to pay customs duty so customs duty as well as interest not payable customs duty as well as interest not payable okay interest also not payable why pratibha processors case supreme court case and then whether the bond will be released yes bond shall be released bond shall be released okay so these are the three provisions so section 67 68 and 69 and generally relinquishment of title section 23 subsection 2 not applicable in case of warehoused goods but for the purpose of warehoused goods a proviso to section 68 is given for relinquishment of title okay generally section 23 subsection 2 what we discussed yesterday that relinquishment of title is not applicable in case of warehoused goods but for relinquishment of title of warehouse goods a separate proviso has been created that proviso is relinquishment of title of warehouse goods okay sir why do we need to pay interest in the home consumption case because you will be clearing after 90 days na you will be clearing after 90 days so from 91st day there is a deferment of duty payment you will pay duty at the time of clearance for home consumption this is what clear for home consumption after warehousing so which means that from 91st day we need to pay interest that interest only this one then next uh, allowance in respect of volatile goods so what is that section 67 68 and 69 section 70 volatile goods okay section 70 deals with volatile goods what does the section 70 says so whenever there are some volatile volatile goods okay volatile goods warehoused volatile goods warehoused okay so what are those volatile goods so they are being notified so they are being notified in this regard so like uh, like whiskey fuel etc and all whiskey fuel etc and all alcoholic beverages see this so petroleum products aviation fuel motor spirit minerals mineral uh, turpentine acetone methanol raw naphtha vaporizing oil kerosene high speed diesel oil batching oil diesel oil furnace oil like that there are some petroleum products or alcoholic liquor which gets evaporated when it gets evaporated no need to pay customs duty volatile goods warehoused okay reduction in quantity reduction in quantity customs duty not payable on reduced quantity customs duty not payable on reduced quantity okay for example we imported so 1000 liters of whiskey in a barrel and in that only 970 liters are there 30 liters got evaporated now in that case whether customs duty payable on entire 1000 liters or 970 liters only on 970 liters that is with respect to this section 70 pa then section 71 and 72 which says if the goods are not cleared to another warehouse not cleared to another warehouse or not cleared for home consumption or not exported then the goods are said to be improperly imported if it is not accounted means where goods are missing in the warehouse means it is improperly removed and in case of improperly removed goods so the customs officer will be charging you know customs duty along with interest and penalty enumerate the circumstances under which goods are removed improperly where any warehouse goods are removed in contravention of section 71 what is that 71 that is other than for 
you know, another warehouse or export or home consumption where warehoused goods have not been removed within the permissible warehousing period, 61, there is a warehousing period then, where any goods in respect of which bond has been executed under section 59, which have not been cleared for home consumption or export or not duly accounted, okay. In this case, the goods are said to be improperly removed, okay. Then cancellation and return of warehousing bond. So, when, whenever we pay the customs duty, the warehousing bond will be released. Custody and removal of warehoused goods. So, till the time the goods are cleared from warehouse, that will be under the control of, you know, warehouse keeper. Warehouse keeper is a person to whom the license with respect to the warehouse is given, okay. So, that is with respect to this. Now, so there are two questions in this test yourself, we will see that. So, this is uh, test your knowledge questions of ICI study material chapter number 6 warehousing. So, question number 1, Whipple imported certain goods in May, an into bond bill of entry was presented on 14th May and goods were cleared from the port for warehousing. Assable value on that date was US dollar 1 lakh. The order permitting the deposit of goods in the warehouse for 4 months was issued on 21st May. Vipul deposited the goods in the warehouse on the same day but did not clear the imported goods even after the warehousing period got over on 21st December. So, what is the period of warehousing? 4 months. So, warehousing order was issued on 21st May. 4 months means June, July, August, September but they did not clear by 21st September and then it amounts to goods improperly removed because as per Keswaram Rayam case, Keswaram Rayam case of Supreme Court and SBEC Sugar's case of Supreme Court, if the goods are not cleared within the permissible warehousing period, so the goods are said to be improperly removed and the date on which, the date on which the warehousing period is expired will be deemed to be the relevant date for computation of customs duty. Generally, the relevant date for determination of rate of duty is the date on which warehousing uh, ex bond bill of entry has been presented generally the date on which ex bond bill of entry has been presented but in this case the ex bond bill of entry has been presented at a later time for actual clearance but we need to take the date on which goods are deemed to have been cleared improperly that date should be taken so so 21st september is the date for determination of rate of duty for rate of duty we need to take 21st september even though the goods are actually cleared on 14th October, but we need to take 21st September only, okay, because of the case or Rayan case and SBEC Sugar's case of Supreme Court. And for exchange rate, it is inbound bill of entry. What is that inbound bill of entry? 14th May, we presented the bill of entry for deposit of goods into the warehouse. So, on that day, what is the exchange rate? 65.20. Now, take the customs duty computation. What is the assable value? 1 lakh. So, Assable value equals to 1 lakh dollars into 1 lakh dollars into 65.20 that is 65 lakh 20 thousand and basic customs duty basic customs duty 65 lakh 20 thousand into 10 percent that is 6 lakh 52 thousand and then social welfare surcharge social welfare surcharge is 65,200 so 6 lakh 52 thousand so, plus 10%, 7,17,200. 7, there is no IGST. Why there is no IGST? Clearly given, integrated tax is exempted. So, no need to pay IGST. Then, 7,17,200. 7, what is the interest that is payable? So, interest is payable till 14th October. See, interest is payable till 14th October. So, the deemed clearance is only for the purpose of taking the relevant rate of duty. But the interest is payable till the time actual clearance and actual payment of duty we are making. From 91st day, 91st day from the date on which goods are, you know, order is passed. 91st day after the order date. So, first you count from the order date till the actual clearance date. From that 90 days we will reduce. So, 21st May. So, in May, so you take... 10 days. So, because 31 minus 21, so in May you take 10 days and June 30 days and July 31 days, then August 31 days, September 30 days, October 14 days, 146 days. 
from that 146 we will take out 90 days so for 56 days we need to compute the interest okay so 7 lakh 17 thousand into 15 percent 15 percent into 56 divided by 365 okay so 7 lakh 17 thousand into 15 percent into 56 divided by 365 so 7 lakh 17 thousand 200 sorry 7 lakh 17 thousand 200 into 15 percent into 56 divided by 365 so that is 16 thousand 505.42 so 16,505 will be taken as the interest okay so the interest payable will be 16,505 this is how the interest needs to be computed okay then second question BL limited imported superior kerosene oil and stored it in a warehouse an ex bond bill of entry for home consumption was filed and duty was paid as per the rate prevalent on the date of presentation of such bill of entry and the order for a clearance for home consumption was passed on account of highly combustible nature of SKO the importer made an application to permit the storage of such kerosene oil in the same warehouse until actual clearance for sale or use the application was allowed however the rate of duty increased when the goods were actually removed from the warehouse the department demanded the differential duty the company challenged the demand will it succeed so in case of warehouse goods the relevant date for determination of rate of duty is the date on which goods are actually cleared by filing an expand bill of entry in this case at the time when they file expand bill of entry the rate has been increased therefore the higher rate of duty will be payable okay so and if the goods are not cleared within the permissible warehousing period so then it will come okay deemed clearance but it is cleared within the permissible warehousing period so the ex bond bill of entry will be taken so Biaco lari limited supreme court case so it is telling that so where duty on the warehouse goods is paid and out of customs charge order for home consumption is made by the proper officer suppose if the goods are already ex bond bill of entry has been filed but still the goods are kept in the warehouse then on the date of expand bill of entry will be taken so where the duty on warehouse goods is paid and out of customs charge order is made by the proper officer the goods allowed to be retained for storage in the warehouse of the customs act are not treated as warehouse goods they are not treated as warehouse goods because warehousing provisions are not applicable for those goods okay and so imported goods entered for home consumption if stored in a public warehouse in a private warehouse an application of importer if the same cannot be cleared within the reasonable time shall not be deemed to be warehoused for the purpose of this act and accordingly the provisions of this customs act will not be applicable so therefore in this case when the duty is already paid so then don't apply because ex bond bill of entry or bill of entry for home consumption is already filed so that is this case pa, supreme court case so these are the only two questions that are given on warehousing provisions in that interest related question already asked in may 22 exam but i am expecting this second question so please go through the second question properly so this can be tested in exam for the forthcoming okay so we completed in our uh, previous session so up to warehousing and look into the next area that is duty drawback duty drawback so here there are total two sections under which we will get duty drawback section 74 and section 75 what is first of all duty drawback means duty drawback means refund duty drawback means refund there are two sections under which we will be getting duty drawback so duty drawback duty drawback duty drawback in short duty dbk so refers to refund of customs duty so this is nothing but refund of customs duty and when we will get this refund of customs duty sir you are sharing anything yes so nothing is visible to you for others also same issue whatever i am writing is it visible Mm, yes, okay. 
fine here. So, duty drawback refers to refund of customs duty and this refund of customs duty we will be getting in two situations. One is section 74, section 74 and then section 75. So, 74 is what? 74 again divided into two section 74 subsection 1 that is imported goods exported as such without use okay section 74 subsection 2 so 74 subsection 1 is we are importing some goods and those imported goods are exported as such without any use okay imported goods imported goods exported imported goods are exported as such as such without any use without any use so that is 74 subsection 1 whereas 74 subsection 2 is imported goods imported goods are exported exported as such after use okay the difference between 74 subsection 1 and 74 subsection 2 is without use and after use whereas 75 is imported goods used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported first we are importing some goods okay imported goods used in manufacture of finished goods used in manufacture used in manufacture of finished goods used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported okay which are then exported so then we will be getting benefit under section 75 so imported goods used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported then duty drawback under 75 so these are the three sections that we have okay and then so 74 we are going to discuss in detail so what is the duty drawback amount that we will get so how much will be the refund so the duty drawback in this case is 98 percent of customs duty paid on import for example we are importing some goods on that goods one lakh we paid as customs duty those imported goods are exported as such without any use now how much we paid is customs duty on import one lakh so one lakh into 98 percent we will be getting 98 percent of customs duty paid on import okay sir even IGST and GST compensation says also we will get yes full all customs duties whatever is the customs duty that we are paying out of that 98 percent we will get as refund whereas in case of 74 subsection 2 so we have duty drawback at notified rates what is that notified rates depends what is the type of the product okay suppose if it is motor vehicles motor vehicles imported by any person motor vehicles imported by any person this is one or or goods imported by individual for personal purpose goods imported by goods imported by individual goods imported by individual individual the two for what purpose for personal purpose for personal purpose okay so there are two things motor vehicles imported by any person or goods imported by individual for personal purpose in case of motor vehicles imported by any person okay that may be for any purpose whereas in other cases other goods imported by individual for personal purpose how much will be the duty drawback duty drawback will be duty drawback will be so 100 percent of customs duty paid 100 percent of customs duty paid customs duty paid on import paid on import as reduced by as reduced by okay a percentage what is that percentage so we need to take four percent for every quarter or part thereof for every quarter or part thereof okay part thereof in first year okay then next uh, suppose if it is second year so three percent for every quarter every quarter or part thereof or part thereof in second year okay 
and then 2.5% for every quarter, every quarter are part thereof, are part thereof in third year, then last year it will be 2%, 2% for every quarter are part thereof, 2% for every quarter, every quarter are part thereof, part thereof in fourth year. So, this is how we need to reduce, okay. So, after reducing this, the remaining amount we will get as duty drawback. For example, two and a half years we are using. Two and a half years we are using means for first year it will be 4 into 4, 16 percent. For second year it will be 3 into 4, 12 percent. So, 16 plus 12, 28 percent. And thereafter, again for next half year. Half year means it comes in the third year. So, 2.5, 2.55. So, 28 plus uh, 5, that will be 33 percent. So, 33, 100 minus 33, we will be getting 67 percent as duty drawback. Like that, we need to compute, okay. So, duty drawback in case of motor vehicles imported by any person and goods imported by individual for personal purpose. Suppose if it is other cases, means normal goods, other cases, normal goods imported by other than individual or individual for official purpose, okay. So, how the duty drawback will be? So, duty drawback is depending upon the period of usage depending upon the period of usage, period of usage, period of usage and what is the duty drawback, okay, duty drawback percentage. If the period of usage is, so 0 to 3 months, up to 3 months, up to 3 months, then the duty drawback will be 95 percent. So, you need to increase it by 3 months. So, therefore, 3 months to 6 months, then 6 months to 9 months then 9 months to 12 months, then 12 months to 15 months, then 15 months to 18 months, then greater than 18 months. Like that we need to take the period of usage and the duty drawback will start at 95, then it will be reduced by 10 percent up to 75 percent. Thereafter it gets reduced by 5 percent. So, 60 that is uh, 75, thereafter it gets reduced to 70 percent then 65 percent, then 60 percent and beyond 18 months you will not get any duty drawback. So, this is how you need to remember. That is first period of usage you increase by every three months. Then the duty drawback percentage will be reduced by 10 percent up to 75. Thereafter it gets reduced by 5 percent, okay. So, this is the duty drawback. Depending upon the period of usage, we need to take that rate, multiply on the customs duty paid, we will get that as duty drawback. So, whereas if you see in 74, the duty drawback refund is based on the customs duty paid on import, whereas 75 is not like that. In case of 75, we will be having three rates, we will be having three rates, all industry rate, special uh, brand rate and special brand rate, like that we have three different rates, all industry rate. All industry rate means this is a notified rate. So, we have a duty drawback schedule in that this rate will be notified. So, we need to take that rate, multiply on the FOB value and we need to arrive at the duty drawback, okay. That is known as all industry rate. Whereas, there is something called as brand rate. Brand rate will come into the picture when all industry rate is not notified for a product, then brand rate will come into the picture and there is something called as special brand rate, special brand rate is applicable, special brand rate is applicable if the duty drawback as per all industry rate is less than 80 percent of the customs duty paid, okay. So, all industry rate is what? In all industry rate what will happen? First, there will be, so we are trying to understand all industry rate. What will happen in all industry rate is that, so first, so, duty drawback will be a percentage of FOB, duty drawback will be a percentage of FOB of exports, FOB of exports, okay, and sometimes it will be an amount on the quantity exported, okay. So, amount on quantity exported, amount on quantity exported, for example, 20 rupees per kg of exports like that. 
amount on quantity exported. So, this is known as duty drawback under all industry rate. Whereas, brand rate, when the brand rate will be applicable? Brand rate will be applicable when, so, no AIR is notified. No AIR is notified, then we will make an application for brand rate. Then when special brand rate will come into the picture? Special brand rate will come into the picture if duty drawback as per AIR, duty drawback as per AIR is less than 80% of customs duty paid on import. Okay, Duty drawback as per AIR is less than 80% of customs duty. Customs duty excluding IGST and GST compensation says. IGST and compensation says. Okay. Paid on import. Paid on import. So, then we will be making an application for special brand rate. So, all industry rate is a percentage of FOB. So, the main difference between 74 and 75 is that in 74, we will be taking a percentage of the customs duty paid on import. But in case of 75, whatever is your exports, on that a percentage you will get as a duty drawback. Okay. Sir, in 74 subsection 2, first case, year denotes year of usage. First case means, I didn't get you. First case means what? Car. Ah, for every quarter. Correct, correct. Year, year. Year. First year refers to the year of usage. Suppose if you are using it for one year, that 4 percent, if you are using it for one year, three months, like that. So, depending upon the usage, this is depending upon the usage, okay. So, based on the period of usage, we need to reduce. This is based on period of usage, period of usage, we need to reduce, okay. So, then in this case, so for example, the special brand rate, if you see, what happens is that, so I am just giving you an example for this special brand rate, that is customs duty paid on import, customs duty paid on import is say 65,000 is the customs duty paid on import and FOB value of export, FOB value of export is say 15 lakhs and on 15 lakhs you are getting duty drawback. What is that duty drawback? So, the AIR duty drawback as per all industry rate is 4.5 percent of FOB, 4.5 percent of FOB value. Now, what is the duty drawback that you will get? The duty drawback that you will get will be, duty drawback that you will get will be, so for 15 lakhs into 4.5 percent. What is that 15 lakhs into 4.5 percent? 15 lakhs into 4.5 percent will be 67,500. 67,500. So, therefore, in this case, whether we make an application for SBR, no. No application for SBR. No application for SBR. Why no application for special brand rate? Sir, you are getting more than what you paid on import. Okay. Suppose, if the AIR duty drawback as per all industry rate, the duty drawback is say 2.5 percent of FOB value. 2.5 percent of FOB value. Then what is the duty drawback that you will be getting? The duty drawback will be 15 lakhs into 2.5 percent. 15 lakhs into 2.5 percent. 15 lakhs into 2.5 percent will be what? 37,500. Now see the percentage. This percentage of 37,500 over, over total customs duty paid excluding IGST and GST compensation says how much? 65,000. So, on 65,000, 37,500 is what? Divided by 65,000 into 100 will be 57.69 percent. 57.69 percent is less than 80 percent. Therefore, application can be made for, application can be made for special brand rate. Application can be made for special brand rate. You understood or not? So, like that we need to decide for the purpose of this special brand rate, okay. Whereas, duty drawback, sometimes it will be percentage of FOB, sometimes amount on quantity exported, sometimes both will be given. So, we will be required to take whichever is lower. So, this is how 
the duty drawback will be computed as per section 74 and section 75 okay so rates is what we have learned all these provisions are only given here in case of 74 subsection 1 98 percent of such duty we will be getting and so 74 what they are telling is that so we will get the duty drawback on the entire amount okay what is the time limit within which the goods should have been exported imported goods should be exported within two years from the date of payment of duty on importation goods imported for the purpose of repairs and then exported is covered under 74 subsection 1 or 74 subsection 2 it is not covered under both the places because whenever you are importing the goods for the purpose of repairs so then in that case so you are processing so when you are processing you will not get 74 so it will be 75 so whenever the process happens that will be 75 but 74 will come when the imported goods are exported as such because identity of the goods is important okay identity of the goods is important and the imported goods and exported goods should be same due to that reason okay and what is the time limit within which 74 will be applicable that is exported goods should be so within two years from the date of payment of duty on importation and it can be extended for a further time limit okay so now what we have discussed so far is the rates now we are trying to understand the differences between 74 and 75 differences between section 74 and section 75 okay so that we will be discussing particulars particulars and duty drawback under section 74 so rates we completed now duty drawback under section 75 so the provisions relating to duty drawback so what are the differences that we are trying to understand pa first what is the time limit within which the goods must be exported time limit for export time limit for export time limit for export so in case of 74 two years from the date of import or date of payment of customs duty on import or date of payment of customs duty on import two years from the date of payment of date of payment of customs duty on import two years from the date of payment of customs duty customs duty on import okay two years from the date of payment of customs duty on import and plus extended time limit plus extended time by cbic accordingly in case of motor vehicles they are extending but not beyond four years not beyond four years because two years over but next two years because in case of motor vehicles we are using for four years but here only 18 months so less than two years but here four years so that is also under the extension they are giving but in case of 75 there is no time limit which means the imported goods can be exported after manufacture any time limit so there is no restriction at all in case of 75 okay this is the time limit then next so what is the other point that we need to know is that realization of forex is realization of forex a condition in case of 74 subsection 74 realization of forex is not a condition realization of forex realization of forex so that is not applicable in case of 74 but applicable in case of section 75 we need to realize the forex okay then apart from this so is there any prohibitions with respect to prohibitions with respect to uh, duty drawback yes there are some prohibitions prohibition prohibition with respect to duty drawback with respect to duty drawback in that we have one point that is no duty drawback no duty drawback if less than rupees 50 so 50 rupees less than 50 rupees you will not get duty drawback 
So mean, suppose if you are eligible for a duty drawback and the amount of duty drawback is less than 50, you will not get. The same point is here also. No duty drawback if the amount of duty drawback is less than rupees 50. Then another condition that is market value of the exported goods should not be less than the duty drawback. DBK not available. DBK duty drawback not available. Okay. Duty drawback not available if so market value of exported goods if market value of exported goods is less than amount of duty drawback amount of duty drawback say for example you are uh, exporting after some one year and because of which the market value has come down so the duty drawback is 30,000 the market value of those exported goods is just 20,000 or 25,000 you will not get duty drawback this point is applicable here also duty drawback not available duty drawback not available if market value of exported goods market value of exported goods is less than the amount of duty drawback less than the amount of duty drawback okay then next uh, we have some more prohibitions in case of 75 in case of 74 only these two prohibitions but in case of 75 there are some more prohibitions that is so the maximum duty drawback maximum duty drawback equals to one third of market value of goods market value of exported goods market value of exported goods so when it will be coming suppose if the market value is more than the amount of duty drawback the duty drawback is available so second restriction is not there so duty drawback will be restricted to one third of the market value of the exported goods okay then next point suppose if there is any negative value addition then also you will not get duty drawback what is negative value addition negative value addition means no duty drawback or duty drawback not available duty drawback not available if if fob value of export fob value of export less than less than CIF value of import less than CIF value of import that is whatever you are exporting its value is less than the import value negative value addition you will not get suppose if there is a percentage value addition notified so duty drawback not available duty drawback not available if if FOB value of export FOB value of export is less than or equals to so percentage value addition percentage value addition on CIF FOB value of export is less than or equals to percentage value addition on CIF value of import okay what is this for example the value addition notified is 15 percent import value 1 lakh so 1 lakh plus 15 percent 1 lakh 15 thousand so the export value should be more than 1 lakh 15 thousand so then only this duty drawback will not be uh, uh, duty drawback available otherwise duty drawback will not be available so these are the restrictions that we have in case of section 74 and 75 mandatory prohibitions okay so that is with respect to this okay then so should we satisfy the identity of goods so identity of goods in case of section 74 whether we need to satisfy the identity of goods yes we need to satisfy the identity of goods point number four identity of goods identity of goods okay so that is import goods and exported goods should be same imported goods and exported goods imported goods and exported goods should be same okay so that should be satisfied whereas in case of 75 so not required okay identity identity satisfaction identity satisfaction not required why not required because in case of 75 definitely the exported goods will be different from the imported goods that's the reason why 
we don't have to satisfy the identity of the goods that is imported goods and exported goods then application for duty drawback application for duty drawback in case of section 74 yes we need to make an application for duty drawback separate application is required but in case of 75 there is no separate application shipping bill shipping bill or bill of export shipping bill or bill of export treated as application treated as application okay treated as application but in case of 74 a separate application is required separate application separate application for duty drawback required okay separate application for duty drawback is required where in case of 74 okay so that points are also there next so amount of duty drawback where imported goods are used before re-export so then restriction 74 subsection 2 not applicable in case of so here we discussed about 74 na prohibition one more prohibition is there but this is only for section 74 subsection 2 so this is for section 74 subsection 2 not applicable 74 subsection 2 means one that is imported goods are exported after use after use section 74 subsection 2 not applicable in case of in case of wearing apparel wearing apparel so that is we are importing some garments we are using it and then we are exporting we will not get the benefit suppose if you are exporting without use we will get 74 subsection 1 now that is we will get okay wearing apparel and teachers and then uh, so exposed cinematograph film exposed film reel exposed film reels okay but that is not applicable now we are importing some film reels we are recording on that and after it is completed again we will send it back for the purpose of washing it and again it will come so that is exposed cinema uh, film reels or uh, uh, that is this uh, x-ray x-ray plates x-ray plates films etc so this also if you are importing it using it and then exporting so this is only for the purpose of section 74 subsection 2 4 wearing apparel teaches exposed cinematograph film unexposed photographic films okay so then suppose if it is imported and exported as such without use then yes we will get 98 percent of the duty drawback okay and what is the reduced duty drawback rates this already we discussed what is the reduced duty drawback rates and for motor vehicles how we will be getting the duty drawback okay so these are the provisions related to section 74 now there is one question related to this so now you need to answer this question listen carefully spatial wires private wireless private limited imported five mainframe computers from flexonics computers usa on 31st january paying customs duty of 30.45 lakhs the computers worked for some time but in june some technical faults developed in the systems resulting in complete closure of work on being informed about the problem flexonics computers sent their technicians from usa to repair the systems in june itself However, since no solution was found, the management of Spatial Wires Private Limited reshipped or returned the goods to Flexonics Computers USA on 31st December. You are the financial controller of Spatial Wires Private Limited Board of Directors. So first, uh, we imported some computers and uh, what is the custom duty we paid? 30.4 lakhs and the computers worked for some time, okay. But in June, some technical faults developed in the system resulting in complete closure thereafter they are returning it in 31st december you are required to you know and when it is uh, imported 31st january you are the financial control of spatial wires wireless private limited and they have approached you for advising whether import duty paid can be taken back from the central government and uh, what is the amount of duty drawback that is available so think and answer come on make it fast how much duty drawback they will be getting so first we need to check is it 74 subsection 1 or 74 subsection 2 depending upon that you will know what is a notified percentage and you will be able to identify how much is the duty drawback that we will get 
okay it is 74 subsection 2 good imported goods are exported after use and which slab it will be it is like motor vehicles or other goods imported by individual or other cases other cases this is other cases because patial wires private limited and what is the period of usage when they paid customs duty 31st january and uh, when are they shipping it 31st december so then how many months they have used february march april may june july august september october november december that is except january 11 months 11 months means it comes in which slab so it comes in you know 9 to 12 9 to 12 so what will be the percentage so 0 to 3 95 then 70 percent good so therefore 70 percent slab it will be coming so it will be coming under 70 percent slab therefore how much duty drawback you will get 70 percent of customs duty paid that is 30.45 lakhs into 70 percent you will be getting understood 70 percent so first you need to write that yes we will get the duty drawback and imported goods it is provided that goods capable of being easily identified which have been imported into India upon which duty has been paid are entered for export and the proper officer makes an order permitting clearance of goods for export 98% shall be paid as duty drawback however okay this 98% shall be allowed only in those cases where goods have not been used at all and in the present case as they have used it that too so it comes under which slab 9 months to 12 months slab therefore 70% they will get so therefore 70% of customs duty paid they will get as a duty drawback understood pa that is with respect to this then in this regard we have got some rules so in these rules they are telling what are the modes by which it can be exported so either it can be exported by post okay goods can be exported by post and even procedure for claiming duty drawback it can be exported by post yes it can be exported by post and as a baggage also can be taken yes it can be taken as a baggage also okay so what are the modes of export what are the modes of export that is 74 what are the modes of export say this what are the modes of export 74 in case of 74 so we can export it by post okay modes of export modes of export what are the modes of export either you can export it like a general cargo general cargo like general cargo you can export okay like a general cargo you can export or you can export like baggage or you can export it by post okay post or courier so anyway you can export whereas here you can export it as general cargo you can export it as general cargo or you can export it as post or courier but baggage is not allowed baggage is not allowed okay so what is treated as export what is treated as export is either physical export or you can sell it to a foreign going vessel or aircraft or to a special economic zone so that will be treated as export so this point will be common for both 74 and 75 so alternate to export alternate to export what we can do alternative to export we are not able to export but still we need the benefit what we can do either we can sell it to a foreign going vessel or aircraft or you can supply it to an SCZ so both will be treated as ex export so alternative to export is sale to foreign going vessel or aircraft sale to foreign going vessel sale to foreign going vessel or aircraft okay or we can be making sale to SCZ sale to SCZ this will be treated as export alternative to export still we will get the duty drawback okay so all those points related to 74 we completed 
and 75 also we have seen. So, what are the prohibitions that we have with respect to this? Okay. Then types of duty drawback, all industry rate, brand rate and special brand rate. What is brand rate? What is uh, uh, special brand rate? What is all industry rate? All those points we have discussed. And in this regard, we have the rules. In these rules, they are telling what are the restrictions. So that is the goods value should be more. All these things I have summarized, pa. I have not given. What is the time limit for making application for brand rate and special brand rate? This you need to remember. So time limit for application for brand rate and special brand rate. What is the time limit for making application? Okay. So the time limit for making application. Time limit. Time limit for application. For application in case of. In case of brand rate and special brand rate brand rate and special brand rate under section 75 what is the time limit within which we need to make request so three months actually the time limit that is given is three months okay and this three months can be extended for a further period of three months if you pay this one percent of the fob value of export or thousand whichever is less or 2% of the FOB value of export or 2000 whichever is less for a further period of 6 months. So what is the time limit that you have? 3 months from the date relevant for applicability of the amount or rate of duty drawback make an application to the principal commissioner or commissioner. Okay. So what is the time limit here? 3 months from the date of export. Okay. 3 months from the date of export. 3 months from the date of export. 3 months from the date of export and it can be extended for a further 3 months for a further 3 months by assistant commissioner assistant commissioner or deputy commissioner okay acdc and it can be extended for a further period of 6 months by additional that is principal commissioner or commissioner by commissioner Okay, but to extend for three months, to extend for three months, what is the fee payable? The fee will be 1% of FOB, see this, 1% of FOB or 1000, whichever is less only, okay, 1% of FOB or 1000, whichever is lower, whichever is lower, whereas in case of this, commissioner, commissioner, what is the time limit? So, or, sorry, what is the fee? What is the fee for extension? The fee will be double. As the time limit is double, uh, that is 3 months to 6 months, the fee is also double. 2% of FOB, 2% of FOB or 2000 rupees, whichever is lower will be taken. Okay. This is the time limit. Pa. Extension of time limit and what is the fees that is payable in this case? And what are the cases? where we will not get duty drawback and what is the upper limit of duty drawback all these are other points related to this okay next uh, we will see the interest on duty drawback so we completed section 74 section 75 all these points which are very very important we completed now we will look into interest on duty drawback that is given in section 75 interest on duty drawback section 75a when interest will arise two cases so interest payable to government interest receivable from government so interest payable to government when there will be interest payable to government there will be interest payable to government so whenever we get the erroneous duty drawback Erroneous duty drawback means we are not supposed to get the duty drawback, but we got the duty drawback. Okay. In case of erroneous duty drawback, in case of erroneous duty drawback, erroneous duty drawback, erroneous duty drawback means you are not supposed to get the duty drawback, but you claim duty drawback. Okay. Interest at the rate of 15% per annum from the date of from the date of duty drawback, from the date when you get duty drawback till the date of payment, till the date of 
payment to government okay till the date of payment to government we need to compute interest okay see that so where the duty drawback has been paid to the claim paid to the claimant erroneously or it becomes otherwise recoverable under this act the claimant shall within a period of two months should pay and the interest will be calculated for the period beginning from the date of payment of such duty drawback to the claimant till the date of recovery of such duty drawback okay suppose if it is interest receivable from government when there will be interest receivable from government receivable from government will arise in case when you make application for duty drawback and duty drawback not granted within one month okay so duty drawback not granted duty drawback not granted within one month duty drawback not granted within one month within one month from the date of claim duty drawback not granted within one month from the date of claim okay then what will be the interest that we will get interest at the rate of 6% per annum so this is interest we are getting so from government 6% per annum after expiry of one month after expiry of one month okay till the date of payment till the date of duty drawback till the date of duty drawback they need to pay the interest see this where any duty drawback is payable to the claimant not paid within one month then interest will be computed after expiry of the set period of one month till the date of payment of such duty drawback now look into this question number two answer the following with reference to the provisions of customs act 1962 and rules made there under mr a filed a claim for payment of duty drawback amounting to 50000 on 30th july however the amount was received on 28th october you are required to calculate the amount of interest payable to a on the amount of duty drawback claim rate of interest allowed on delay in payment of refund is 6% per annum so this is like uh, first uh, what is the date on which you made a claim so you made a claim on 30th july one month which means so 30th august so therefore in the month of august one day then in the month of september because you received it on 20th october so in the month of september 30 days in the month of october 28 days so therefore you will be getting interest for 59 days 59 days you will be getting interest and that 59 days interest will be computed at what rate six percent per annum on what it will be computed on 50,000 so 50,000 into 59 days into six percent so that is 50,000 into 6% into 59 by 365, 485 rupees, you will be getting as, you know, interest. Then, second part, Mr. X was erroneously refunded a sum of 20,000 in excess of the actual duty drawback on 20th June. So on 20th June, they got the erroneously duty drawback. A demand for recovery of the same was issued by the department on 28th August. Mr. X returned the erroneous refund to the department on 20th October. You are required to calculate the amount of interest chargeable from X. Provide brief reasons for your answer. Interest rate is 15% under section 28AA. So what we need to do in this case is that, first we need to take what is the you know, excess duty drawback that we got, 20,000 rupees. That 20,000 rupees into 15% into, so from the date when we got the duty drawback, when we got duty drawback 20th June and when we are making the return that is refunding that like paying with to the government 20th October. So therefore we need to compute it from which date 21st June. So actually as per law if you see they are telling from the date when we got the duty drawback till the time we are returning the duty drawback from the date of payment of such duty drawback till the date of recovery of duty drawback so here it is paid on 20th june but we need to compute it from 21st june actually speaking literal interpretation of law 20th june only but here they are telling so from 21st june you need to calculate means don't count 20th june count from 21st june so therefore in june how many days 10 days in june and july it will be 31 days and then in august 31 days september 30 days october 20 days okay so how many days it will be 122 days for this 122 days 
we need to compute interest okay so interest at the rate of 15 percent so therefore the interest will be 1003 rupees okay but actually here uh, it's a mistake sir no not it's a mistake usually what we will do is that the date when we get the duty drawback we will not count so the next day only practically will be counted so that's how they have calculated okay so this is about interest computation pa. then section 76 prohibition and regulation of duty drawback so this already we have seen if the market price is less than the duty drawback you will not get or when the amount of duty drawback is less than 50 rupees also you will not get already we have seen and see this illustration 3 ascertain whether the exporter is entitled to duty drawback in the following case and if yes what is the quantum of such duty drawback FOB value is 2000 kgs of goods exported 2 lakhs rate of duty drawback is 30 rupees per kg market price is 50,000 so 2000 into 30 60,000 rupees is the duty drawback but the market price of those goods is only 50,000 so we will not get the duty drawback as a market value is less than the amount of duty drawback okay articles liable to different rates of duty okay so now what we need to understand here is that they are telling articles liable to duty with reference to quantity with reference to quantity means what first of all when section 19 will come into the picture you are bringing a composite of articles composite of articles means in a single package there is more than one article so for example you take a dslr camera tripod lens then memory card like that so different articles as a package you are importing okay suppose if they are liable to duty with reference to quantity with reference to quantity means one specific duty method specific duty method means the duty there are majorly two duty methods specific duty method and ad valorem method specific duty means when customs duty is payable so based on the unit of measurement per kg this much per uh, square feet this much like that when you pay that is known as specific duty method whereas ad valorem method means when customs duty is payable as a percentage of some value we call it as ad valorem method so whenever articles liable to duty with reference to quantity chargeable to duty based on that specific duty so therefore no need to apply section 19 there but when section 19 will come into the picture if the articles are liable to duty with reference to value suppose if liable to duty at the same rate then also no problem all the articles are liable to duty at the same rate so we will be taking that rate itself okay so i'm just giving you an example for this each and every point so first case if you take say for example we are importing product a product a so product a we need to pay so customs duty for product a we need to pay customs duty so 250 rupees per kg then product b product b we are importing where customs duty will be so 400 rupees for you know uh, one ton 400 rupees per ton then product c product c we need to pay customs duty at 500 rupees per unit now what you will do simple product a product b and product c you are bringing as a group now for product a how many kgs into 250 rupees per kg product b so ton so into 400 rupees per ton product c customs duty is 500 rupees per unit so these three products okay imported as a package imported as a package imported as a package for imported as a package for rupees 1 lakh 50 thousand there is a single price it's okay don't bother about that single price so we need to anyhow take so product customs duty is payable based on units of measurement so we will take accordingly and we will pay okay whereas articles liable to duty at the same rate for example we are importing three products product a product a comma b and c imported imported for 1 lakh 50 thousand 1 lakh 50 thousand and all three products bcd 
for all three all three products is 20 percent is 20 percent what we will do simple we will take basic customs duty as 150,000 into 20 percent okay simple that is 30,000 will be taken you understood why sir because chargeability duty at that rate so liable to duty at the same rate now whereas liable to duty at different rates what they are telling highest of such rates will be taken for example for example product a product a is imported where bcd is 20 percent and product b product b is imported where bcd is 15 percent and product c product c is imported where bcd is 10 percent for all these is imported for rupees single one one single price one lakh fifty thousand then how to compute the basic customs duty simple so basic customs duty will be equals to what is the highest rate 20 percent so take one lakh fifty thousand multiply with the highest rate what is the highest rate 20 percent so that will be again 30,000 will be taken why because the highest rate is 20 percent that will be applied on the entire price now suppose if articles are chargeable to duty chargeable to duty at the same rate of duty that is accessories parts and implements so let's see this example so for example camera imported camera imported so camera basic customs duty is 12 percent okay and lens lens which is compulsory accessories lens as a compulsory accessory lens as a compulsory accessory and for this lens the basic customs duty is 15 percent okay and these two are imported for rupees 1 lakh then what will be the basic customs duty that is payable basic customs duty will be so 1 lakh into 1 lakh into what they are telling take the rate of principal supply principal like a composite supply in gst what is the main article camera and this lens is a compulsory accessory for a compulsory accessory we need to take the rate applicable to camera what is the rate applicable to camera 12 percent so 1 lakh into 12 percent 12,000 will be taken okay so no need to take highest rate no need to take highest rate if they are compulsorily supplied along with that article and no separate charge is made for such supply their price is included in the price of the relevant article so which means we need to charge it at the same rate of duty as that of the article got it next so yes yes similar to composite supply mixed supply concept only similar to composite supply mixed supply now suppose if there are some articles which is not liable to duty what we need to do in that case so even they are also getting tax okay for example you see this so camera camera is having a basic customs duty is 12 percent okay and and uh, this uh, sd card sd card not a compulsory accessory sd card not a compulsory accessory not a compulsory accessory not a compulsory accessory basic customs duty is nil okay for this two is imported for 85,000 now what we need to do we will take basic customs duty 85,000 see this 85,000 is for both correct but that 85,000 we will take and multiply with the highest rate why highest rate because this is not a compulsory accessory not a compulsory accessory so highest rate 12 percent so 85,000 into 12 percent 85,000 into 12 percent will be 10,200 will be taken so that will be the customs duty payable okay hope you got the clarity related to this section 19 then so section 19 is this and section 20 concession with respect to reimportation of goods section 21 derelict jet sam float sam wreck 22 abatement in case of damage or deterioration 23 subsection 1 revision of duty 23 subsection 2 relinquishment of title 24 denaturing or mutilation of goods 25 exemptions from payment of customs duty and 
26 we have 26 so the 26 comes in refund chapter the 26 comes in refund chapter what is the 26 so whenever we exported goods and upon payment of customs duty and those goods are coming back to India so why it is coming back to India maybe the exporter has rejected those goods then whatever customs duty we paid on whatever customs duty we paid on export so that we will get as a refund and moreover we do not have to pay any customs duty at the time of import okay so what we are trying to understand section 26 section 26 talks about refund of customs duty on export refund of customs duty refund of customs duty paid on export refund of customs duty paid on export okay so that is first we are exporting goods pa export of goods after export of goods what happened is that the goods are coming back to india import of goods the same goods which we have exported so is imported okay import of goods now upon export upon export you paid customs duty customs duty paid there are only limited goods which are chargeable to customs duty on export not all goods are chargeable to customs duty on export so the customs duty paid is say 1 lakh 1 lakh okay and these goods are imported any reason and then what is the customs duty payable customs duty this is customs duty payable on export customs duty payable on export 1 lakh and what is the customs duty payable on import nothing nil why nil this is what notification notification 45 2017 says notification 45 2017 says that upon export when you pay so section 20 read with notification 45 2017 we discussed at the time of export when you pay customs duty at the time of import no need to pay any customs duty if you are a claiming any benefit at the time of re-import you need to pay back that benefit at the time of export if you are exporting for repairs at the time of import you need to pay fair value of repairs customs duty on fair value of repairs freight and insurance both ways okay but in this case customs duty payable will be nil and then what will be the refund so what will be the refund under section 26 refund under section 26 will be 100% of the customs duty paid on export payable on ex paid on export okay that is 1 lakh you will be getting as refund 1 lakh you will get as refund but what are the conditions there is a time limit which we need to check so what happened upon export export duty has been paid and those goods are brought back the goods are returned otherwise than by way of resale so it should be import not as a resale not as a resale means what it should be like rejections returns etc like that okay so sales returns sales returns are rejections etc rejections etc then only it will be taken okay and next one the goods are re-imported within one year from the date of export so what is the time limit what is the time limit for this the time limit is one year time limit is one year means from the date of export to the date of import the time gap should be one year and application to be made within six months from the date on which proper officer made an order for clearance so whenever we imported whenever we imported time limit for application time limit for application this is the time limit for what for import this is the time limit for import okay this is the time limit for import whereas what is the time limit for application time limit for application is six months from the date of import one year from the date of export time limit for import is one year from the date of export one year from the date of export whereas here what is the time limit for application the time limit for application is six months from the date of import okay six months from the date of import from the date of import should be taken okay so this is what section 26 talks about then 26 over section 26 a section 26 a is 
इन केस ऑफ रिफंड ऑफ कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन इंपोर्ट रिफंड ऑफ कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन इंपोर्ट ट्वेंटी सिक्स ए रिफंड ऑफ कस्टम्स ड्यूटी रिफंड ऑफ कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन इंपोर्ट सेक्शन ट्वेंटी सिक्स ए रिफंड ऑफ कस्टम्स ड्यूटी पेड ऑन इंपोर्ट ओके वॉट इज दैट दैट इज सिंपल पा दिस ट्वेंटी सिक्स ए शुड बी कंपेर्ड विथ सेवेंटी फोर सब सेक्शन वन सो वी आर इंपोर्टिंग सम गुड्स and those imported goods are not in accordance with the specifications are defective now those imported goods are cleared for home consumption and after that only we identify suppose if you identify that before itself you will not pay customs duty you will relinquish the title but you are identifying it after okay so when you identify it after clearance for home consumption what they are telling you either export it or you destroy it or you can relinquish the title you will get 100% of the customs duty paid on import as refund okay so first what has happened import of goods import of goods okay and after import of goods we cleared it for home consumption cleared for home consumption cleared for home consumption and we identified after clearance for home consumption that goods are defective or not conforming to specification goods are defective goods are defective goods are defective or not conforming to specifications not conforming to specifications if you know this if you know this before before clearance for home consumption you would have claimed the benefit of relinquishment of title under section 23 subsection 2 or you would have got the remission of duty under 23 subsection 1 so some benefit already we would have claimed but it is cleared for home consumption whether customs duty has been paid yes customs duty has been paid now in this case what they are telling is that so either either you export it either you export it either you export okay or or you destroy it either you export it or you destroy it or you relinquish the title you relinquish the title but this relinquishment of title relinquishment of title is given in this section so there are there are relinquishment of title in three sections can you tell me what are those three sections where we have come across relinquishment of title three places we have come across relinquishment of title so far and only three are there in customs no idea first 23 sub section 2 there we got relinquishment of title even we have seen under warehousing chapter proviso to section 68 there also we saw relinquishment of title of warehouse goods this is relinquishment of title after clearance so at three stages we have relinquishment of title before order for clearance before order for clearance so relinquishment of title 23 sub section 2 after order for clearance that is warehouse goods in case of warehousing before clearance after order for clearance before clearance means warehousing so relinquishment of title so proviso to section 68 possible and after clearance after clearance of the goods so then also relinquishment of title is possible under section 26a that's a connection okay so either you can export it or destroy it or relinquish the title what will happen in this case when you do this you will get refund equals to 100% of customs duty paid on import 100% of customs duty paid on import you will get as a refund okay but the very very important point is that the goods must be defective or it is not conforming to the specifications and one more condition is that so duty drawback under section 74 sub section 1 should not be claimed then only you will get refund okay note so dbk under section 74 sub section 1 dbk under section 74 sub section 1 should not be claimed should not be claimed okay if you claim that you will not get this section okay 26a you will not get 
then what is the time limit so we saw that the goods are defective or not as per specifications and goods identified as imported goods no duty drawback claim we discussed and either it is exported or relinquished of title or destroyed what is the time limit within which it should be done within 30 days from the date of import sir this export or destruction or relinquishment of title what is the time limit within which it should be done it should be done within okay what is the time limit for this the time limit for this is 30 days from the date of import 30 days from the date of import from the date of import we should have done this okay 30 days from the date of import okay however this 30 days may be extended for a further period of three months okay 30 days from the date of import plus three months this is the time limit okay then suppose if it is prohibited goods so for that and all this will not be applicable okay and uh, we will get 100 percent customs duty and what is the time limit within which application for refund should be made six months from the date of imp, uh, destruction so from export what is the time limit for refund so we are exporting or destroying or relinquishing the title pa what is the time limit for refund for this time limit for refund this time limit is for what this time limit is for export destruction or relinquishment after that export destruction or relinquishment what is the time limit for application time limit for refund application time limit for refund application time limit for refund application is six months from the date of export six months from the date of export or relinquishment or destruction that is the time limit within which we need to make so that is with respect to this and no refund there are two cases you will not get this refund refund not available in two cases what are the two cases in which refund not available so refund not available not available refund not available in two cases so one is prohibited goods prohibited goods prohibited goods you will not get this refund and number two you will not get the refund in case of perishable goods perishable goods also you will not get this refund this is about section 26 yepa then section 27 section 27 this is regular refund what is that regular refund you have paid some customs duty in excess then in that case you will get the refund under section 27 okay so what is that section 27 says any importer or exporter paid some excess customs duty okay so they can make an application for refund or even the person who bond the incidents who bond the incidents means buyer can also make an application for refund and there is a proper form in that the refund claim should be made and what is the time limit for refund claim within one year within one year from the relevant date what is that one year from the relevant date the relevant date depends so the relevant date will be in case okay so it is exemption from duty so through a special order so because of which you need to get the refund then you need to count one year from the date on which such order is given suppose refund is arising on account of any judgment decree or order so then we need to count that one year from the date of such judgment decree or order suppose if it is on account of any provisional duty so payment of any provisional duty and we need to get the refund so date on final assessment or reassessment from the time limit within one year in any other case from the date when we paid the customs duty okay within one year from the date of payment of such duty so what is that we are discussing section 27 so what is that section 27 section 27 talks about refund of customs duty paid on import refund of customs duty refund of customs duty paid on import okay what is that refund of customs duty paid on imp uh, sorry import or export okay so any case any case okay what is the time limit for refund time limit for refund application time limit for refund application the time limit for refund application is one year from relevant date one year from 
वन ईयर फ्रॉम रेलेवेंट डेट व्हाट इज दैट रेलेवेंट डेट दैट रेलेवेंट डेट डिपेंड्स पा दैट रेलेवेंट डेट विल बी समटाइम्स द रेलेवेंट डेट विल बी यू नो सो सपोज इफ इट इज ऑन अकाउंट ऑफ स्पेशल ऑर्डर स्पेशल ऑर्डर रिफंड ऑन अकाउंट ऑफ स्पेशल ऑर्डर द डेट ऑफ स्पेशल ऑर्डर डेट ऑफ स्पेशल ऑर्डर ओके सपोज द रिफंड इज ऑन अकाउंट ऑफ डिक्री आर जजमेंट जजमेंट सो डेट ऑफ दैट डिक्री आर जजमेंट डेट ऑफ डिक्री आर जजमेंट जजमेंट सपोज इफ इट इज ऑन अकाउंट ऑफ provisional provisionally paid provisional payment so provisional payment then so one year should be counted from the date of final assessment or reassessment date of final assessment date of final assessment or reassessment okay these are the three points any other case any other case any other case you are getting the refund okay under section 27 then date of payment of date of payment of import duty or export duty date of payment of customs duty so from that time okay and this one year time limit is not applicable in case of duty paid under protest this time limit one year is there na not applicable not applicable in case of duty paid not applicable in case of duty paid under protest what is the meaning of duty paid under protest duty paid under protest means you don't want to pay customs duty but without paying customs duty you will not get the goods then in that case you will pay the duty under protest and you will get the goods and you will claim for the refund so but this refund when you claim there is no time limit so you won the case so there is no time limit of one year in this case okay that is this point pa no limitation in case of duty paid under protest and what is the minimum amount of refund the minimum amount of refund is 100 rupees minimum refund will be 100 rupees in this case okay so duty drawback it is 50 rupees na like that minimum refund will be 100 rupees less than 100 rupees means they will not sanction any refund and what is the documentary evidence refund is subject to unjust enrichment which means that we need to prove that we have not passed on the burden to the next person okay that's a important point note refund is subject to unjust enrichment refund is subject to refund is subject to unjust enrichment what is subject to unjust enrichment means so we should prove that we have not passed on the burden to the next person then only we will get the refund okay because section 28d says that there is a reasonable presumption that the incidence of duty has been passed on to the buyer unless the contrary is proved okay so therefore we need to enclose the documents along with the refund claim okay therefore documents along with refund claim documents along with refund claim documents along with refund claim should be enclosed documents along with refund claim should be enclosed why should be enclosed to what reason enclosed to prove that to prove that you know burden is not transferred burden is not transferred to next person not transferred to next person okay suppose if we fail to prove okay if we fail to prove unjust enrichment if applicant if applicant fail to prove unjust enrichment if applicant fails to prove unjust enrichment then what will happen refund refund credited to refund credited to consumer welfare fund refund credited to consumer welfare fund okay refund credited to consumer welfare fund that is this pa next processing of refund claim so that is section 27 subsection 
so there are some cases wherein refund is not subject to unjust enrichment means what we don't have to prove so what is the exceptions for this exceptions for refund subject to unjust enrichment exceptions for refund subject to unjust enrichment means what we don't have to prove we don't have to prove unjust enrichment exceptions for refund subject to unjust enrichment okay what are those exceptions there are some cases where we don't have to prove unjust enrichment what are they that is say this if importer has not passed on the incidents normal imports made by individual for personal purpose first case imports made by individual for personal purpose okay then next uh, amount found refundable relates to export duty section 26 refund on account of export refund or payment of export duty there then duty drawback 74 75 okay then if duty was borne by class of applicants which has been notified for such purpose in the official gazette okay notified person so total four cases you need to remember what are those four cases refunds are exceptions to refund subject on unjust enrichment means no need to prove this unjust enrichment what are the cases that is import by import by individual for personal purpose correct individual for personal purpose individual for personal purpose when they are claiming any refund so no need to prove unjust enrichment then next duty drawback duty drawback under section 74 or 75 then next which case export duty refund under section 26 refund under section 26 that is refund of customs duty paid on export and notified class of importers that's what they are telling notified class of applicants okay notified class of applicants notified class of class of applicants so they are also not required okay then one important point is there if the duty paid in excess by the importer before an order permitting clearance of goods is made where such excess payment is evident from the bill of entry in the case of self-assessed bill of entry and duty actually payable is reflected in the reassessed bill of entry so what is the last case pa that is evident 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 excess payment is evident in the bill of entry excess payment excess payment is evident excess payment is evident in the bill of entry evident in the bill of entry so in that case also no need to prove unjust enrichment so these are the cases okay next see this you will understand what is that evident point so the importer has imported an article which has been valued at 1000 customs duty on this article comes to 250 now the importer add its mar profit margin say 250 and sells the article for 1500 now the price charged by the importer consists of duty element which has been passed on to the buyer now in this case he will not get the refund why because he collected the duty from the next person therefore the money will be credited to consumer welfare fund okay that is this and what are the exceptions for doctrine of unjust enrichment already we have discussed then interest on delayed refund that is wherever we are getting refund so that refund should be granted within three months from the date of application so what are the refunds that we have come across three sections we have come across refund now so three sections 26 26a and 27 okay refund under section refund under section refund under section 26 comma 26a and 27 not granted within three months not granted within three months from the date of application from the date of application okay from the date of application what will be the interest interest 
at the rate of 6% per annum from expiry of 3 months from expiry of 3 months till the date of till the date of refund till the date of refund we should get interest at the rate of 6% after expiry of 3 months till the date of refund we should be getting interest now we are moving on to the next area that is foreign trade policy foreign trade policy so that's first of all we need to have some little bit of background about this foreign trade policy that is there is a big difference between customs law and the foreign trade policy because customs law talks about the procedures and uh, as to when uh, there will be import or how to import and what is the valuation the payment of customs duty all these are contained in where which place customs act but what to import and what to export is not given in customs act that is given in ftp okay so what to import and what to export what to import or export what to import or export so where this available what to import or export this will be this will be available in ftp whereas how to import or export how to import or export so that will be given in customs law customs act so that is the link between so ftp and the customs act okay so therefore ftp is the brain as to international trade and customs act is the body of the international trade and why we had this foreign trade policy what happened so this uh, regulation of imports and encouragement of exports was the objective of the government so immediately when globalization has happened in 1991 thereafter so a lot of goods got imported but india wanted to regulate the imports and encourage the exports but on import there is customs duty on export there is no customs duty so then in that case customs department being a department of revenue there is a conflict of interest because for them if imports are made then only they will get the revenue so due to that reason the function of regulating imports so the function of regulating imports and encouraging exports regulating imports regulating imports and encouraging exports encouraging exports so this is the objective and this has been entrusted with the ministry of commerce and industry so therefore this is not entrusted to ministry of finance this is entrusted to ministry of commerce and industry accordingly a, a law is also made that is foreign trade regulation and development act foreign trade regulation and development act 1992 like that one law is also being made and that law gives central government which is the central government here department of commerce and industry so empowers the central government in order to regulate import and encourage exports and they can make the plans and policies accordingly now what ministry of commerce and industry did they delegated this further to an authority called as dgft directorate general of foreign trade to this directorate general of foreign trade they delegated this work so that directorate general of foreign trade so will be coming out with a plan a five year plan so for the purpose of you know regulating imports and encouraging exports so that is known as foreign trade policy okay so here we need to understand the hierarchy so what is that we have foreign trade regulation and development act foreign trade regulation and development act foreign trade regulation and development act what is the year 1992 why this law has been enacted what is the objective of this foreign trade regulation and development act the objective of this is to regulate import regulate import regulate import regulate import and encourage exports encourage exports so this is the objective of this foreign trade regulation and development act and accordingly this foreign trade regulation and, uh, regulation and development act has been delegated to so ministry of commerce and industry ministry of commerce and industry this ministry of commerce and industry so in turn so gave that to dgft directorate general of foreign trade this directorate general of foreign trade has like uh, will be implementing the tough, uh, you know regulating imports and encouraging exports through their regional authorities through their regional authorities it will be implemented okay 
Now, for the purpose of regulating imports and encouraging exports, this DGFT will come out with a five-year plan. So, that five-year plan is known as foreign trade policy. That five-year plan is known as foreign trade policy. Understood or not? And what is the current foreign trade policy? The current foreign trade policy is 2015 and 2020. But what happened during 2020? So, they could not come out with a new foreign trade policy. So, due to that reason, it is extended. It is extended up to 39, 2022. So, therefore, the existing foreign trade policy 2015-20, so gets extended up to 39, 2022. So, this foreign trade policy contains what? So, foreign trade policy contains set of, you know, provisions like policies or plan, etc. for the purpose of regulating imports and encouraging exports. And so, there will be an annual updation, even though it is a five-year plan, but there is an annual updation, five-year plan with annual updation, okay, that is there. So, foreign trade policy is a five-year plan, five-year plan with annual updation, with annual updation, okay. So, that is about foreign trade policy, basic introduction that we got, okay. So, what is FTP introduction, that's what I have given. So, how the act is enacted, foreign trade regulation and development act, and accordingly, they have delegated this work to DGFT. So, DGFT has made a foreign trade policy. So, this foreign trade policy will be for every five years and uh, there will be annual updation. Okay. So, this are the salient features of foreign trade policy. Okay. What is that? Export and import of goods is generally free unless specifically regulated by the provisions of the policy. So, what are the contents of this foreign trade policy? This foreign trade policy contains the basic provisions and uh, the export incentives. These are the contents, okay. So, what is the contents of foreign trade policy that we will try to understand? The contents of FTP, contents of FTP if you see, so we have basic policy, basic policy, okay. Then export incentives, export incentives, what are the various export incentives? And then international, uh, that is Indian, Indian trade classification, ITC, Indian trade classification, okay, ITC, HS, ITC, HS, okay. So, this Indian trade classification harmonized system adopting that they have given. So, that will be there. And thereafter, we will have handbook of procedures handbook of procedures okay and these are the contents of foreign trade policy but what we have in syllabus at ca final level is this basic policy so covered in ICI syllabus and export incentives is also covered whereas this indian trade classification as well as handbook of procedures is not applicable for our syllabus so what will be there in this indian trade classification so all goods are classified into all goods, all imported goods and exported goods are classified into two parts. What is that? That is goods, the import of which are prohibited. So, how the imports and exports are classified? If you see import, import or export, import or export according to ITCHS and foreign trade policy is classified into total four. It is classified into total 4. Okay. So, what is that? Prohibited. Prohibited. Prohibited means what? You are not supposed to import or export. Then, next, uh, restricted. Restricted means you can import or export, but you need a license or authorization. Then, we have reserved for STE. Reserved for state trading enterprises. So, it is reserved for them. Only they can import or they can export. Okay. And finally, freely, freely importable, freely importable or exportable, freely importable or exportable means no need of any license. license. So, this license is called as authorization. License is a normal word, but uh, formally if you see, the name of that license is called as authorization, permission, okay. 
So authorization not required. So freely importable or exportable does not mean no need to pay customs duty. So freely importable or exportable means authorization not required. That is the meaning of freely importable or exportable. Okay. Then prohibited. Prohibited means cannot be imported or exported. Cannot be imported. Cannot be imported or exported. And this information we will be able to access from the DGFT website. Okay. So, if you go to DGFT website, dgft.gov.in, as many students ask me to explain FTP in little bit detail, that's why I'm explaining for little bit in detail, nothing else. And here, you can see what is the policy condition respect to that. So, what is that policy condition? For example, you take nuclear, nuclear reactors, okay, parts of nuclear reactors. Parts of nuclear reactors, what they are telling that this parts of nuclear reactors are restricted. Restricted means, so that requires license, that is the meaning. Restricted means what? Authorization required. So, without authorization, without license, we cannot import it, okay. So, authorization required. Authorization required, okay. Then, what is STE? ST refers to state trading enterprises. State trading enterprises so this trade trading enterprises this trade trading enterprises like for example so if you take food products food products can be imported only by food products can be imported only by so food corporation of india like that petrochemicals or any chemical uh, products can be imported by related to fuel related to fuel it is imported by ioc or ongc like that only they can import or export so that is known as reserved for state trading enterprises so only state trading enterprises can import only stes only stes can import or export can import or export so that is known as reserved for ste and same way if you see like this here we have restricted now same way so, we will be having prohibited also. For example, you take uh, this ivory, products which are made up of ivory, elephants, uh, ivory. So, those ivory products, if you see, worked ivory and articles of ivory, if you see, those are prohibited. You cannot import it at all, prohibited like that. Same way, reserved for STE, like that also some products will be mentioned, okay. So, reserved for state trading enterprises, like that also the products will be given. For example, uh, if you take one second. So, there are some products like petrochemicals, okay, petroleum products. So, fuel, petro, So, petroleum oils, etc. like that. Here if you see, so import policy not applicable. What does not applicable means? Not applicable means, so it is freely importable or freely exportable. Okay, freely importable or freely exportable authorization not required. So, that is how it will be. So, what are state trading enterprises? So, it can be imported or exported by them only that is known as state trading enterprises. Okay, so exports or imports are broadly categorized as free restricted prohibited some goods are free for import and export but can be imported or exported only through state trading enterprises okay and these are restrictions on imports or exports in various strategic health defense so many reasons are there for the purpose of which you know they can give the restrictions with respect to this okay and then we have some export promotion schemes also that also already i told you that what are the contents of foreign trade policy we will have some export incentives and goods and services to be exported but not the taxes hence we will get lot of incentives like whatever custom duty you paid that we will get as a refund and if you import any capital goods you can import it without payment of custom duty or any material also can be imported without payment of custom duty like that okay then administration of the F, uh, ftp we have seen so cbic is working in coordination with dgft and uh, these three D boards Though FTP is formulated by DGFT, it is administered in close coordination with other agencies. Who are the other agencies in whose co close coordination they will be working? CBIC, okay. And thereafter RBI, Reserve Bank of India, 
and state GST departments. So with this coordination, they will be working. And contents of foreign trade policy already we have seen. Okay. So then, what is the difference between FTP and uh, customs GST law also we have seen. Now in this scope of FTP, so mainly they have given about some provisions. So this is the part that I was telling about basic policy. So we have the basic policy. What is that basic policy? Export and imports are free unless regulated. Already we discussed that. And so if there is any product which is exempt as per the customs, we need to so see as per that customs law and we need to follow if there is any restrictions. And then, so what are the principles for keeping restriction or prohibition? Maybe on account of, you know, public morals, like some goods are not allowed to be imported, human or animal or planet life or health, some trademark or patented or copyright products or some national treasures. And uh, then, so trade of fishable material and material from which they were derived. So like that, they can take some principles. And export or import of restricted goods requires authorization. So what is authorization means permission. Okay. And who will fix the terms and conditions? Who will give the authorization? The authorization will be issued by DGFT. But the terms and conditions are fixed by regional authority. What are the terms and conditions that will be there in authorization? So they will tell how much of the quantity you can import and what value of goods you can import. And actual user condition. Actual user condition means only the one who imported should have used it. So the other person, for example, I import it and you cannot use it. That is known as actual user condition. If I am importing, I only should use. So these are the conditions that will be specified in the authorization. Okay. So actual user condition, then export obligation means if I am importing, how much I need to make as export. For example, so 20% value addition means if my import is 1 lakh, I need to make an export of 1 lakh 20,000 like that export obligation. Then minimum value addition to be kept. So the difference between export obligation and minimum value addition is, so minimum value addition talks about from my import, how much should be my export. But export obligation says how much I should export. Okay. So that is sometimes only export obligation will be there. So sometimes there will be minimum value addition also. Means compared to import value, I should make some addition. And you have to also achieve some export obligation like that both can be specified. Minimum import or export price. This is the price at which it should be imported or this is the price at which it should be exported. Then bank guarantee, letter of undertaking or bond with customs authorities or regional authority. So what are the bonds to be executed? How for what value? What is the security required? All these will be the contents of authorization. Suppose if you get a short note question. This is a very important short note question. Pa. Very important short note question. What are the contents of authorization? So the contents of authorization will be Quantity, description on value of goods, actual user condition, export obligation, minimum value addition to be achieved and minimum export price or import price and what is the letter of like a bank guarantee or a letter of undertaking or any bond that needs to be furnished. And authorization is not a right. What does it mean? Suppose if I am making an application for authorization but they did not give authorization. I cannot question the DGFT that why you did not give me authorization. So it is up to their discretion. Same way already you got the authorization. Now you are making an application for renewal. So now if they say that we will not renew, then also you cannot question them why you cannot renew. So therefore authorization is not a right. No person may claim authorization as a right and DGFT or regional authority have power to refuse to grant, have power to refuse to grant or renew the same in accordance with the provisions of foreign trade policy. Then penalty and placing of entity in denied entity list. This denied entity list has been tested in the last exam. That is, if you are not complying with the provisions of foreign trade policy, so they are telling that you have to achieve this much of value addition or this much of export obligation or actual user condition like that, you breached. So then a firm may be placed under denied entity list, okay, and when they violate any condition of authorization, who the person to whom the authorization is given, if they violate any condition of the authorization, they will be placed under denied entity list. For how many days it will be placed under denied entity list? For a period not more than 60 days at a time, it will be placed under denied entity list. What will happen if they are placed under denied entity list? They will not be eligible for any benefit under foreign trade policy. That is, 
if a firm is placed under denied entity list all new licenses script certificates instruments will be blocked from printing or issue or renewal okay that is with respect to this denied entity list state trading enterprises i told you that there are some goods import or export of which is reserved for ste only they should import or export that is known as state trading enterprises some of the examples of state trading enterprises are food corporation of india fci food corporation of india then mmtc that is uh, multi metals trading corporation and then ioc indian oil corporation ongc etc these are the examples of uh, state trading enterprises then import export code import export code will be a 10 digit permanent account number only so import export code will be given by dgft every importer and exporter should obtain import export code that import export code is a 10 digit number which is nothing but a permanent account number only so whatever is your permanent account number the same will be notified as your iec okay and so this is because so they wanted to connect income tax gst customs and ftp for that purpose they are using commonly permanent account number okay and every importer exporter at the time when they are filing bill of entry and shipping bill they need to quote their gstin also okay so gstin should be quoted on import of goods and export of goods so why gstin should be quoted on import of goods because they can take the igst paid on uh, import and uh, also why they need to quote gstin because so that they will get the refund of gst paid on export for that purpose okay then so trading with neighboring countries dgft may issue instructions or frame schemes so to strengthen uh, ties with neighboring countries then transit facility transit of goods through india from or to other countries adjacent to india shall be regulated in accordance with bilateral treaties between india and those countries so we need to refer that then mandatory documents for export or import of goods from or into india so in case you are importing what are the documents that should be there first you need to have a document to prove that you are the owner of the goods what is the document to prove that you are the owner of the goods bill of lading in case of vessel and airway bill in case of aircraft lorry receipt or railway receipt in case of railways and postal receipt in case of import uh, by postal means so these are the documents to prove that you are the owner of the goods number two commercial invoice come packing list that is invoice so what is the value at which you purchase so that purchase invoice should be given then so in case of import bill of entry and in case of export shipping bill the first and second document will be same in case of import and export whereas the third document alone will change that is in case of import it is called as bill of entry and in case of export it is called as shipping bill or bill of export easily you can remember okay so first to prove that you are the owner of the goods second to prove that what is the value at which you are importing or exporting and third it will be the relevant document under customs that is in case of import bill of entry in case of export shipping bill or bill of export then provisions relating to import of goods so actual user condition goods which are importable without any restriction may be imported by any person however if imports require authorization actual user alone may import such goods unless actual user condition is specifically dispensed with the GS dgft suppose if dgft says that actual user condition is not there then any person you any person can import under that license that is you can import and it can be used by any other person but in the authorization in the absence of that uh, exception so always the authorization will be with the actual user condition means the one who is imported only should use otherwise what is the point in keeping the restriction then second hand goods so what is the provision with respect to second hand goods second hand goods are divided into two so import of second hand goods so the policy with respect to import of second hand goods so we are discussing first import of second hand goods import of second hand goods this import of second hand goods is divided into two that is capital goods and other goods capital goods and other goods okay so with respect to other goods always there will be restriction because india follows a restricted policy with respect to second hand goods in the name of second hand goods lot of scrap and waste will enter into india due to that reason so import of second hand goods other goods definitely requires authorization requires authorization even though its original that is new do not require authorization but when you import it in second hand that requires authorization when it comes to capital goods that capital goods are divided into two 
that capital goods are divided into two some notified goods and other goods notified goods other than notified goods what are those notified goods so there are total five notified goods pa other than notified goods other than notified goods other than notified goods so authorization not required other than notified goods authorization authorization not required okay other than notified goods authorization not required but for notified goods authorization is required what are those notified goods so we have laptop laptop then ac air conditioner then diesel generator set diesel generator set then we have uh, computers computers also then photocopiers photocopiers so these are the notified goods even though it's new do not require authorization when you import a new laptop that do not require authorization but when you import it in second hand form authorization required okay requires authorization requires authorization okay suppose if these goods if these notified goods used in project abroad for a period of at least one year suppose if it is some notified goods used in project abroad used in project used in a project used in a project abroad okay so this point is also there project imports so you can see that uh, import of goods used in projects abroad after completion of the projects abroad project contractors may import without an authorization goods including capital goods used in the project provided they have been used at least for one year okay used in project abroad for at least one year for at least one year so then authorization not required authorization not required okay authorization not required so this is what you need to remember in case of second hand goods okay so second hand goods same way other goods also used in project abroad for a period of at least one year so that also authorization not required got it so what is that you need to remember first we need to divide the second hand goods into two capital goods and other goods capital goods notified goods five notified goods laptop ac dg set computers and photocopiers requires authorization other than notified goods authorization not required and other goods requires authorization but these notified goods as well as other goods suppose if you are using it in a project abroad for a period of at least one year and if you are importing but it should be for setting up a project outside india and we are setting up the project there and those goods can be brought into india without any authorization that is this okay then this is in case of second hand goods so what are the notified goods computers laptops photocopier air conditioner diesel generator sets okay then second hand goods other than capital goods shall be restricted for imports and may be imported only against authorization then removal of scrap or waste from a system so generally import of waste and scrap requires authorization so here we need to understand something that is there is a special economic zone there is a scz and this is CZ to DTA. Okay. So there is a CZ in India. There is a special economic zone in India. And the remaining area will be called as DTA. Okay. The remaining area is known as DTA, domestic tariff area. So any goods that are sold from a CZ to DTA, any goods that are sold from a CZ to DTA. Okay. So the DTA is remaining area remaining area is known as dta remaining area is known as dta sale from scz to a dta so it will be treated as deemed import for the purpose for the person in dta okay so it will be called as deemed import it will be called as deemed import same way whenever the sale is made so this is deemed import as per scz act same way when the sale is made from dta to scz so this is not treated as export not an export not an export as it is deemed import as it is deemed import the person in dta is required to pay customs duty along with igst person in dta person in dta shall pay customs duty shall pay customs duty shall pay customs duty along with igst along with igst 
So for this already we discussed one case law also, Tirupati Udyog case. So SR Steel's case of Gujarat High Court, we already discussed one case. Now why, why this relevance is there? Generally, waste and scrap is restricted. Okay. Generally, waste and scrap is restricted. Pa. So, waste and scrap, waste and scrap generally imported. Okay. Waste and scrap imported, imported is always restricted. Always restricted. Now, the waste and scrap is generated from SCZ and sold to DTA. So, waste and scrap generated. So, if generated in SCZ, if generated in SCZ and sold to DTA, okay. If generated in SCZ, if generated in SCZ and sold to DTA, okay. Then it is import, deemed import, correct or not? Then it is deemed import. Already we have seen that it is deemed import. Whether that requires authorization? No. Authorization not required. Authorization not required. Authorization not required. But the person in DTA shall pay customs duty as if the goods are imported into India. He need to pay customs duty. Yes. But authorization not required. Why it will many discussion? Because generally any waste and scrap that is imported always requires, always restricted, always requires authorization. But in the case of SCZ, they have given the relaxation. That is this point. Pa. Any waste or scrap or remnant including any form of metallic waste and scrap generated during manufacturing or processing activities of an SCZ shall be allowed to be disposed of in DTA freely subject to payment of applicable customs duty. So freely, which means that do not require authorization, even though generally waste and scrap requires authorization. Then import of gifts and samples. So we need to understand the provisions related to import and export of gifts. Okay. Suppose if there is any import of gifts, policy with respect to policy with respect to gifts, policy with respect to gifts. So now there is some import of gifts. We will divide it into two import of gifts, export of gifts, import of gifts import of gifts and export of gifts okay export of gifts in case of import of gifts what they are telling is that whether that gift is a restricted article or freely importable article restricted restricted or freely importable freely importable article suppose if that gift contains a restricted article definitely the person who is getting the gift in India don't know anything about that article that is whether what is there in that uh, gift so that's why authorization cannot be obtained generally restricted means authorization needs to be obtained but this being a gift consignment so which is coming so customs clearance permit is required customs clearance permit customs clearance permit is required okay for example say during covid what happened so many people were having shortage with respect to oxygen concentrators and people in India requested their children outside India to send the oxygen concentrators from abroad and they have sent it into India because India there was a huge demand for that and when that oxygen concentrators were sent as a gift consignment it came. So generally oxygen concentrators requires authorization but this being a gift consignment just a customs clearance permit is sufficient. So this customs clearance permit is just a declaration that we are not importing it for resale but we are importing it for personal purpose. So like that, so a customs clearance permit is required. Suppose if that gift contains an article which is freely importable, customs clearance permit is not required. Customs clearance permit, customs clearance permit is not required. Customs clearance permit is not required. That is with respect to this. Import of goods including those purchased from e-commerce portals through post or courier when the customs clearance is sought as gifts is prohibited except for life saving drugs, medicines and raki. Further import of samples will be provided governed by prescribed procedures. Then export of gifts if you see. So one second export of gifts. Provisions related to export of gifts. Uh, export of gifts. Goods including edible items of value not exceeding 5 lakhs in a licensing year may be exported as a gift. 
However, items mentioned as restricted for export shall not be exported as gift without an authorization. So, what is that? This is divided into two again. Freely, that is uh, exportable or restricted. So, export of gifts restricted means those goods are generally restricted and that you are exporting as gift. Whether authorization required or not, yes. Because the one who is sending the gift don't, knows what is the product that he is sending. So, therefore, authorization authorization required authorization required okay whereas suppose if it is freely exportable if that gift contains an article which is freely exportable then what is it they are telling suppose if the value of gift does not exceed 5 lakh rupees so value less than or equals to 5 lakhs in a year 5 lakhs in a year so, no authorization, authorization not required, authorization not required because it is freely exportable, authorization not required. What if it exceeds 5 lakhs? What if the value exceeds 5 lakhs in a year? 5 lakhs in a year, then it is not allowed. What is that they are telling? So, a value not exceeding 5 lakhs in a licensing year may be exported as gift. So, then value exceeding 5 lakhs in a year, so cannot be exported, cannot be exported as gift, cannot be exported, cannot be exported as gift. Then we need to export it like a normal sale and we need to realize the proceeds. But here value does not exceed 5 lakhs in a year, authorization not required and this can be exported as a gift. So, that is with respect to the policy with respect to gifts. Then coming back, so to re-import passenger baggage. So, baggage already we discussed what are the provisions related to that. So, that provisions will prevail and re-import of goods repaired abroad. So, if any imported goods, that is re-imported goods, imported goods exported for repairs upon re-import. So, then in that case, so that can be imported without any authorization even though its original requires authorization. For example, import of car requires authorization. You are sending the car for repairs abroad. Again, re-import. Again, you need an authorization. No, not required. Because it is exported out of India for only for the purpose of repairs. So, authorization not required in that case. Even though when you import it in a new form that requires authorization. Sale on high C basis. Already we know what is the provisions relating to that in customs and GST. That it is excluded from supply and for the purpose of customs. The last purchase price will be taken as a value and... Uh, the person who is purchasing last should be taken as the important for purpose of clearance. Then even that is also subject to FTP. Like how the original importer need to comply with the provisions of FTP. The same way the last person who is purchasing those goods from the original importer is also required to comply with the provisions of FTP. Import under lease financing. Licensing year means the year in which the authorization is given. That is known as licensing year. Licensing year means for example there is no concept of financial year here so for for example if uh, they have given license for this year so today to the next one year from today that should be taken as a licensing year in ftp then import under lease financing lease financing means like you instead of buying the asset you are taking the asset on lease but because of which there will be frequent foreign exchange outflow that's the reason why authorization not required but rb approval is required rb approval is required Clearance of goods from customs with respect and authorization obtained later. That is, we imported the goods. Generally, some goods requires authorization. We imported those goods and those goods are kept in the customs. And you can get the authorization at a later point of time also. However, such goods already imported in advance are first warehoused against bill of entry for warehousing and then cleared from home consumption against an authorization issued subsequently. But this is not possible in case of items reserved for ST. Why? Because they should only import, you should not import. So, therefore, once you are importing, which are the items reserved for ST? So, even if you import it, you cannot clear it. So, because you are not supposed to clear import those goods. Suppose, if there are some goods which are restricted goods, you don't know that it is restricted, you imported it. So, then it will be kept it in the warehouse by filing bill of entry for warehousing and thereafter at the time of filing X-bond bill of entry, we can get the authorization by that time. 
then execution of bank guarantee or letter of undertaking that is generally under FTP in order to claim the export incentives we need to execute a bank guarantee or letter of undertaking in case of import of goods without payment of customs duty or refund of customs duty we need to execute bank guarantee or LUT with you know customs department whereas in case of local purchases local purchases if we are import like uh, purchasing any goods without payment of GST yes in GST we have that concept called as deemed exports under GST sale to advance authorization holder or sale to EPCG holder and sale to UOU will be called as deemed exports under GST so in that case so the bond or LUT uh, will be furnished with the regional authority okay so therefore wherever goods are imported duty free or otherwise specifically stated importer shall execute prescribed LUT or bank guarantee or bond with customs authorities however in case of indigenous sourcing indigenous sourcing means what local purchases authorization holder shall furnish LUT bank guarantee or bond to regional authority okay then private public or bonded warehouses for import that is already we have discussed the provisions related to this private public and bonded warehouses in customs act the same provisions will be prevailing here and uh, the goods imported can be kept in warehouse for a period of one year and at that time we don't have to produce anything but after clearance from the warehouse only we need to permit like uh, officer will permit provided there is valid authorization for those goods already we discussed then in case of exports already we have seen free exports that is unless prohibited or reserved for STE it is freely exportable and export of samples so generally samples can be exported any samples can be exported free of cost however so there are some samples which are exportable so subject to certain authorization see this so bona fide trade and technical samples of freely exportable items shall be allowed without any limit such samples can be exported as a part of passenger baggage without any authorization in case of restricted items no need of authorization just an application is required okay so there is a product which is actually freely exportable you export you give it as a sample no issue even as a baggage also you can send there are some items which are restricted it samples you wanted to send you don't want to sell but you want to give it as a sample free samples in that case so that is free samples to the people outside India you wanted to give it in that case just a application should be made to DGFT so authorization is not required then passenger baggage export of passenger baggage already we have discussed in baggage provisions then export of spares generally whenever we export the main article its warranty spares may also be exported without payment of any customs duty and here what happens is that we will not realize any money with respect to export of spares because it is covered under warranty that's the reason why RBI approval is required so goods are subject to approval of RBI then third party exports third party exports means whenever the goods are exported through another person that is known as third party exports I am the manufacturer or supporting manufacturer and I will be giving the goods to a merchant exporter he will export now I am importing and he is exporting and I need the incentives because he is not doing anything he is just exporting I need the incentives for import without payment of customs duty for that purpose what that person should do the third party exporter should do in the shipping bill he need to indicate the name of the third party exporter as well as the manufacturer exporter okay third party exports means exports made by exporter on behalf of another exporter in such cases export documents such as shipping bill shall indicate the name of both manufacturer or exporter and third party exporter then only the benefits are given to that manufacturer exporter otherwise benefit will not be available under FTP to manufacturer export manufacturer exporter this is with respect to all the provisions okay basic provisions now look into illustration one how the question could be given so you need to answer this question based on our discussion so far CD corporation a merchant exporter procured order of goods from a customer in USA it approached AB corporation a manufacturer for execution of the said order the shipping bill relating to the consignment bear the name of CD corporation bank realization certificate export order and invoice are also in the name of CD corporation shipping bill is in whose name shipping bill is in the name of CD corporation comment whether AB corporation would be deemed as exporter under FTP yes sir no 
whether AB Corporation would be deemed as exporter under FTP, yes or no? No. Very good. Why? Because the shipping bill, see all other documents irrelevant, mainly the shipping bill. Shipping bill should contain the name of both CD Corporation and AB Corporation. Then only AB Corporation will be deemed as exporter under FTP and is eligible for the incentives. Okay. So, therefore, export document should indicate the name of both manufacturing exporter and uh, third party exporter. So, other documents should be in the name of the third party exporter. Even though other documents are in the name of CD Corporation, the shipping bill does not have the name of AB Corporation. Therefore, AB Corporation will not be treated as exporter in this case. Then export of imported goods, export of imported goods means we are importing the goods which we are exporting. So that can be exported without any authorization provided they are not restricted for import or export. Okay. So that is this and next export of replacement of goods, repaired goods, these are all not that much important. Then yes. So, if there is any grievances, we need to make an appeal to DGFT, so but not to CBIC under FTP. Then there is something called as Export Promotion Council's Registration Come Membership Certificate. So, any person who want to claim incentives under FTP should be registered with the Export Promotion Council and with that Export Promotion Council, they need to register and get a Registration Come Membership Certificate. So, any other benefit or concession under FTP shall be required to furnish on DGFT website. So, exporter's profile, RCMC granted by the competent authority. For example, I am an exporter of spices. Now, I need to get RCMC from a spices board that is issued by the spices board. So, that spices board is an export promotion council. They should give me the membership certificate. Then only I will be eligible for the benefit under FTP. Then this uh, authorized economic operator who will be called as an authorized economic operator. So that can be given as a theory question. You need to just uh, read it once. Short note question authorized economic operator. So with this the unit 1 part is over. So now part 2. Part 2 talks about the export incentives. So I told you that there are two parts in FTP. One is talking about the basic policy. And the second even is about the export incentives. The basic policy part we completed. Now the export incentives under FTP. So export incentives, we have lot of export incentives under FTP like advance authorization, duty free import authorization and then we have duty exemption and remission schemes. So duty exemption and remission schemes. Duty remission scheme already we completed, duty drawback there, duty exemption schemes. So we have advance authorization and duty free import authorization. What is the difference between duty remission and duty exemption? In duty exemption, first we will not be paying any customs duty at all. Whereas in case of duty remission, we will pay customs duty and then we will get the refund of that. That's the difference between duty exemption and duty remission. Okay. So what are the various incentives? for the exporters under FTP, okay, export incentives under FTP, see this various incentives, export incentives, export incentives under FTP, under FTP. So first with respect to, you know, uh, other than capital goods, import of, import of material and consumables import of import of materials materials or consumables or consumables okay import of materials or consumables that is other than capital goods other than capital goods other than capital goods without payment of customs duty without payment of customs duty without payment of customs duty for that we have you know two schemes that is advance authorization duty free import authorization like these two schemes are there 
advance authorization aa advance authorization that is aa then duty free import authorization duty free import authorization that is dfia like that we have two cases without payment of customs duty refund of customs duty paid refund of customs duty paid refund of customs duty paid on import paid on import so for that we have one called as duty drawback duty drawback already the duty drawback provisions we have seen in customs then next for import of capital goods for import of capital goods import of capital goods import of capital goods so we will get the benefit okay at zero customs duty zero customs duty so zero customs duty means how it will work first we will pay customs duty and then get the refund pay and get refund pay and get refund for that we have one incentive called as epcg scheme epcg scheme export promotion export promotion capital goods scheme export promotion capital goods scheme okay e p c g like that one scheme is there for what import of capital goods okay then apart from that we have something called as so r o d t e p scheme and s c i s previously m e i s like that one scheme was there some incentives a percentage of fob value will be given as incentive so r o d t e p scheme r o d t e p scheme and s c i s service from export r o d t e p means rebate of duties taxes on exported product scheme and s c i s scheme s c i s scheme talks about uh, s c i s scheme is service export from india we are exporting goods so a percentage of fob you will get as a incentive and when you are exporting services a percentage of so the foreign exchange earnings you will get as a incentive that is r o d t p scheme and s c i s scheme and then we have something called as reward scheme reward scheme reward schemes uh, that is status holders you can call it as status holders status holders benefits status holders benefits depending upon exports a person will be given a status star status by dgft one star two star three star so based on that they will be eligible for some benefits then we have something called as you know eou export promotion zone scheme export promotion export promotion zones export promotion zones scheme epz this epz schemes is for eou then ehtp electronic hardware technology park biotechnology park and software technology park for them then finally we have something called as deemed exports under ftp deemed exports okay so deemed exports scheme so these are the various incentives that we have so these incentives if you learn so with that the export incentives are over okay so 1 2 then ro dtp 3 then scis 4 then status holder 5 then export promotion 6 and deemed export 7 okay these are the seven incentives that we have now let's start with this advance authorization and duty free import authorization first first we will be discussing duty exemption advance authorization and duty free import authorization 
So under advanced authorization, what happens? It is a facility. For what purpose? To import inputs. What is the time limit within which it should be imported? Within 12 months. From when? From the date on which you got the authorization. From the date on which you got the authorization, it should be imported. And so it can be used or it is required in the manufacture of exporter product. What is the time limit within which the exporter product should be exported? What is the time limit within which the goods should be exported? Within 18 months from the date of issue of advance authorization, it should be exported. And it will be imported without payment of duty. And what is the value addition that we need to achieve? 15% value addition we need to achieve. Got it? In case of advance authorization, so it is a facility to import without payment of customs duty. But sir, what customs duty is not required to be paid? All customs duties except IGST and GST compensation says. So this without payment of customs duty up to 36, 2022, no need to pay any customs duty. With effect from 1 7 2022 for November 22 exam, that's an amendment. With effect from 1 7 2022, we need to pay IGST and GST compensation says, but all customs duties are exempted other than IGST and GST compensation says. Then, <coughs> what is the value addition to be made? 15% value addition to be made means from the CAF value of import, the FOB value of export should be 15% more. That is the meaning of value addition. Then, this IGST and GST compensation has been exported up to 39 na. Now, this has been extended to 36, 2022. Up to that only it is extended. Thereafter, we need to pay IGST and GST compensation says. Got it? And all other customs duties are exempted. What is the validity of the import authorization? 12 months. So, within 12 months, we need to import. And what is the period of fulfillment of export obligation? 18 months from the date of issue of authorization. How the export process should be realized? Definitely, it should be realized in convertible foreign currency. Convertible foreign currency. Export to SCZ units shall also be taken into account for discharge of export obligation. You can make export to SCZ also. That will also be taken. Okay. And export to SCZ developers. Export to SCZ developers also taken into account for discharge of export obligation. Even if payment is realized in Indian rupees, that's an important point. Okay. So, whenever you are required to make an export obligation, so for that export obligation, even if you are selling it to SCZ, that will also be taken. For SCZ developer, if you are making any exports, that is uh, supplies to SCZ developers, that will also be taken even if it is in Indian rupees. Okay. Then, items which can be imported duty free against advance authorization which are physically imported, incorporated in the export product, that is direct material. Even consumables also, consumables not present in the final product. Even spares, any spares also can be imported up to 10% of CAF value of authorization. So, whatever is the value of authorization, up to that 10% of that we can import. And so, only those goods, but items reserved for imports by STE cannot be imported against advance authorization. Okay, then, so eligibility to whom it will be given? It will be given either to manufacturer, exporter, or merchant exporter, but by merchant exporter should be tied to supporting manufacturer. Means, so I am manufacturing, you are exporting. I will get the advance authorization provided I am tied to you. Okay. That is this. Then, so authorization can be issued for physical exports, including export to SCZ. Intermediate supplies, that is, I am not exporting. I am exporting. So, I am selling it to a person who in turn exports. Okay. Supplies made to specified categories of deemed exports. So, there are something called as deemed exports for that also. Supply of stores on board to a foreign going vessel or aircraft. In all these cases, advance authorization will be applicable. And what is the value addition that we need to achieve? The value addition will be 15%. 15% value addition means if this AF value of inputs is 1 lakh, the FOB value of export should be 
one lakh fifteen thousand. That is the meaning. But when you are importing some goods on which you claimed duty drawback benefit, that should also be counted for value addition. For example, you imported some goods under advance authorization one lakh. You imported some goods under duty drawback fifty thousand. Now while calculating the export obligation value addition, so one lakh also you need to achieve fifteen percent on that fifty thousand also you need to achieve fifty fifteen percent. So even on which benefit of duty drawback is claimed for that also we need to achieve export obligation value addition. Then suppose if there is some free of cost material sent by the export importer outside India that will be included in both CIF value as well as in FOB value. If some items are supplied free of cost by the foreign buyer, its notional value will be added in CIF value of import and FOB value of export for the purpose of calculating value addition. And exports to SCZ developers or co-developers, irrespective of currency, would be also covered here. Okay. Now let's try to understand how this value addition condition could be tested. So value addition in case of advance authorization. Value addition. value addition in case of advance authorization in case of advance authorization say for example simple question can be asked on this that is cif value of import cif value of import covered under advance authorization covered under advance authorization is Rupees one lakh eighty thousand. What should be a FOB value of export? What should be a FOB value of export? A FOB value of export to comply with FTP. To comply with FTP provisions. So how much should be the FOB value of exports? Simple. So FOB value of exports value addition fifteen percent. So FOB value of exports, FOB value of exports equals to. So CIF value of import, CIF value of import means CIF value of import, CIF value of import plus five percent, fifteen percent. So what is the CIF value of import? One lakh eighty thousand. One lakh eighty thousand plus fifteen percent will come to. Okay, how much? Two lakh seven thousand. Two lakh seven thousand will be taken as the answer. Like this, a simple question can be given. And little different question. If FOB value of exports, if FOB value of exports, if FOB value of exports is Three lakh twenty-five thousand. What should be CIF value of import? What should be CIF value of import under advance authorization? CIF value of import under advance authorization. Reverse. Okay, reverse calculation. So, what is it we need to do? Simple. So, CIF value of import. CIF value of import, CIF value of import plus fifteen percent equals to FOB value of export, FOB value of export. Now, so this let it be x. So x plus fifteen percent one point one five x. One point one five x equals to three lakh twenty five thousand. Then what will be x? Three lakh twenty five thousand divided by One point one five. Okay, how much that will come to? Two lakh eighty two thousand six not nine. So this will be taken. Okay, this is one way it can be tested. Next, yet another question is. So imports under duty drawback. Imports under duty drawback is rupees fifty thousand. And FOB value of export, FOB value of export is two lakh fifty thousand. What should be, what should be 
CIF value of import under advance authorization. CIF value of import under advance authorization. Under advance authorization, what is taken as the CIF value of import? Imports under duty drawback is 50,000 and FOB value of export is 2,50,000. What should be CIF value of import under advance authorization? So, let X be the CIF value of import under advance authorization. Even with respect to imports under duty drawback, both put together, we need to achieve 15% value addition. Then we will be getting 2,50,000 as the FOB value of exports. So, 1.15x plus 50,000 plus 15 percent. What is 50,000 plus 15 percent plus 15 percent will be 57,500 will be equals to 2,50,000. Then 1.15x equals to 57,500 you deduct from 2,50,000 that will be 1,92,500. Then x will be 1,92,500 divided by 1.15. So, that is 1,67,391. This much can be imported. Then, one more question. That is, so, import of material which is exported by which is exported by, which is exported by recipient outside India, recipient outside India on FOC basis, free of cost basis, notional value, notional value is 1 lakh, notional value is 1 lakh. If the FOB value of exports charged, if the FOB value of exports charged is 4,18,000, compute CIF value of import, CIF value of import covered under advance authorization covered under advance authorization covered under advance authorization what will be taken as this af value of import covered under advance authorization import of material which is exported by recipient outside india so what we need to do simple pa so caf value of import x caf value of import x so notional cost should be added in both caf value of import and fob value of export so, x plus 1 lakh on that 15 percent, okay, equals to FOB value of export. What is FOB value of export? 4 lakh 18,000 and this notional value should be added in both the places. 1 lakh, see this. So, we need to add, we need to add, if some items are supplied free of cost by foreign buyer, its notional value will be added in the CAF value of import and FOB value of export for the purpose of calculating value addition, okay. It should be added in both the places. Now, 1.15x plus 1,15,000 equals to 5,18,000. Then, 1.15x equals to 5,18,000 minus 1,15,000 will be 4,3,000. Then, what will be x? 4,3,000 divided by 1.15 so that is 3,50,435 so rounded off that will be taken. So this is how the questions on value addition can be tested pa. Okay, these are some minute minute points which is not yet tested so it can be. Then basis of issuance of advance authorization. Advance authorization is issued for inputs in relation to resultant product on the following basis as per standard input output norms. Standard input output norms means for every unit of output how much of the raw material is required. So that is known as standard input output norms based on that it will be given. Or on the basis of self declaration where there is no standard input output norms. 
So the exporter will tell I am manufacturing 1 lakh units for that I am importing on that base also it will be given. Or applicant specific prior fixation of norm by the norms committee. So or we need to make application to the norms committee and the norms committee will tell based on that also. Or on the base of self ratification scheme no SION or valid ad hoc norms for an export product. So now what you need to remember in this is that whether standard input output norms is present or not. So it will be given whether standard input output norms is present or not that refund will be given or that is the advance authorization will be extended that is this. Then can they make domestic sourcing of inputs also? Yes, they can procure indigenously. However, they can they may obtain supplies from EOU units without obtaining ARO or invalidation letter. So domestically also they can procure but that should be against advance release order or invalidation letter or back to back inland letter of credit. So based on this document they can make domestic procurement and they need to maintain proper accounts for authorization and uh, such record should be preserved for a period of 3 years. For a period of 3 years they need to preserve such records. Then redemption or closure of authorization. So once they fulfill the export obligation they will get a export obligation discharge certificate or redemption certificate which means that they have complied with the provisions of FTP. Okay. Then there is something called as annual advance authorization rather than every time making application for advance authorization. So it can be given for annual requirement that is so in terms of CAF value of import shall be 300 percent of the FOB value of physical export depending upon our export they will be giving this. So how much will be the entitlement under advance authorization? CAF value of import shall be up to 300 percent of the FOB value of export or a 4 value of deemed export or 1 crore whichever is higher to that extent they will be giving. So throughout the year so any time we can import it okay. So that is known as annual, ad annual advance authorization but this is applicable only for those people who is having valid SION standard input output norms is prescribed for them only. So that is about this advance authorization. How the questions could be tested on advance authorization you see. Illustration 3. Answer the following questions with reference to the provisions of FTP. Flintex manufacturers manufacture goods by using imported inputs and supplies the same under aid program of UN. UN. So any sale to UN organizations that is products, uh, projects financed by UN organizations or funded by UN organizations will be qualifying as deemed export. Advance authorization benefit is applicable even in case of deemed exports that is what we have seen. Advance authorization is extended even in case of deemed exports supplies made to specified categories of deemed exports. So due to that reason in this case whenever they are making supply to aid program of United Nations the payment is received in free foreign exchange they can seek advance authorization yes. So it is coming under deemed exports and advance authorization can be issued for supplies made to deemed exports so they can seek advance authorization. Then number 2 XYZ limited has imported inputs without payment of duty under advance authorization. The CAF value of such inputs is 10 lakhs. The inputs are processed and the final product is exported. The exports made by XYZ limited are subject to general rate of value addition. What is the general rate of value addition 15 percent. So 10 lakhs. So what should be the FOB value of export 15 percent so 11 lakh 50 thousand okay. Then 3 A has used some duty paid inputs in it export products however for rest of the inputs you want to apply for advance authorization can he do so yes. For import without payment of customs duty they can go for advance authorization if they have paid customs duty for that they can go for duty drawback okay that is with respect to this. So we completed advance authorization then the second one is there duty free import authorization duty free import authorization is a facility to import and use it in manufacture of exported product what is the time limit for this authorization same 12 months and uh, export should be completed within 12 months but their export should be completed within 18 months here the export should be completed within 12 months and without payment of basic customs duty there all customs duties here only basic customs duty their value addition is 15 percent but here the value addition will be 20 percent okay. So what are the 
differences between advance authorization and duty free import authorization definitely this question will not be tested in november 22 exam because already it has been tested in may 22 exam so last question question number 6 it has been asked so therefore it will not be but it is imperative like it is best to know this so that in mcq somewhere it, whether it is if it is tested you will be able to write advance authorization duty free import authorization duty free import authorization so we are trying to understand what are the differences dfia okay first in case of advance authorization advance authorization so what is the benefit that we will be getting what is the benefit we will get in case of advance authorization so import without payment of any customs duty correct import without payment of any customs duty up to 36 2022 import without payment of any customs duty import without payment of any customs duty any customs duty and with effect from 1 7 2022 import without payment of import without payment of customs duty excluding customs duty excluding igst and compensation cess okay that is the difference then here duty free import authorization duty free import authorization it is a uh, import without payment of base customs duty import without payment of only basic customs duty only basic customs duty and when basic customs duty is not there then social welfare surcharge also not applicable SWS not applicable if basic customs duty is nil. If basic customs duty is nil, even social welfare surcharge will not be there. But others we need to pay. So, this is the benefit in case of advance authorization, duty free import authorization. What is the value addition to be achieved? Value addition to be achieved. Value addition to be achieved. How much is the value addition to be achieved in case of advance authorization? So, CIF value, CIF value of import, CIF value of import plus 15 percent. But here, CIF value of import, that should be FOB value of export, correct? That should be FOB value of export. Whereas here, CIF value of import plus how much? 20 percent 20 percent that will be fob value of export and what is the time limit to export what is the time limit to export time limit to export is screen is not clearer everyone having same issue pa clear okay so value addition to be achieved is this and then next one what about the time limit for export time limit for export 18 months from the date of authorization 18 months from the date of authorization whereas here 12 months from the date of authorization 12 months from the date of authorization 12 months from the date of authorization okay so this is the time limit for export then next uh, yes S I Y N standard input output norms in case of A A not mandatory not mandatory whereas here 
mandatory. Standard input output norms is mandatory. See this. So, provisions applicable to advance authorization broadly applicable in case of DFIA. However, these authorizations shall be issued only for products for which SION have been notified. Okay. So, therefore, uh, only if it is notified, it is given. Otherwise, it is not. Goods imported under DFIA shall be exempted only from basic customs duty. And DFIA shall be issued on post-export basis. Post-export basis means what? Depending upon how much you are making export. Okay. So, basis. How it will be given? Basis. So, basis in case of AA, it is pre-export. Pre-export basis. Pre-export basis means right now you have not made export. You are importing raw material before export. For that also they will give advance authorization or post-export basis. Post-export basis means what? First you export. How much you are exporting? How you will export using the locally procured raw material? How much you exported? Depending upon that, so you will be getting based on exported quantity, based on SION, you will be getting that is post-export basis. But DFIA is always post-export basis. Okay, DFIA is always post-export basis. So, this is about the differences between so AA and DFIA that you need to remember. Okay, then next uh, some more points are there. Say this, the applicant shall find an online application. Export should be completed within 12 months from the date of filing online application. After completion of exports and realization, request for issuance of transferable DFIA. So, what happens here is that whether it is transferable, whether the authorization is transferable, authorization is transferable, transferability, 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 not transferable, advance authorization is not transferable, but DFIA is transferable that you can transfer it to any other person transferable okay it will be transferable so what is the time limit for transferable 12 months from the date of export or 6 months from the date of realization of proceeds whichever is later this is the time limit okay transferable within so transferable when so within a period of within 12 months from export within 12 months from export or 6 months from realization of forex or 6 months from realization of forex realization of forex whichever is earlier or whichever is later whichever is later that is the time limit by which it will be transferable okay then Next, no DFIA for actual user condition inputs. So, if the inputs are subject to actual user condition, you will not get DFIA, but you will get advance authorization. So, they can also do the domestic sourcing and uh, once they complete the export obligation, so DFIA will be redeemed. So, they will get the export obligation discharge certificate and in this place also, supply to SCZ it is covered, value addition same, everything same but only the minimum valuation percentage will say will change then discuss the key similarities and differences between advance authorization already we have discussed that only what are the differences between advance authorization and duty free import authorization duty drawback scheme already we have completed in 74 and 75 okay now we are moving on to the next one so we completed advance authorization duty free import authorization and the next one is EPCG export promotion capital goods scheme so in this EPCG scheme so we will be having zero customs duty what is the meaning of zero customs duty which means that first we will pay customs duty and then we will get the refund of the customs duty and EPCG scheme is given for the purpose of import of capital goods and that capital goods can be imported for the purpose of pre-production production or post-production okay and uh, exporter is having an export obligation so, therefore, EPCG is to facilitate import or export and what is the validity? So, that is 18 months. The 18 months is the validity of this authorization and uh, 
they need to import capital goods at zero rate of customs duty subject to fulfillment of prescribed export obligation and this is exempt from payment of IGST it's a full IGST compensation says same like advance authorization up to 30 6 2022 even IGST GST compensation says is exempted but with effect from 1 7 2022 so three places that IGST and GST compensation says is exempt up to 36 2022 with effect from 1st July 2022 we need to pay okay then how much is the export obligation under EPCG scheme so we need to achieve an export obligation which will be you know six times the duty saved okay so in case of epcg scheme in case of epcg scheme so what is the benefit the benefit is like no need to pay customs duty benefit is zero customs duty up to 36 2022 so zero customs duty zero customs duty then with effect from 1 7 2022 customs duty customs duty except igst and says is exempted customs duty except igst and says is exempted that is the benefit in case of epcg okay then what is the validity the validity of this is 18 months validity is 18 months means 18 months 18 months from the date of authorization 18 months from the date of authorization so means by that time we need to import the capital goods okay so benefit up to 39 36 2022 zero customs duty with effect from 17 2022 customs duty except igst and says is exempted validity 18 months from the rate of authorization now what is the export obligation there are two export obligations pa specific export obligation and average export obligation specific export obligation means specific export obligation means I have to achieve six times the duty saved. So whatever is the duty saved, duty saved. So that duty saved into six times, I need to achieve exports. In how many years? In six licensing years. In six licensing years. What is the licensing year here means? The date when it is given as license from that date, to next year same date is one year okay like that six licensing years they need to achieve this specific export obligation in that also in the first block of four years in the first four years in the first four years they need to achieve 50 percent and in the next two years in the next two years they need to achieve so in the first four years they need to achieve at least 50 percent in the first four years they need to achieve at least 50 percent in the next two years they need to achieve balance okay then there is something called as average export obligation what is this average export obligation means average export obligation means every year their export should be average of the preceding three years three licensing years they need to maintain that okay so current year export current year export current year export okay should be greater than or equal to average of average of three previous years average of three previous years this is this average export obligation so both should be achieved specific export obligation as well as average export obligation so six times the duty saved and this six times should be achieved in a period of six years reckoned from the date of issue of authorization authorization is valid for 18 months and this import of capital goods is subject to actual user condition so we have a actual user condition means what 
actual user condition means only the one who is importing should be using it okay then in case of igst so that will not be in taken into computation of net duty save so if input tax credit is not availed okay so in case of integrated tax incidence of such integrated tax and compensations would not be taken into computation of net duty save provided input tax credit is not availed okay so suppose if you avail input tax credit on that then that will be also taken into duty saved export proceeds can be realized in convertible foreign exchange even export to scz also will be counted here and to scz developers it will be counted provided consideration is in indian rupees all those things okay next we have eligible exporters so who are the eligible exporters manufacturer exporters so with or without supporting manufacturer merchant exporter tied to supporting manufacturer service providers are also eligible and what are the capital goods which are eligible all kind of capital goods however prohibited goods and second hand goods are not eligible second hand capital goods not eligible okay so note second hand goods second hand capital goods second hand capital goods second hand capital goods not eligible okay not eligible under this epcg scheme then specific export obligation means what average export obligation means what we have seen okay now so let's try to understand how this will work first we need to take year licensing year licensing year licensing year is say 1 2 3 4 5 6 licensing years what is the exports what is the exports made so exports made is say 200 lakhs 200 lakhs then 150 lakhs and 300 lakhs then 450 lakhs then 250 lakhs and again so 400 lakhs like this we have made and what is the total total that we have achieved so 200 plus 150 plus 300 plus 450 plus 250 plus 400 will come to 1750 lakhs 1750 lakhs what is the duty saved duty saved duty saved is say 500 lakhs duty saved is sorry uh duty saved is 200 lakhs duty saved is 200 lakhs so what is the specific export obligation specific export obligation specific export obligation is 200 into 6 6 times the duty saved 200 into 6 1200 lakhs 1200 lakhs here how much 1750 so specific export obligation achieved in that also in the first four years we should achieve 600 see that 200 plus 150 plus 300 plus 450 so therefore 5150 actually 1200 so how much we need to achieve we need to achieve 600 so 600 we need to achieve 200 150 then 300 then 450 so in 4 years we achieved more than 50% so overall specific export obligation achieved now what is the average export obligation average export obligation average export obligation if you see here zero why first year the previous year is nothing so zero for second year the previous year will be taken as the average and for the third year previous two years so 200 plus 150 divided by 2 that is 250 lakhs so 200 plus 150 200 plus 150 350 divided by 2 175 lakhs then again for fourth year previous three years 200 plus 150 plus 300 divided by 3 that is 216 lakhs is taken then again previous 3 years 150 plus 300 plus 
900 divided by 3. So, 300 lakhs. Okay. So, then 6th year, previous 3 years average, 300, 450, 250 divided by 3. So, that is 333.33 lakhs. Whether average export obligation achieved? Whether average export obligation achieved? Yes. So, it is more than average. So, here whether it is achieved? No, not achieved. Here whether it is achieved? Yes, yes, yes and yes. As it is not achieved in one year, which means so export obligation discharge certificate will not be given because we have not achieved average export obligation for one year. Therefore, export obligation not achieved, export obligation not achieved, export obligation not achieved and benefit granted shall be recovered, benefit granted shall be recovered, you understood or not. So, this is how we need to compute PA. Then thereafter, we have something called as, we have something called as early fulfillment. What is that early fulfillment? Suppose if you achieve 75 percent in a span of 75 percent in a span, what is that span? In case of indigenous sourcing of capital goods, specific export obligation shall be 25 percent less than the export obligation means so 4.5 times that is enough and incentives for early fulfillment. Suppose if you have fulfilled 75 percent or more of the specific of export obligation in half or less of less than half of the original export obligation means in three years if you are achieving 75 percent and maintaining average 100 percent so then you do not have to fulfill the remaining 25 percent that is early fulfillment incentive then once you fulfill the export obligation you will get EODC export obligation discharge certificate okay that is with respect to this now look into this illustration 5 on EPCG XP private limited a manufacturer wants to import capital goods in CKD condition from a foreign country and assemble the same in India. Yes, any capital goods can be imported under EPCG. The import of capital goods will be under notified project imports. The capital goods will be used for pre-production process. Yes, it can be for pre-production, production or post-production. The final product of XP private limited would be supplied to SEZ. Even supplies to SEZ will also be counted for the purpose of export obligation. XP private limited wishes to sell the capital goods imported by it as soon as the production process starts. No, till the completion of export obligation, they cannot sell those capital goods. Okay. XP private limited seeks your advice whether it can avail the benefit of EPCG. Yes. So, they can procure them indigenously or import without payment of customs duty and they need to achieve export obligation and they can procure the capital goods. So, either used for pre-production, production or post-production, it can be in CKD or SKD form and even under project imports also you can and how much is the export obligation? Six times the duty saved. However, capital goods is subject to actual user condition till the export obligation is completed. Thereafter, they can. Okay. So, about these points you need to write. Next, uh, so we completed EPCG also, AA, DFIA, EPCG. Then, RODTEP scheme and SCIS scheme. So, this RODTEP is a new scheme that is whenever you are exporting some goods and that goods there could be some local taxes and on that local taxes there would not have been any benefit. In order to give an incentive, so to recover that local taxes, for example, some local body tax or municipal taxes, Mundi tax like that. So, to recover that benefit, they are giving this RODTEP scheme. So, what is that scheme is all about? That is, whenever you are exporting a product and on that product, so a percentage of FOB value will be given to you. Okay. So, a percentage of FOB value declared or 1.5 times of the market price of the said goods, whichever is less into a notified percentage will be given to you. That is what you need to remember. So, in RODTEP scheme, what is it? You need to remember all important points I am writing here, Pa. Okay. In RODTEP scheme, RODTEP scheme, what you need to remember? So, upon export of goods, upon export of goods, okay. 
upon export of goods a percentage notified a percentage is notified so why notified given as incentive given as incentive why why it will be given as incentive to recover to recover local taxes to recover local taxes paid okay so which are not covered other than gst and customs okay then what will be the incentive the incentive will be a percentage on fob value declared fob value declared or 1.5 times of market value 1.5 times of market value whichever is higher or whichever is lower whichever is lower so why they are telling whichever is lower you may inflate the fob value you may inflate the fob value that's why whichever is lower and what will happen to this incentive so incentive will be credited to electronic duty credit ledger incentive will not be given as cash it will be given as credit incentive credited to incentive credited to electronic electronic duty credit ledger electronic duty credit ledger okay it will be given to electronic duty credit ledger now what we can do with the duty credit ledger already we learn so balance in electronic duty credit ledger can be used for payment of only customs duty that to basic customs duty so balance in electronic duty credit ledger electronic duty credit ledger okay electronic duty credit ledger can be used electronic duty credit ledger can be used only for payment of basic customs duty only for payment of basic customs duty it cannot be used for payment of anything else okay so that is this and who are eligible so all exporters and what is the reward i told you a percentage will be given but incentive subject to realization of incentive will be subject to realization of forex within the time prescribed under fema subject to realization of forex subject to realization subject to realization of forex within time within time under fema under fema what is the time limit that is given 9 months is given so that is the time limit within which it should be brought okay now that much this much only you need to remember for rodtp now last one that is non applicability which cases it is not applicable non applicability for rodtp in which cases rodtp is not applicable that is export easily you can remember first prohibited goods restricted goods prohibited goods are restricted goods we will not get rodtp okay prohibited prohibited goods prohibited goods are restricted goods prohibited goods are restricted goods then first of all those goods are not manufactured in india those goods are not manufactured in india then there will be no local taxes imported goods exported okay imported goods exported so how imported goods are exported that is through transshipment import from one country and export to another country imported goods are exported imported goods imported goods transshipped to transshipped to another country to another country so then also there is no you know manufacture in india that's why okay export of imported goods that is imported goods transshipped to another country or imported goods exported as such imported goods exported as such without any manufacture in india 
without any manufacture in India. So then there is no burden na, of local taxes. So these cases, what is that you need to remember? Prohibited goods or restricted goods, imported goods transshipped to another country or imported goods exported as such without any manufacture in India. That is that. Then next, when the goods are manufactured in EHTP or BTP, then definitely, so there won't be any local taxes due to that reason and supply of products manufactured by DTA units to SCZ. So generally all incentives are applicable for SCZ, but in case of this RODTEP, sale to SCZ we will not get. Also goods manufactured in goods manufactured in goods manufactured in EHTP EHTP or so BTP EHTP or BTP that is that then next so first point we have completed export of imported goods so export goods subject to minimum export price export subject to minimum export price so government will be telling this is the price at which it should be exported subject to minimum export price in that case also we will not get any benefit okay goods which have been taken into use after manufacture and exports for which electronic documentation ICI EDA has not been generated so this many you remember if at all you get a question write a brief note on non applicability of RODTP these five points if you write that will be sufficient okay then next so or even some more items also given deemed exports you will not get so sale to SCZ including deemed exports including deemed exports or already if you have claimed incentive advance authorization duty free import authorization already you claim the incentive then also you will not get okay so that is about RODTEP scheme one star status they will get if they achieve 3 million dollars, 2 star, 3 star, 4 star, 5 star, 3 million dollars, 25 million dollars, 100 million dollars, 500 million dollars and 2000 million dollars. This number you need to remember. 3 million dollars, 25 million dollars, 100 million dollars, 500 million dollars and 2000 million dollars. They will get this star status. But to count this 3, 25, 100, it is for one year. Uh, no. Current year and previous 3 years current year and previous three years should be taken that is how they will get so for example this year current year and previous three years together it is 25 million dollars then i will be getting this status two star status okay and here this uh, gem and jewelry sector we need to take current and previous two financial years in case of gem and jewelry sector we need to take current and previous two years and we need to maintain this to get the status export performance is necessary in at least two out of four years so in a block of four years at least two times we need to be getting this 25 million dollars so then you will get two star status these are the points you need to remember in status holder what are the points you need to remember first so to get the status what is the amount 3 25 100 500 2000 and that will be counted based on current year and previous three years for German jewelry sector current year and previous two years and you need to achieve this export performance for at least two out of four years so then you will be getting this status once you get the status you will be maintaining that status okay then so we will take a FOB value of export for the purpose of counting and even exports in Indian rupees shall also be converted in US dollars in case of deemed export to get this status and export performance of one IEC holder shall not be permitted to be transferred to another IEC holder to achieve the star status not possible and exports on re-export basis that is already we exported and imported and again re-exported that will also not be counted then up to the purpose up to the one star status up to the one star status there will be double weightage there will be double weightage up to one star status to MSMEs, manufacturing units having ISO or BIS, units located in northeastern state Jammu and Kashmir, units located in agriculture export zones. So to achieve one star status, if they make $100, that will be counted as $200. What are the benefits to the status holders? That can be asked as a theory question. 
authorization and customs clearances on priority that is a self declaration basis they don't have to get any certificate from any person self declaration and standard output out norms standard input output norms will be fixed on priority within 60 days then they don't have to furnish the bank guarantee they don't have to furnish the bank guarantee okay and uh, so next one two star export house and above means except one star two star export house and above are permitted to establish the export warehouses like warehouses will be licensed by the customs department they can have their own licenses then so manufacturers who are also status holders three four and five star will be given you know like self certification they can do self certification as to goods are manufactured in india so that certificate of origin they don't have to produce get it from the government okay so these are the various incentives or benefits available to status holders how this could be tested you can see illustration two two exporters namely red sky private limited and black knight private limited have achieved the status of star holders one star in the current financial year both the exporters have been regularly exporting goods what would have been the minimum export performance of the two exporters to achieve that status to get to one star three million dollars that to when so current year and the previous three years taken together they should have got three million dollars that too they should have maintained the three million dollars in two years out of four years both the exporters wanted to establish export warehouse not possible only uh, that is status holders will with more than one star is eligible to have export warehousing in this case it is not possible because they are under one star only two star and above can establish the export warehouses so here not possible like this it will be tested pa so we completed status holders also then we are left with two more areas that is eou ehtp stp scheme and deemed exports so have a look into eou scheme so eou ehtp stp btp eou is export oriented unit electronic hardware technology park software technology park and biotechnology park what they can do they have to export their entire production of goods and services but some permissible sales can be made in dta and they can import any goods inputs as well as capital goods without payment of customs duty that is the incentive that they will get okay and so these people can do any business in the eou manufacturing servicing etc but trading is not allowed trading is not allowed and what should be the minimum investment to start in eou they should have a minimum investment of 1 crore in plant and machinery this is only for eou but for ehtp btp stp there is no limit and this 1 crore limit also can be you know reduced by board of approval then they need to achieve a positive nfe net foreign exchange earnings that is income in forex minus expenditure in forex in a block of 5 years if they are not achieving then it can be extended for a period of 1 year okay it can be extended for a period of 1 year but they need to achieve positive nfe in a block of 5 years then they can supply in dta still that will be counted for the purpose of nfe that is if they are selling to advance authorization holder or e dfi holder epcg holders that will be counted even if they sell to other eous or ehtps that will be counted if they sell to any person in dta against foreign exchange that will also be counted okay so these are some relaxations they are giving and what are the entitlements for them so the entitlements is that they can import goods without payment of customs duty and local procurements also they can make okay so this is what you need to remember and other points so if you have time you read otherwise not important and all because lot of information is given with respect to eu then deemed exports what are considered as deemed exports so total six transactions are covered as deemed exports first whenever you are selling goods to a person who is holding advance authorization or dfia or you are selling goods to eou ehtp stp btp for you it is deemed export or to a epcg holder you are making sales that is also considered as deemed exports okay 
So, there is a person who is making sale to advanced authorization holder or DFIA holder, sale to EPCG holder or sale to EOU, EHTP, STP that is called as deemed exports. Apart from that, you are making sale to international competitive bidding projects, projects which are covered under international competitive bidding or nuclear power projects, nuclear power projects, nuclear projects are projects financed by UN or international organization. So, total six points you need to remember. Sale of goods to advanced authorization or DFIA holder, sale of goods to EPCG holder, sale of goods to EOU, EHTP, STP, BTP, then sale of goods to projects which are international competitive bidding projects and projects financed by UN or international organization or nuclear projects. So, then it will be called as deemed exports. What are the benefits in case of deemed exports? You are making sale to these people. You can import goods without payment of customs duty under AA or DFIA or you can import on payment of customs duty and whatever customs duty you paid, you can get it as a refund. So, these are the benefits available in case of, you know, deemed exports. Actually, we are not selling. We are selling it to these people. So, but we can import goods without payment of customs duty under AA or DFIA or whatever customs duty paid, you can get it as a refund. So, that is with respect to deemed exports and suppose if you breach any condition that is specified under FTP, there will be a penalty that shall be imposed.